What's up, ladies and gentlemen? It's your boy, Omni Sensei. Welcome to, What If I Was In Marvel As Spider-Man? Conqueror of Multiverse. Part 2. Hit that thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also, remember to check out the original story, link in the description. Without further ado, let's get into it. Let's talk terms, the second Fury heard those words, his good mood was instantly ruined. When Tony saw this reaction, he smirked evilly in Fury's direction. He didn't like Fury very much. They seemed to bump heads from the moment they met. Fury seemed to be a very controlling and secretive man, and this made Tony feel as though Fury was constantly scheming something. What do you have in mind? Fury asked in annoyance, though he hid it well. Well, let's go to a more comfortable room. We can't talk business amongst the dead, after all. Peter says, and Fury takes them to a conference room with a big table surrounded by rolling chairs. The second they enter the room, Peter takes out his ghost phone and flips a tiny switch on the side of it. Instantly, any listening devices or cameras in the room were made useless. At least until Peter's ghost phone was out of range or the switch was flipped again. This is more like it. Peter mutters as he puts his phone away and takes a seat alongside Tony. Fury looked annoyed and rolled his single eye as he took a seat as well. What are your terms? Fury asks, ignoring the smug look Tony was giving him. Seeing as there aren't any other super-powered individuals here, that must mean Tony and I would be the first to join, correct? Yes, I have a couple of agents that I want to be involved as well as an enhanced individual who is currently, out of town, but you would be the first two supers to officially join. Fury nods. Peter instantly knew that Fury was talking about Carol Danvers, who is currently off-planet, not out of town. Let's not call Tony a super, he has a nice suit. That's all. Peter pokes fun at Tony, who turns to Peter with an annoyed glare. Do you have to keep bringing that up? Tony sighs. Yes, now let's get back to business. Peter says as he turns to Fury. Seeing as Tony and I will be the first members of this team, I think it's best that we figure out how this will work for us and the upcoming members. Tony nodded from the side, surprised that he was about to agree to join without going over this. I'm such an idiot. Tony thought. That makes sense. Fury nodded as he took out the file from earlier. The way we would like to do things is similar to how our relationship already works. You work with S.H.I.E.L.D. already? Tony asked Peter. I'm a contractor. They give me jobs and I choose to accept or not. They gave me the job to get you from the desert, remember? Oh, yeah. Tony mutters in realization. So, you want us to be contractors? That doesn't sound too bad. In exchange for your help, S.H.I.E.L.D. would pay you handsomely, though neither of you needs money. Of course, other forms of payment can be negotiated with each member separately. Fury offers. Sounds good. Peter nods, finding nothing wrong with that. How about immunity? You mean from crimes or your actions in the field? Fury asks. Actions in the field, whether they be crimes or otherwise. Peter clarifies and explains further. Theoretically speaking, if the Avengers team went out on a mission and it ends badly, I don't want to be thrown under the bus by the powers that be. We are doing S.H.I.E.L.D. a service, not the other way around. I will not help you and be held liable for that help afterward. That can be worked into the contract. Fury says after some thought. Who would be upholding this portion of the contract? Tony jumps into the conversation. As Coulson said, S.H.I.E.L.D. is separate from any government body. We would need the President or the Supreme Court to agree to this. Hearing this, Fury's face scrunched in contemplation. Tony just made this a lot more complicated. I would have to speak to the powers that be before promising anything like that, but we can probably get it done. Fury nods, using the same wording as Peter. He would need to speak to the World Security Council about this, which would be a hassle as they've all but scrapped the Avengers initiative plan long ago. Let's talk about training. I don't expect most people who join to know how to fight or have control over their powers. It took me a bit to get my powers under control, so I understand this sort of thing. Future members would have to be put through some training and tests before being allowed to go on missions. Peter explains, getting nods of agreement all around. The agents I want on the team can be instructors to the new members. Other S.H.I.E.L.D. agents can assist them when needed as well. Fury agrees easily. Good, let's move on to missions. Peter says as he thinks for a moment. 
Let's speak theoretically once again. Some country is committing genocide. Because of politics, the powers that be don't want to get involved, meaning the Avengers don't get the mission to help. How can we prevent this from happening? That is a hard question. Fury says, not having a single clue. Since we would be contractors, we can just go on any mission we want. S.H.I.E.L.D. can't tell us what to do. Tony says, not seeing a problem. Liability, Tony. Peter says, referring to their earlier subject. Since the mission wouldn't be given by S.H.I.E.L.D., we would be held liable for property destruction, assaults, deaths, and any other laws broken in whichever country we are in. Silence fills the room, as all three of them think of a solution. Peter was the first to speak, as an idea formed in his mind. What about making the Avengers its own extra-government organization? Peter says, shocking both Tony and Fury. How would that even work? Tony asks. And how would we get those in power to agree? Fury asks, not hating the idea as it would circumvent the World Security Council. Just like S.H.I.E.L.D., the Avengers would be beyond the province, powers, or proper sphere of any government. We would be able to go anywhere we want and help anyone we please, and the liability wouldn't be an issue anymore, as we would be put in power by the US government and any other country that wishes to back them as well. Peter answers Tony's question first before turning to Fury. Who would need to agree for this to happen? My bosses would never agree to this, so your next best bet would be the president. Once President Obama is involved, you can use his connections to get the United Nations on board as well. After that, you would be set. Fury says, not liking the plan as he would be losing some power in this deal, but he knew that this may be the only way to truly get his long-time plan operating without any interference. You're okay with this? It sounds like your bosses won't be pleased. Tony asked confusedly. I have been trying to get the Avengers initiative off the ground for a very long time. If this is the way it has to be for the world to have the protection it needs, then I'm on board for the ride. Fury says, far more understanding than either of them thought he would be. Technically, he has Phase 2 to fall back on, which is a plan developed by S.H.I.E.L.D. to develop weapons using the power of the Tesseract. Though Fury believes in Phase 1, Avengers Initiative, far more. Don't be too down about it though. We'll still need S.H.I.E.L.D.'s assistance. Training and information are what you would offer us still, so we would still be working together. I have no problem taking in the three people that you plan to have involved as well. Peter says, knowing S.H.I.E.L.D. would still be involved either way. We would also need to set people in charge. Someone has to run the whole operation. Tony says, dread clear in his voice. The room goes silent as everyone thinks of how it would even work. This time, Fury is the first to speak up. As someone who runs his own organization, I can give you some advice. Fury offers. Sure, go ahead. Peter gestured for him to continue. You could form a council, which would deal with the upper level management. That council can appoint a director, like myself, who would run the organization as a whole. Fury explains. Is that how S.H.I.E.L.D. is run? Tony asks. I cannot confirm or deny. Fury says with a shake of his head. So, it is, huh? Tony mutters, reading between the lines. Who would be on our council? Peter asks. Us three would make a good start. Fury says, trying to get his foot in the door. Us? Tony asks with an upturned eyebrow. Yes, us. Fury repeats with a serious nod. The Avengers initiative was my plan, to begin with. I've been working on it for 15 years of my life, compiling information on every enhanced individual I could find. I refuse to be left out. Also, with my involvement, S.H.I.E.L.D. as a whole would be more inclined to agree with all of this. Tony started arguing with Fury, but Peter zones out as he began to think about this whole situation. Fury is a trustable person. The problem with him is his allegiance to a corrupt organization. He may have a hard, angry outer shell, but the man does what he does to keep the world safe, which Peter respected. Stop! Peter yells as he came to a decision. Instantly, Tony and Fury stopped arguing and turned toward Peter. We haven't even gotten the ball rolling on any of this. Right now, this is all just an idea. Let's see if we can get the president to agree before we start arguing about the council positions. Let's see if we can get the president to agree before we start arguing about the council positions. Peter says, calming the room down. Fury is someone trustable, but he doesn't currently know about the cancer that has taken hold of his organization. Peter would have to warn him somehow or just straight out reveal the existence of Hydra. Though, he would need to get evidence to prove his claims first. Without this, there's no way Peter would ever allow Fury to hold any position in the Avengers Council. It's a bit late for that. Tony replies, looking at his watch. It's already far past midnight. Is the president currently at the White House? Peter turned to Fury and asked. 
Yes, he'll be leaving the country in a week, though. There's a summit in Japan. Fury says, somehow knowing the president's schedule by heart. Good, I'll pick you two up tomorrow around lunch and portal us to the White House. Peter says nonchalantly as he stands from his seat. Shouldn't we schedule a meeting? Tony says with Fury, nodding in agreement. I'll send a message to his Twitter account. That should be enough. Peter says with a shrug as he turns to Fury. Seeing as your bosses won't like this, I think you should keep our current plans between us and only us. I agree, I'll have the security footage of this room destroyed. Fury says, knowing that the World Security Council could easily access it. Don't worry about that. Peter says as he shows his phone. I blocked all of that when we came in. Good work, webhead, Tony says, patting Peter on the shoulder. Like I've said multiple times. Peter says, making eye contact with Fury. I don't trust S.H.I.E.L.D. as a whole. I'm sure many of you are kind-hearted and want nothing but to protect the world, but not everyone has good intentions. Peter was trying to drop a hint to the guy and Fury seemed to pick it up fairly easily. Is there something that I should know? Fury asks with a raised eyebrow. No, but just be careful what you allow anyone to know about. Even the highest level people can always turn on you. The only people I have even the smallest amount of trust for in S.H.I.E.L.D. are Natasha, Coulson, and you. You being the lowest on that list. Peter explains. All right, I'll keep our plans quiet for as long as I can. Fury agrees, finding a sort of kindred spirit in Peter. Sounds like we're done here. Tony says as he stands up. Take me home, webhead. Today has been a long day and tomorrow is looking to be the same. Nodding to him, Peter opens a portal to Tony's house and they both leave a contemplating Nick Fury behind. He could tell Peter knew something about S.H.I.E.L.D. that he wasn't saying. The question was what does he know? After bidding Tony farewell, Peter found a good place to portal home and found MJ, Ned, and May waiting for him as if some sort of intervention was about to take place. What? Peter asked as he switched to his normal clothes in a split second. You take down a giant robot with your new friend Iron Man and expect us not to show up? MJ says as news coverage showing the many videos of the fight was playing on the TV. Oh, yeah. Peter mutters, forgetting that even happened. Sorry, I just got out of a meeting with your dad and forgot. What? Why? MJ asks, as Ned and May both go quiet and listen curiously. Peter explains everything that happened, shocking everyone in the room. They learned about everything from the Ironmonger conflict to the alien bodies he saw. So, you're meeting the president tomorrow? May says in awe and excitement. She voted for Obama and was a supporter of the man, so the situation turned into something similar to the Oprah incident. Yeah, so I have to get to bed. Peter says as he walks over and pulls MJ into his arms. It's already late. Do you want to spend the night? Ned looked away, shielding his innocent, virgin eyes. May, on the other hand, was watching intently as if a scene from one of her Korean dramas was playing out before her. Aye aye. MJ stuttered before noticing a teasing smirk on Peter's face. She instantly knew he was messing with her. Matching his smirk with one of her own, MJ swiftly lifts her knee toward Peter's nether regions. Peter's grin instantly disappears as his spider senses go off. Be careful. Peter says as he easily stops her knee with his hand. How will we make babies if you damage the family jewels like that? Oh, I want at least two grandchildren. May gave her two cents. We're not having any children. MJ snapped, her embarrassment clear to everyone in the room. Not yet. May added. When MJ and Ned left, Peter went to his room and sent a message to the president's official Twitter account, stating that he would arrive with two guests around lunchtime tomorrow. Thankfully, he had no school tomorrow. Similar to what happened when May found out about his Twitter account, Peter was woken up the next morning by his excited aunt. He slept past his usual time and she wanted him to be on time for his meeting with the president. She even started looking through his closet for some nice clothes, forgetting that Peter would be wearing his spider suit. After getting away from his far too excited aunt, Peter portaled over to Tony's house, where he found Fury waiting patiently in the living room with the two files from yesterday in hand. Is Tony ready? Peter asked. Mr. Stark is currently waking up. Jarvis answers through the speakers. Fury seemed annoyed with Tony, meaning the guy was probably asleep when he got here. After waiting for a good 20 minutes, Tony finally arrived, dressed in a very expensive looking suit. Peter decided to not give Fury and Tony time to argue, as he could feel the tension in the room, and opened a portal straight to the Oval Office. He only hoped Barack wasn't pulling a Clinton and using his office for anything sexual. Stepping through the portal, Peter found Barack Obama sitting behind his desk, going over some paperwork whilst on the phone with some foreign dignitary. Yes, and if they move across your country's border, you will have our assistance, but that hasn't happened yet. 
the very recognizable voice of the president fills the office. Hearing something in the room, the president looks up from his desk and sees Spider-Man, Tony Stark, and the director of S.H.I.E.L.D. enter his office through some sort of circular hole in space. I'm gonna have to call you back. He says and hangs up the phone as the portal closes behind his guests. Spider-Man? Stark? Why are you here? As soon as Barack asks this, 15 Secret Service agents rush into the room with pistols drawn. Seeing who the intruders were, they freeze for a moment, not knowing how to handle the situation. Did you not see my DM? Peter asks as he completely ignores the men with guns and takes a seat in one of the chairs across from the president. Confusingly, taking out his phone, Obama opens up Twitter and sees a message from Spider underscore man. You do understand that you can't just send me a message on Twitter and come here, right? Obama says incredulously. Well, we need to speak. Can you ask the goons to leave? Peter shrugs as he looks over at the confused Secret Service agents. No offense. Thinking it over for a moment, the president motions for them to leave, and they reluctantly and confusingly do so. Good, one second. Peter says as he grabs his phone and switches on the anti-surveillance switch. Okay, now our conversation will remain private. What? The president asks in confusion. He made any cameras and listening devices useless. Tony says as he takes a seat beside Peter. Director Fury, can you please explain what's going on? He asks the only one in the room he knows. We need your help. Fury says as he walks up and hands over the Avengers initiative file. Looking over the file, the president was pleasantly surprised by the foresight of S.H.I.E.L.D. It seems as if they knew superpowered individuals would exist years before Spider-Man and Iron Man made their debuts. This looks like a good plan. Though I don't know how I can help. He asks, placing down the file. Tony and Spider-Man have given their input, which has changed the plan slightly. Fury says, gesturing for Peter to speak as he was the one to come up with all of this. We would like to make the Avengers an organization similar to S.H.I.E.L.D. We worry about liability and... Peter goes on to explain everything they spoke of on the night before. I see. Obama mutters after hearing everything. We like the idea of the Avengers, but the execution needs more thought and planning above just bringing some super-powered individuals together to take care of any big threats. Tony adds his thoughts, throwing in a small jab at Fury's plan. Why can't you just join S.H.I.E.L.D.? After all, they're the type of organization you're trying to build. He asks. I don't know or trust the people running S.H.I.E.L.D. If I'm going to do this, it's going to be my way. Peter states, getting a nod from Tony. Thinking about what he heard, Obama found that he agreed with what Peter said. He always got an odd feeling from Alexander Pierce, who is a member of the World Security Council. Not to mention the fact that S.H.I.E.L.D. hides a lot from even him, which has irked every president since S.H.I.E.L.D. was made. Okay. The president nods a bit reluctantly. This will take some work to get off the ground, but it'll be worth it. So, you're on board? Tony asks as a victorious smirk begins to form on his lips. Tony still didn't trust the government, but he was starting to get excited about everything coming together. Yeah, but at least one of you needs to accompany me to Japan next week. We need to explain all of this to some of our allies and get them on board as well. Once we have a few of the more powerful UN countries with us, everything else will fall into place. After having a long conversation with the president, Peter returned home to finally spend some time with his friends and family. He has been spending all of his spare time with Tony lately, which was fine, but Peter missed his aunt, girlfriend, and best friend. Involving the president in their plan was a good idea. He listed the countries in the UN that need to be on board for this to happen. United States China Russia Germany United Kingdom Japan France South Korea Saudi Arabia United Arab Emirates These countries are the most powerful in the United Nations. With at least five of them joining together, not including the United States, the Avengers organization would be a real thing. Luckily, the UN was holding a summit in Japan a week from now, so their opportunity would come soon. This is a much more complicated way to bring the Avengers into existence, but it would all be worth it. In order to prosper long term and avoid the problems that occurred in the movies, the Avengers need to be more than what they were originally supposed to be. It especially needed to be separated from the time bomb that is S.H.I.E.L.D. Speaking of S.H.I.E.L.D., maybe the Avengers can take in its remnants once Hydra has been expunged? Now that Peter thought of it, absorbing S.H.I.E.L.D. is a good long-term goal, though this depends on how everything pans out. Upon returning to his life in Queens, New York, Peter found that Parker Games was starting to roll in money and even the news was pick up on the company's success. The game has a player base of 26 million and was making around 70 million dollars a month, which was crazy to him. With all of this money coming in, Peter had may contact her business lawyer friend again and ask for a recommendation on a good accountant to handle it for them. 
Peter was far too busy and May is never going to quit her job as a nurse, so they needed someone capable to manage the company's money and file the taxes on time. As for the news, they started covering the new and popular game, Candy Crush. It didn't take long for them to find the people behind Parker Games, as it's public information. It started with the local news putting an article in the newspaper and online about Peter Parker, the majority owner and creator of Parker Games. The company behind the popular game, Candy Crush. After that, the floodgates opened and every news station, paper, and magazine was running stories about Candy Crush and its prodigious creator. While Peter was finding this out from Ned, who was excitedly texting him articles and news clips, a news van pulled up outside and a reporter buzzed into his apartment. BZZZ BZZZ walking over to the intercom, Peter held down the button and spoke. Hello? He asks. Hi, this is Kate Summers from Channel 4 News. Is this Peter Parker? She asks and after a short conversation other the intercom, Peter goes downstairs to be interviewed by the woman. Peter didn't want to bring the news people upstairs as May had already proven that she can't keep her mouth shut in the apartment. The interview consisted of random questions about his game development, studies in school, and Parker games. It wasn't mainstream news, so the interview didn't last longer than about 15 minutes. After they got what they came for, the news crew swiftly packed up and left for the next story. Peter didn't really care about being famous as Peter Parker, so he didn't want to do the interview, but the publicity for the game was worth it. Candy Crush has risen to a player base of 25 million without any advertising whatsoever. With the current coverage of the game, Peter wouldn't be surprised if that player base doubled with just the news help. The interview was played on the news the very next day, but Peter didn't really care anymore. By this point, he was working on creating his own Jarvis. It was the weekend, so thankfully, Peter didn't have school to worry about. Though he knew that when Monday came along, he would be swarmed by teenagers asking about Candy Crush. Maybe, I should have hidden my involvement in Parker Games? Peter thought, regretting his decision already. While Peter was thinking this, he was on his ghost laptop, hacking into universities and other institutions, looking for their research data on artificial intelligence. Peter could start from scratch using his skills and everything he knows about Jarvis to build his AI, but that would be the long route. He would rather have some information to help kickstart the project before beginning. Damn that. Peter thought as his fingers typed like a madman, stealing as much data and research as he could. The reason Peter wants an AI so badly is that he saw how useful Jarvis was while helping Tony with his suit. With enough resources at an AI's disposal, they could do almost anything. A smart enough AI could probably manage Parker games and make games to release at the same time. All that Peter would have to do is give an idea for the game alongside some concept art, and the AI could work its magic. Not to mention the use an AI would have in the field. Ned is already his dispatch while out on patrol, but he's still only human. An AI would be able to hack into security cameras all around New York City and keep Peter updated on all crimes. Though, it would have to be far more powerful than Jarvis to do that, as even Tony's AI would have some trouble managing so many perspectives. Just thinking of all the responsibilities and work that Peter could offload onto artificial intelligence brings a smile to his face. One week later. After a week of working on his AI and getting hounded in school about Candy Crush, where most of his classmates asked for free gold, Peter was riding first class on the president's plane, Air Force One. As always, Peter was disguised in his spider suit. Fury leads an entire world-encompassing organization, so he wasn't able to make it. That and he would tip off the World Security Council to their plans should he tag along. As for Tony, the guy is in the middle of a move. With everything that happened in LA, he wants to move out and relocate his company headquarters as well. It just so happened that he chose New York City as his new home. This decision definitely had nothing to do with his new best friend Spider-Man living there. Stark Industries already has a branch in New York and Tony has multiple penthouses and mansions across the world, so he didn't have to build any skyscrapers or buy a new home. In less than a month, Tony and Stark Industries would call New York home. You know that I could have just portaled us to Japan, right? Peter reminds the president, who was sitting across from him, drinking a cup of coffee. True, but when you're the president, there are certain regulations to be followed when entering another country. Obama says as he places his coffee on the table. Also, I don't want to scare our allies by appearing through a portal. Do you have any idea how easily we could conquer the world with that ability? Hearing his reasons, Peter couldn't help but nod. Sending the US Army, which is one of, if not the most powerful arm on earth, through portals to every country's capital city would be a truly easy way to take over the world. If Kamartaj wasn't keeping the peace, Peter was sure that would have happened by now. Yeah, but keeping the peace afterward would be hell. Peter says, getting a nod from the president. 
Just the thought of dealing with the people's unrest afterward gave him a headache. After spending some time on the plane and taking in the experience, Peter got bored and portaled home for a bit. He would return when the president texted him, letting Peter know that they landed. That's right, first was the ancient one and now Peter has the contact information of the president of the United States of America. It's good being Spider-Man. Peter thought as he dived into his bed. As Peter was about to take a nap, his phone buzzed and lit up. Looking over, he saw that it was a text from MJ. MJ, are you going to be busy, or can you make it to Christmas dinner next week? It's already Christmas time? Peter froze, forgetting, as his life has been so busy lately. Wow, I miss Thanksgiving and Halloween. Peter, I didn't even know it was December. MJ oh how? It's literally snowing right now. Looking out the window, Peter saw snow falling from the sky and blanketing the ground below. Shit, she's right? Peter muttered. Peter, sure, I'll be there. Are we doing it the day before Christmas or the day of? MJ, on the day of. May is already invited too. Peter, what about Ned? MJ, he has family visiting and can't make it. After finalizing some things and talking for a while, Peter brought out his ghost laptop and began searching for the best Christmas present for MJ and everyone else. What's the point of being rich if he can't buy some good gifts on special occasions? His busy life has caused him to miss some holidays, but Christmas wouldn't be one of them. After looking at Christmas presents for a while, Peter ordered some things and took a short nap as he originally planned. After who knows how long, Peter was woken by the sound of his phone chiming. Looking over, he saw that it was a text from the president, and swiftly switched to his spider suit and portaled back to the plane. Yo! Peter said as he stepped onto the plane and felt the exact moment it touched down on a runway in Tokyo. I still can't get over how convenient those portals of yours are. Obama comments as the portal closes behind Peter. Yeah, it's one of my favorite powers. Peter replies as the plane slows to a stop. Some secret service agents were already on the runway waiting for their arrival, while the ones on board the plane did a quick sweep before opening the exit hatch. Before the president could even exit the room they were in, the secret service had to perform multiple sweeps of the area, which took about 30 minutes. Once they were finally able to leave, the president and Spider-Man descended the stairs to the agents outside, shocking the Japanese dignitaries that came to welcome the president. None of them knew of Spider-Man's arrival, as the president kept it a secret, not wanting to tip off the World Security Council too soon. Obviously, they would find out sooner or later, but everyone currently involved would much prefer the latter outcome. Although the Japanese welcome party didn't expect to see Spider-Man, they certainly welcomed him warmly. Spider-Man's influence expands all over the world after all. A superhero is something to be admired in any culture all across the world. In fact, they welcomed Peter far more warmly and excitedly than they did Obama, who found the whole situation quite amusing. Of course, cameramen filmed and took pictures of their arrival, meaning the world would soon know of Spider-Man and the president's involvement with one another. Once the welcome ceremony was finished, Peter hopped in a heavily armored car with the president, who was escorted out by multiple cars filled with secret servicemen alongside Japanese police cars. The president would be staying in a hotel nearby the prime minister of Japan's official residence. The entire place was rented out, with the president and his secret service agents taking all the rooms for themselves. Peter wouldn't be staying with them, as he can just portal home to sleep at any time. Once the president was safely in the hotel with his agents guarding him closely, Peter went out to sightsee as Spider-Man, swinging through the city as if he were back at home, Peter webbed his ghost phone to his chest and began recording. A Spider-Man vlog in Tokyo, Japan would definitely interest his viewers. Swinging through the city, Peter found some small-time crime and put a stop to it easily, surprising the perpetrators and victims as neither expected Spider-Man to appear halfway across the world. Before heading back to the president, Peter climbed Tokyo Tower and took a bunch of selfies, posting the best ones on Instagram. Not long after the long presidential convoy left the airport, one of the dignitaries that were in the welcome party got into a nearby car and made a phone call. As he left, the other dignitaries saw him off with the utmost respect, showing his position amongst the bunch. Ring ring, speak. A man staring down from the top of a tall skyscraper in Tokyo answers the phone in Japanese. Insert picture of Murakami, a finger of the hand, here, the American president arrived on time as expected, but he brought along an unexpected guest. The man from the welcome party says over the phone. Who? Murakami asks with interest clear in his voice. Spider-Man. The day after their arrival, Peter tagged along with the president to the first day of the UN assembly. It was about as boring as Peter expected the whole thing to be, with briefings by secretariat officials or technical experts, interactions with civil society, consultations, and negotiations. 
Peter just scrolled through his ghost phone, reading the comments on his New Japan vlog, which was posted this morning. There are also a plethora of articles and news clips talking about Spider-Man visiting Tokyo with the President of the United States of America. J. Jonah Jameson was having a field day with the whole situation. The man was crafting government conspiracies and throwing Spider-Man's name in here and there. Sadly for him, only crazy people and those that have gone too far down the Daily Bugle's rabbit hole still believe him. The rest of the world has begun to see the man for who he really is. A scam artist that sells fake news to outrage the public, which in turn builds his fortune. It was a fairly comedic scene in the UN building, as Spider-Man sat next to Barack Obama with his feet up on the table and his phone in hand, scrolling through his different social media accounts. The men and women of the UN were all curious as to why he was here, though none spoke a word or complained. Spider-Man was a monumentally popular figure and at the end of the day, each of them was a politician. They would treat Peter like a king just to stay in his good graces, as a negative impression could ruin their careers. All it would take is a single tweet, and Spider-Man's almost half a billion followers would come crashing down onto their political careers. Once the long meeting was finished, the president turned to Peter. Come on, we have a meeting with the Japanese prime minister. Obama says as Peter follows him to a meeting room in the UN building. Their waiting for them was Naoto Ken, the current prime minister of Japan, alongside some of his security agents standing nearby. After some quick introductions, Peter switched on the anti-surveillance switch on his phone and spoke up. Would you mind asking your security to step out? Peter said in slightly broken Japanese, shocking the native speakers in the room. What we will be speaking of is sensitive in nature. After learning all of those languages in Kamar Taj, Peter spent his spare time learning to speak some of them as well. Though he doesn't do so very well yet. Japanese is the best language he can currently speak besides English. It helps that he watches anime with MJ and uses that time to really get a feel for the language. After a moment of thought, the Prime Minister ordered his security to leave. They did so reluctantly but made a point to emphasize that they would be right outside the door. What's this all about? The Prime Minister asks in perfect English, knowing that Barack doesn't speak Japanese. Did you block the surveillance like last time? The President turns to Peter, who nods. The Prime Minister was truly curious and a little nervous by this point, but Peter swiftly explained that he just didn't want their conversation getting out. I understand, now please explain. He says, dying to know by this point. This time, instead of Peter, the president was the one to explain the Avengers plan. Everything was perfectly explained, surprising the prime minister. You speak as if you expect more enhanced individuals to appear in the future. He speculates, looking at Peter for an answer. If I can get superpowers and Tony Stark can build a super suit, it's not illogical to assume that there's more to come. S.H.I.E.L.D. apparently has information on some of these people, who have yet to reveal themselves. Peter says, getting an annoyed look from the Prime Minister. Speaking of S.H.I.E.L.D., why aren't you just working with them? I may disagree with their secretive ways and the lack of a Japanese representative in the World Security Council, but they are the type of organization you're looking to build. The Prime Minister says. I would rather build my own organization. I don't trust S.H.I.E.L.D. as a whole. We would also be far less secretive than S.H.I.E.L.D. Peter says as the Prime Minister, bad mood melts away. He didn't trust S.H.I.E.L.D. either and this was something that he and Barack formed a sort of friendship over. Okay, I need to think about this. Let's schedule another meeting for tomorrow after the UN assembly. He says and they say their goodbyes, leaving the Prime Minister alone in the room. Moments after Peter and the President leave, Murakami comes strolling into the room as if he owned the place. Instantly, the Prime Minister bows deeply toward Murakami, treating him with the utmost respect. Ancestor. The Prime Minister greets. I couldn't listen in on the meeting, what happened? Murakami asks, treating the leader of Japan as a mere subordinate. They use some sort of device to stop the cameras and microphones from working. I apologize for the inconvenience. The Prime Minister says, bowing deeply once again. I see, explain what happened. After being briefed on what the meeting was about by the Prime Minister, Murakami returned home to think about what to do. If they were to allow such a force, like the Avengers, to be created, then how long would it be before that new blade is pointed at the hand? The hand doesn't care for what atrocities it commits. As long as they get closer to their goal of immortality, all of the fingers of the hand would gladly commit genocide. A peacekeeping force like the Avengers is just a poison that will sooner at later strike out against them. Though, the problem with not getting involved is even worse. Spider-Man would simply move on to another country, and many would gladly work with him and Tony Stark. This is the predicament that the hand has been put in. Either get involved and find a way to mitigate the Avengers somehow, or don't get involved and stop this whole thing before it comes together.
As Murakami was contemplating this, the door opened, and in came a hand ninja. At first, Murakami was annoyed as he didn't call for this subordinate, but then he noticed something odd. The man's eyes were pitch black, devoid of any light or spark of life which any living human would possess. Kaijusama. The next day, Peter had a meeting with the Prime Minister once again, where the man instantly declined to participate in the Avengers plan, which was odd since Peter felt that the man was interested on the day before. Something changed. Peter frowned in thought as he watched the Prime Minister leave the room with his security. Don't be so down. Barack says as he sees Peter watching the door where the Prime Minister just left. We still have other countries to meet with. One refusal doesn't mean anything. Peter nods toward Obama, not voicing his thoughts about the odd change in the Prime Minister. Later that night, Peter decided to continue patrolling Tokyo. They would be meeting with a representative from the United Kingdom tomorrow about the Avengers initiative, so he didn't plan to stay out for too long. As Peter was stopping a store robbery and had the perpetrators webbed up for the police, a group of ninjas shrouded in dark red garb walked from the shadows. Their faces and bodies were completely covered with only the eyes showing. Insert picture of hand ninja here, wow, are you guys ninjas? Peter asks excitedly, remembering this look from the Daredevil TV show. What's the hand doing here? Well, this is Japan. The hand originated in this country. The real question is why are they coming to me? The Yami no Te also referred to as the Hand, was an ancient and powerful ninja clan with the ultimate goal to gain immortality. Without a word, one of the ninjas takes out a piece of paper and brings it up to Peter, handing it over. Taking the paper with a shrug, Peter opens it and finds an address written inside. Should I go here now? Peter was curious what the Hand could possibly want from him. He knew that the Hand probably had the worst intentions possible, but Peter was far too curious about what was going on. Hearing Peter's question, the ninja nodded before turning and dashing into the shadows alongside the rest of the ninjas. That's so cool. Peter couldn't help but mutter. He knew that the ninja didn't actually meld into the shadows and could sense them sneaking away behind buildings and walls, but that didn't stop him from respecting the skill to move the way they do without any enhancements like himself. Typing in the address on the GPS of his ghost phone, Peter followed it to a tea house, which was empty except for the workers and a single table. It wasn't very noticeable, but there was a small handprint symbol on this building and a few others in the area. The people that would walk by seemed to notice this and give these buildings a wide berth as they passed by. At the table inside was a man, who was casually drinking tea without a care in the world. Peter instantly recognized him from the Daredevil TV show. Insert picture of Nobu Yoshioka here, Nobu? Peter thought, remembering that he's a high-ranking member of the Hand, as well as the subordinate of one of the five fingers of the Hand, Murakami. Walking over to the table, Peter looked at the man who was obviously waiting for his arrival. Hey, are you with those ninjas? Peter plays dumb as he takes a seat. Spider-Man, it's an honor to meet you. Nobu bows slightly, ignoring Peter's question. You may refer to me as Nobu. Sure, Peter didn't know how to respond. What's this all about? Peter didn't trust the hand whatsoever and was starting to believe that they may have had something to do with the Prime Minister's decision earlier in the day. Why are they getting involved? Peter thought. We, the hand dash, Nobu motions toward the hand symbol on the wall inside of the building. Are an old and influential ninja clan here in Japan. If you would allow it, we could help you with your Avengers plan. I knew it. Peter thought, as the man all but outright confirms, that they are involved with the minister's decision somehow. Seeing as Peter didn't sense anyone listening in on his conversation with the minister, and the anti-surveillance function on his phone was on, that means that the hand has some form of control over the prime minister. Meaning that the hand has control over Japan as well. Are you saying that you can get the Prime Minister to agree? What do you get out of this? Peter asks, trying to get some information before he acts. Yes, but we would like to be more involved. The hand has connections and people all around the world. We can assist in information gathering or fighting should it be required. Nobu makes his offer. If Peter didn't already know about the hand, he may have been swayed to work with them, but he knew that these people didn't have good intentions. The only question remaining was what do they want? Are they trying to get involved with the Avengers so they aren't attacked later on, or are they trying to get something from him or Tony maybe? Okay, give me some time to think on this and I'll get back to you. Peter says as he shoots a web to a nearby table, pulling over a pen and paper. Write down your phone number and I'll contact you soon with an answer. After getting a number, which Peter knew would most likely lead to nothing, Peter left the tea shop and made sure he wasn't followed before casting a light refractory spell, minor invisibility, and a silencing spell on himself. Rushing back to the shop, Peter caught sight of Nobu getting into an SUV. Where are you going? 
Peter thought as he stealthily followed behind the car. Flashback, Kaijusama, I wasn't expecting you. Murakami bows toward the black-eyed ninja, who on any other day would be doing the same toward him. I decided to stretch my legs, so to speak. A deep rumbling voice, which didn't feel real, left the ninja's mouth. I need new servants at the temple. The last group has become too compliant for my tastes. Of course, I'll have my men get rid of them. You'll have new toys by tomorrow morning. Murakami responds dutifully. Although he is very respectful to this man, Murakami isn't doing so out of respect. He fears this being as every other finger of the hand does. No, need. The ninja pats his stomach. I've already taken care of them. Just be sure that the new servants are ready to clean up after their predecessors. They will be there by morning. Murakami says with a bow. Now, what's this I hear about a Spider-Man visiting my country? The ninja asks. Murakami explained the whole situation without missing a single bit of information. It's as if he's had hundreds of years to understand how to handle and please the person in front of him. He especially explains everything he knows about Spider-Man. From his actions as a hero to the powers he possesses. Interesting. The ninja says in its deep rumble voice. This world is becoming more interesting. Find a way to lure this man to my temple. He sounds like the perfect vessel. As Kaijusama says this, black smoke shoots from his mouth, nose, eyes, and ears. As the smoke dissipates into the air, the ninja's body falls to the ground like a puppet without strings. Blood streams down from every hole in the ninja's head and pools onto the wooden floor. Murakami looked at the lifeless body with disgust. The respect that he showed earlier was completely gone. Following the SUV unnoticed, Peter was led to a Japanese-style mansion occupied by Murakami himself. The subordinate brought him straight to the boss. Peter didn't act just yet though. He wanted to know what was going on and what the motive was behind the hand's actions. Usually, the hand is a very secretive group. They wouldn't just out themselves to an unknown person so easily, so they have to have some motive that Peter hasn't figured out yet. How was the meeting? Murakami asks as Nobu walks into his office and gives a respectful bow. Unknown, he asked for my contact information and then left. Nobu says, causing Murakami to look disappointed. He should contact me with an answer soon enough. Nobu noticed the look on Murakami's face and tried to appease his disappointment. Maybe we should have captured him? Murakami asks rhetorically, causing Peter, who was crawling in the wall outside the window, to confirm his suspicions. Why do they want to kidnap me? Peter thought as he just listens and watches from the window like a spider on the wall. Did you at least have some men follow and keep track of him? Murakami asks hopefully. Yes, but they lost sight of him almost instantly. Nobu says with a shake of his head. He's far too fast for us to follow. If I may speak directly, sir. Why are we trying to capture such a dangerous man? We may not fear death, but there's only so much dragon bone elixir to go around. I'm afraid that decision is out of my hands. Murakami says, internally agreeing with his subordinate. Now, go and let me know when he contacts you. Maybe we can track his location. Yes, sir. Nobu says as he bows and steps toward the door. Damn it. Peter wasn't sure what was going on but he decided to just capture these guys and find out afterward. They were getting themselves involved with his business and it's not like they were some superpowered threats. Peter could handle a few ninjas, and if he wanted them dead, all he has to do is incinerate the bodies. The only problem would be Murakami, who has enhanced durability and strength due to the elixir he and the other fingers took to increase their longevity. Though, Peter had a lot more than that and was probably stronger than the man as well. Deactivating his minor invisibility spell, Peter crashes through the window feet first, kicking Murakami in the back. As soon as Peter made contact, Murakami twisted his body, trying to counter, but Peter was just too strong. Murakami was sent flying over his desk and crashed through the doorway, which Nobu was about to open. Who dares? Nobu asks incredulously as he turns to see Spider-Man sitting on his master's desk with his legs crossed casually. Hello, Nobu-san. Peter says, sending the guy a wave. Insert Xbox Kojima-san meme here, as Spider-Man. Nobu stutters as Murakami stands to his feet, brushing some broken bits of wood from his suit. Don't go scurrying off now. Peter comments as he shoots a web at Murakami, who didn't expect it and was pulled back into his office. As the man was being pulled across the wood floor, he brought two fingers to his mouth and whistled loudly. Instantly, Peter could hear light footsteps from inside and outside the house all converging on his location. <laughs> Peter hummed as he thought about the annoyance he was about to deal with. Let's keep you two in place while I deal with your minions. Not giving the man a chance, Peter embodied his inner porn star and covered Murakami in his white substance. The man is enhanced, so Peter was sure to really layer it on. 
While he was doing so, Nobu sprang into action and rushed at Peter, pulling two short blades from behind his back. Be a good boy and sit quietly. Peter says as he meets Nobu halfway and backhands him across the face, sending the loyal subordinate crashing down. Kicking the knives away, Peter webs up Nobu and secures Murakami until the man was nothing but a big yarn ball of white web. He wasn't sure how strong this Murakami was and didn't want a ninja to cut him free during the coming scuffle, so Peter was very thorough. Once Peter was finished, the fun really began. Ten red-clad ninjas came running down the hallway and into the broken door. As soon as they stepped foot inside the room, every window in the room shattered as another four ninjas came crashing through in the same manner as Peter. Though they weren't the last. One by one ninja from outside came pouring through the windows and another group crowded the doorway from the hall. Not only that, Peter could hear even more ninja entering the property. You guys are like ants, huh? Peter says as he watches the ninja surround him casually. The ninja searched the room for their master, who was the one to call them, but only found Nobu and a big boulder-sized cluster of web, which was twitching ever so slightly. He's pretty strong, huh? Peter thought as he glanced at the trapped Murakami. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Let's have a clean fight. No eye poking, blows below the belt, or strikes to the back of the head. Peter starts acting like a referee in a boxing match, not taking any of these trained killers seriously. Now, get back to your corners and we'll start the first round. A few of the more hot-headed ninja acted first, jumping at Peter from every corner of the room. Smirking at these easily manipulated people, Peter jumps and sticks himself to the ceiling, making the overzealous ninjas crash into each other. As the ninjas bump into one another, Peter webs them up from the ceiling and drops down on top of them, dodging some throwing knives that pierce the ceiling only moments after his fall. Now that the weak among you has been dealt with, let's begin. Peter says as he moves far quicker than any of these ninja could possibly follow. Peter turned into a hurricane as he moved across the room wreaking havoc. Wherever he went, bodies would fall and screams would echo. When Peter would take care of a ninja, another would take his place, as an almost unending number of ninja constantly entertained the room. Halfway through the brawl, Peter started walking on the ceiling, as the floor became annoying to maneuver with the many unconscious ninjas sleeping below. After almost half an hour of constant fighting, the room was stacked with unconscious bodies up to almost two meters high. Thankfully, Murakami has some high ceilings in his house, or Peter would have had to give up his close quarters advantage and leave the room. With every enemy knocked out cold, Peter started processing them like an Amazon packaging facility. Pulling them out of the room one by one before wrapping them up in web and stacking them in the hall and other rooms. Sigh, I feel like a factory worker or something. Peter comments as he finally finished packaging the detained ninja. He could have just left them here and taken Nobu and Murakami for questioning but Peter decided to not allow any witnesses to get away. They could tip off the other fingers of the hand, which would most likely bring Peter nothing but trouble. Though they could already know. Walking up to Nobu and the ball that contains Murakami, who he left in the office, Peter pulls up an office chair and takes a seat. Wakey wakey. Peter says as he dumps a glass of water on Nobu's head. Ha. Huh. Nobu grunts and gasps for air as the water splashes his face. After getting his bearings, Nobu looked toward Peter and sighed sadly. He could see the blood and destroyed room alongside some of the bodies stacked in the hallway outside and the still twitching ball, containing his master. Sigh, I knew we shouldn't have done this. Nobu sighs defeatedly as he relaxes onto the ground, not daring to test Spider-Man patience. Tell me about who can force the hand to capture me? It didn't sound as if you or your boss here dash, Peter pats the web ball. Wanted to do this, so give me your best guess? I won't speak. Nobu says defeatedly. Just kill us and be on your way. What were your words earlier? We may not fear death, but there's only so much dragon bone elixir to go around. Duh. Peter repeats Nobu's earlier sentence word for word. Why kill people that don't fear death and probably won't remain that way? Instantly, Nobu's eyes go wide as he knew that he shouldn't have said that earlier. Just one slip of the tongue has revealed one of the hand's greatest powers. You know what? Peter stands as he thought of something. You guys probably won't break very easily, so let's send you all somewhere to think about what you've done, shall we? As he says this, Peter knocks Nobu out once again before waving his hand, conjuring a portal on the floor, which swallows Murakami and Nobu. As Nobu and Murakami fell through the portal, Peter made his exit, returning home for the night to get some sleep. Nobu and Murakami were both sent to the mirror dimension, where they would be trapped, as neither has a sling ring or practices the mystic arts. Peter debated on sending them to some other dimension, like the negative zone, but the risk of running into other cosmic entities or somehow empowering the two prisoners was too large to ignore. 
They wouldn't have the slightest clue how to break out anyway, so Peter wasn't worried in the slightest. As for the countless hand ninja left behind, Peter didn't bother dealing with them anymore. He could trap them in the mirror dimension as well, but dealing with so many people would leak his many powers in the mystic arts. Peter would have to kill them all or wipe their minds in order to keep his secret, and that was all just too much of a hassle. Leaving them behind will tip off the rest of the hand, but it's not like Peter can't deal with some ninja. Even Murakami, who is one of the five most powerful people in the hand, was fairly easy to deal with. Returning home and hopping into bed, Peter leaves his two prisoners in the mirror dimension and would be visiting them in the morning. Walking through a portal to the mirror dimension, Peter was instantly attacked by Nobu and Murakami, who both tried to kick him away and sprint through the portal. Smirking, as he knew this would happen, Peter allowed the two to kick him, but once they got near the portal, Peter controlled the portal and made it move just out of reach, taunting the two prisoners. Is that the way you should be greeting your captor? Peter comments as he flips to his feet. Neither prisoner gave up though, as both of them kept sprinting at the portal, which closed slowly, taunting them even more. Sadly for them, as Murakami tried to dive through, the portal closed completely and he ended up crashing onto the ground defeatedly. It's nice to officially meet you, I'm Spider-Man. I see that Nobu got you out of the ball. Peter greets Murakami as the man himself stands to his feet, ready to engage Peter in combat. You should calm down. You'll be stuck here for a while anyway. No need to tire yourselves out. Murakami didn't listen and dashed at Peter, thrusting his palm forward with the skill of a millennial old master. Stepping to the side with his hands behind his back, Peter easily dodged everything Murakami could throw at him. He may not have the same thousands of years of experience, but spider sense was just too overpowered. It wasn't just the spider senses though. Peter's experience training with Natasha has made him many times better at dealing with martial artists. You should really calm down. Peter comments as he moves with the grace of a skilled dancer, dodging every attack that Murakami could throw at him. You may be enhanced and skilled, but I'm just better. Nobu watched from the sidelines with his mouth hanging open in shock. Usually, during his sparring sessions with Murakami, it would be him that was treated like a novice. Now, the man that he thought untouchable was the one being treated as the newbie. They were even arrogant enough to believe that Spider-Man only won against them in the beginning because he took Murakami by surprise. Both of them now learned that this was just prideful thinking. How can we get out of this, prison? What do you want? Murakami sighs in defeat as he steps back, knowing he can't do anything to Spider-Man. Tell me about why you plan to capture me? Peter asks and both prisoners look at each other, not saying a word. Okay, let's see how long you'll last in here before breaking. I wonder how long it will be before one of you eats the other. Peter leaves them with this question as he opens a portal, not allowing either of them to follow him through. He would leave them there for a few days this time to let them really feel their predicament. While on his way to meet the president, as they have a meeting with a representative of the United Kingdom, Peter texted the Ancient One about his prisoners in the mirror dimension. He didn't want her or any other master to accidentally let them out and based on her response, she didn't mind his use of the mirror dimension. While sitting through yet another UN meeting alongside the president, Peter thought it would be another boring day, but his expectations were immediately flipped upside down. Rolling up to the podium in the front of the room was a familiar looking bald man in a wheelchair. Insert picture of Professor X in his wheelchair here, A slash N, I won't be following the X-Men movies. I may use them as references but that's it. Wow, he looks like Patrick Stewart. Peter thought as he set eyes on one of the most powerful telepaths in Marvel. I should have expected this after seeing Dopinder that one time. Peter was slightly worried about his mind being breached, but Charles was usually depicted as a morally sound man. If he did try to read his mind, Peter would know from his training at Kamar Taj. Though blocking the man may be easier said than done. I need to speak to the Ancient One about some telepath protections. Peter thought. Greetings everyone. I'm Professor Charles Xavier. I have multiple PhDs in genetics, biophysics, psychology, anthropology, and psychiatry from Oxford University and Columbia University. Charles introduces himself after parking himself next to the podium and grabbing the mic. After hearing all of this man's credentials, representatives from all around the world listened up, knowing that this was an expert they were dealing with. Peter showed some respect to the man and took his feet off the table and even put his phone away, surprising everyone in the room. I'm here to speak on mutation in the human genome. Mutation is the key to our evolution. It has enabled us to evolve from a single-celled organism into the dominant species of this planet. This process is slow, and normally takes thousands and thousands of years. But every few hundred millennia, evolution leaps forward. Charles starts. That leap can come in minor forms. 
Images appear on a large screen behind Charles, depicting different physical changes humans have gone through in their evolution in modern times. If I might speak. A man with a heavy Russian accent speaks. What's this all about? I'm getting to that. Charles says as a video plays behind him of a young teenage boy with large white angel wings. This is Angel. His real name will remain hidden, but he and his parents allowed us to use him as an example. This is what a major leap in human evolution looks like. The crowd goes quiet as they all watch the video of this unknown boy moving his wings before flapping them and shooting into the air. Some of your countries may have already seen these mutations popping up in your borders. Through my research into these mutant individuals, I've found that they possess something I call the X-gene. The X-gene's activation leads to the production of an exotic protein. This protein produces chemical signals, inducing mutations on other genes, ending up with mutant organisms of various empowerment. Charles continues. Are you saying a mutant can have any power? What type of powers have you seen so far? Obama asks, peeking over at Peter as he speaks. A mutant can unlock almost any power imaginable. Most mutants seem to activate their powers during puberty, but there are always exceptions. Stress and trauma have been shown to activate the X-gene as well as some children who are simply early bloomers. Charles answers. How do we know that this video hasn't been edited? The representative from France asks. Without answering his question, Charles holds out his hand and levitates his wheelchair, lifting himself off of the ground with ease. I happen to be a mutant as well. He says as his chair floats back and forth around the podium before landing safely where it was parked in the beginning. Do you think it's a good idea to classify yourselves as mutants? Peter breaks the silence, drawing everyone's attention to himself. You speak as if you aren't one of us? Charles asks, confused by Spider-Man's statement. To my knowledge, I didn't get my powers from this X-gene, but I could be wrong. Peter answers with an uncaring shrug. What I'm trying to explain is the stigma that currently surrounds the mutant name. Are you sure that you want to label yourselves with that name? I don't understand. Charles states in confusion. Well, because of the many books, TV shows, movies, games, and other forms of media depicting monsters as mutants, I think it's a horrible classification for your cause. Whatever that may be. If you want these mutants to avoid discrimination, then naming them after horror movie monsters is the worst way to go about it. If you want these mutants to avoid discrimination, then naming them after horror movie monsters is the worst way to go about it. Peter says, causing Charles to look dumbfounded. I I didn't. He mutters into the microphone, shocked by his huge blunder. I get it. Peter says with an understanding nod. You didn't mean for it to come across that way. Since mutant sounds like a slur, maybe metahuman would make a better name. Charles calmed down slightly and nods in reply. He didn't think such a scientific label would cause this much of an issue. Sadly, the public won't be so welcoming to this new race of metahumans. Just look at the past exploitation of African Americans or the disgusting actions of Nazis against Jews. The emergence of a new race will most definitely cause some waves. Especially since this race is inherently dangerous. A child could unlock his X-gene and shoot fire from his hand, accidentally burning down an entire apartment building. Peter explains, causing worry and shock to fill everyone's faces. I understand your point but... Charles interjects, but Peter cuts him off. I don't say this as a way to scare everyone into hating metahumans. See? That sounds a lot better, doesn't it? Peter clarifies with a smirk, causing everyone to nod in agreement. I say it as a precaution for what's to come. If we are going to welcome this new race of people into the world, which I think is a wonderful thing, then certain protections need to be put into place. For both parties, not just metahumans. What Peter was saying really connected with everyone in the room. They all seemed to gravitate toward his words. How many of these new humans do you expect to awaken their X-gene in the next 10 years? Obama asks, joining the conversation. The current calculation is 0.00002% of the world's population will unlock their gene in the next 10 years. Charles answers after a moment of thought. So, around 1400 people, huh? Peter says, instantly doing the math in his head. That's surprisingly manageable. Yes, which is why I'm here. Charles uses Peter's statement as a springboard to start speaking again. We, as people of this planet, can set things in motion so that these metahumans dash, he sends a thankful nod to Peter. Don't become the next slaves or some subhuman species that everyone is afraid of. There are risks though, as Spider-Man mentioned. The Russian representative speaks. I did say that but risks can be accounted for and mitigated with preparation. Especially when we're dealing with such a low number like 1400. We also have to remember that the ones unlocking this gene, more often than not, will be children. 
Peter interjects. Scared children. Charles clarifies with a nod. Dealing with emotional superpowered children certainly won't be fun, but at the end of the day, we can't just sit back and let things play out. That's how people like Hitler come into power and atrocities take place. Peter says, once again receiving nods of agreement all around. I already have to deal with emotional children at home. If they suddenly awaken superpowers, then God helps us all. The representative from Saudi Arabia jokes, getting a round of laughter from the parents in the room. Then how should we go about handling this? Obama asks. A boarding school. Charles says with an excited smile. That's not a bad idea, but it's far too simple. Peter says, instantly wiping the smile from Xavier's face. I agree that some sort of school should be put in place. These children will need to learn how to control their powers after all, but what about the rest of the world? We can't just segregate all metahumans to your school. That won't solve the problem. The world needs to see metahumans as just another race added to the mix. Everyone around the room started getting headaches as they instantly knew that this was going to take up so much of their time. As Peter was about to finish his point, someone mentioned the time and the meeting came to a close. Charles would have to come back tomorrow to finish, but he expected that already. Maybe I can combine the X-Men with my Avengers plan? Peter thought as he watched Xavier roll off the stage. Before following the president to their meeting with the representative from the United Kingdom, Peter stayed behind and waited for Xavier, Charles. Peter says and Xavier instantly turns his chair. Come with me. We should talk. Charles nods as he rolls up to Peter followed by a brown-skinned woman with white hair, dressed in all black. Insert picture of Storm here, Storm, huh? I always thought that she had the coolest powers in the X-Men. Peter thought. Storm can control the weather and atmosphere and is considered to be one of the most powerful mutants on the planet. I wonder who else joined up with Charles already? Peter thought as he held his hand out. Hello, I should probably introduce myself. I'm Spider-Man. Charles Xavier. He says and shakes Peter's hand. You are? Peter turns to Storm and extends his hand to her as well. Aurora Monroe. She says and gives Peter a quick shake before pulling away. Good to meet you too. Now follow along. We have a meeting to get to. Peter says as he turns and starts walking. As Peter leads them to a meeting room in the building, the president and the UK representative looked at them in confusion. Are we involving Professor Xavier in this? Obama asks. Yep, everyone, take a seat. Peter says as he makes room for Charles at the table before sitting down himself. What's this all about? Charles asks before anyone else. There's so much that needs to be talked about that I don't even know where to start. Peter says as he goes into a long-winded explanation of the Avengers initiative plan. That sounds like something we'll need. Especially after learning about these muta. Ahem, metahumans. The UK representative was very energetic about the Avengers plan. Thank you, X-Men. Peter thought happily, as Charles seems to have helped push things into motion. Hearing his slip of the tongue, Charles knew that he messed up when labeling his people as mutants. Thankfully, Spider-Man was there to set everyone straight. He can only hope that it wasn't too late though. Why are we here? I only wish to build a school. Charles asks, not willing to involve his children in this. I believe we can combine our efforts. Peter says, getting a skeptical look from both Storm and Charles. Oh, don't look at me like that. I have no plan to use school children as soldiers or anything like that. Though these children will grow up one day and at that point they can make their own choices. Now, not all of them would be interested in becoming a hero, but some may find the job appealing. The Avengers happen to have a very wealthy backing as well. Peter says referring to Tony. We could easily fund anything you would ever need. The room goes silent as Charles went into deep thought. He didn't plan to work with anyone, but Spider-Man was so influential in their society that it was hard to say no. Peter didn't say it, but with his backing, metahumans would have a far easier time being accepted into the world. Spider-Man commands a fan base of more than half a billion people from all around the world and that following only grows with each passing day. Proof of this showed in the UN meeting they just sat through. Normally, some random person wouldn't be allowed in the room, yet Spider-Man was there and even spoke freely without repercussion. I need some time to think. Charles says as he wheels himself out of the room. That's okay. Peter nods as he writes down his ghost phone's number, handing it to Storm as she followed Charles out of the room. Call me with your decision. There's a lot that we need to iron out, after all. Once the X-Men left the room, Peter turned to the UK's representative. So, are you on board? Peter asks hopefully. Yes, 100%. He says with a vigorous nod. With the way things are going, the world will need something like this more than ever. One down and four more to go. Peter thought happily. 
Good, then you two work on the next meeting. Maybe contact South Korea next? You want me to help as well? The UK representative asks in surprise. Yup, you're involved now so you might as well help out. Peter says as he stands and walks toward the door. See you two tomorrow. As soon as Peter found a safe place to portal away, he immediately went straight to Kamar Taj, hoping to find a way to protect his mind from Professor Xavier and any other telepath he'll most likely soon run into. Peter still didn't think that Charles would read his mind without permission, but people in the real world are different from their comic book counterparts. He would just rather be safe than sorry. Especially since Peter is trying to absorb this men into his Avengers plan. Professor X may decide to give his mind a quick read to make sure Peter's intentions are in the right place, which they are but he doesn't know that for sure. Arriving in the same room where Peter originally met the Ancient One, he begins his search with her usual stomping grounds. Sadly, upon asking around, Peter was informed that the Ancient One left to take care of something undisclosed. After asking some experienced masters about protection against telepaths, Peter was shown to a section in the library of Kamar Taj that contained books that pertained to the mind. They showed him to the section and left, not offering even a single word of advice. Sigh. I can't believe I'm back here again. Peter muttered in despair, as he looked over his shoulder at the table that he once used to sit at during the earlier stages of his learning. Looking through the books on the shelf, Peter found a couple that looked promising and took them back to the table. I should really find a way to read faster. As Peter was back to his grind in the library, the world outside was not calm. As soon as one of the hand ninjas broke free from Peter's webs, they cut the rest free as well before rushing to find their master, Murakami, who was nowhere to be found. Usually, their master wouldn't like involving the other fingers of the hand in his business, so the ninja were reluctant to inform them right away. Though that reluctance soon disappeared as none of them could find a trace of Murakami. They searched all of Tokyo, yet no matter where they looked, their master was nowhere to be found. By this point, the highest-ranking ninja contacted the other fingers of the hand, explaining their predicament. Each one sent back similar answers. I'll be there soon. Fueling the jet now. I'm on the way. This idiot. I'm coming. All of them were shocked that Murakami would pick a fight with Spider-Man, not having a clue as to what was going on, as Murakami is a secretive man. Though they were all confident in taking down Spider-Man with their combined strength. The hand wasn't the only one to mobilize on that day. In the presidential suite of a French hotel, a man who seems to be the same age as Professor Charles Xavier sits on a balcony overlooking the city below. A dark wine red metal helmet sat on the table in front of him and three metal marbles hover and rotate over his open palm. Insert picture of Magneto here, Eric Lencher, also known as Magneto is a mutant with the ability to manipulate magnetic fields to his will and control metallic objects. He was a founding member of the X-Men but later left the group to form the Brotherhood of Mutants, which became a sort of rival organization to the X-Men. Magneto firmly believes that mutants should fight back against their human oppressors by any means necessary. An ideal that conflicted with the goals of his longtime close friend Charles Xavier, who sought a more pacifist approach to mutant prosperity. As such, Magneto was often an adversary to the X-Men but would team up with them when the situation called for it. While Eric was enjoying the view with a warm cup of coffee, a smartphone on the table buzzed and lit up with a message from a person named Raven. Grabbing and unlocking the phone, he saw that the message was just a video. Tapping play, the screen fills and the video plays. Silently watching the entire video, Magneto couldn't help but shake his head at his old chairbound friend, Charles, who was speaking in front of the United Nations about the coming emergence of their species. Mutants. Though something odd happened soon after. Spider-Man appears in the video speaking about ideas his old friend didn't think of and giving his two cents in the matter. Do you think it's a good idea to classify yourselves as mutants? Naming them after horror movie monsters is the worst way. We can't just segregate all metahumans to your school. That won't solve the problem. The world needs to see metahumans as just another race added to the mix. Metahumans, huh? Magneto finally speaks as the video ended. Doesn't sound so bad. Eric didn't know if Spider-Man was a mutant or not, but the man seemed to have his people's best interests at heart. Though, Charles has their best interest at heart as well, so it all depends on which side Spider-Man would take. The idealist or the realist? Of course, the idealist being Charles and the realist being Eric. Tapping a few times on his phone, Magneto sets it down and returns inside to pack his bags. The phone was still lit with two messages shown below the video he just watched. Eric, ELL Betesun. It's been a while since I've seen Charles. Raven, I'll have a hotel booked for your arrival. Unaware of the shitstorm heading his way, Peter spent the whole day in the library until he found the perfect way to protect his mind. 
at least until he could safely start practicing personal energies and build up his own telepathic skills and defenses. His solution came in the form of a fairly complicated enchantment, which is placed on the back of the head. Sadly, the enchantment leaves a mark unlike the protection Peter places on his friends and family. Thankfully, Peter has hair so the mark won't be noticeable unless he shaves his head like the ancient one. The enchantment is supposed to put up a mental barrier around the enchanter's mind, but that's not all. When that barrier is attacked, it redirects that energy back at the attacker with the same intensity. As long as the person doesn't try too hard after hitting the barrier, they'll only encounter a slight migraine that will last a few minutes. Though if someone continues to assault Peter's mind even after the migraine occurs, they could do some serious damage to themselves. A brain hemorrhage, brain bleed, could happen which would then cause a stroke or other serious side effects. If someone tried hard enough and fought through the pain, they could probably kill themselves. After spending half the night practicing the enchantment, so he doesn't blow his brains out of his eye sockets on accident, Peter finally placed the enchantment on himself. He hasn't tested it and he doesn't know how he would go about doing that other than asking a master to read his mind. Though Peter wasn't sure if he wanted to risk it. Some overzealous master may try showing off and bypass it somehow. Peter would rather just wait for the ancient one as he trusts her. It's hard not to after spending so much time with the woman. Checking his phone, Peter saw that the ancient one didn't answer his text yet, which means she's probably in some other dimension. I guess that I'll just have to wait for her to get back and hope it works until then. Peter thought as he portaled home and hopped into bed. Before heading off to sleep, Peter looked up some more Christmas presents. He has less than a week until Christmas dinner at MJ's house, so he needed to get everything beforehand. After ordering the last of his presents and some wrapping paper, Peter wrapped himself up in blankets and knocked out. While Peter slept soundly, multiple private jets filled with the leaders of the hand alongside their small armies flew to Japan. These planes would land long before Peter woke up the next morning. As for Magneto, he would make it to Japan long before the hand. With the help of his Omega level power, which basically means he is in the upper echelon of mutants, Eric encased himself in some scrap metal and flew to his destination at speeds well above Mach 2. When Peter woke up the next day, some of the packages he originally ordered had arrived already. After sneaking them into his room before May could snoop around, Peter completed his morning rituals and returned to Japan to accompany the president. They have a meeting with the representative from South Korea today after all. With the UK on board, only four more countries needed to join. Peter technically has school today but missing a few days here and there means nothing to him. With his current grades, the teachers wouldn't mind and MJ would bring him any work he missed. She and Ned know he's busy in Japan dealing with the Avengers plan anyway. While riding in the convoy leading to the UN building with the president by his side, Peter scrolled through his phone looking for texts from the Ancient One and Professor X, sadly, neither of them contacted him yet. He wasn't worried about the Ancient One, as she is more than strong enough to handle any situation. Charles on the other hand was probably still thinking about whether to take Peter's offer or not. Hopefully, he would come to a decision today. While enjoying the ride, Peter looked up any information on the UN meeting from yesterday, yet he couldn't find a single article on mutants or metahumans. No one leaked it yet? Peter thought in surprise. Although the information hasn't been leaked, it's just a matter of time until someone wants to make some quick money. Maybe I should speak to Charles about starting a public relations campaign on metahumans before the media finds out. Peter thought. When they arrived at the UN building, Peter sent a good morning text with a heart to MJ, explaining that he was in Japan still. Peter made Ned, MJ, and made their own ghost phones, so they could talk and text about sensitive information without S.H.I.E.L.D. or Hydra snooping. Put his phone away, Peter followed the president and his many secret servicemen inside. After sitting through some boring nonsense, Charles rolled his way up to the podium on the stage yet again, ready to finish his presentation from yesterday. Peter could see Storm at the side of the stage, accompanying the professor once again. As he parked next to the podium and grabbed the microphone, Charles tried to speak but suddenly the building began to shake and creak. What's happening? Is this an earthquake? The worldwide representatives were surprised and scared as some ducked under their desks. Peter looked toward a certain wall, where he could sense someone floating in the air outside of the building. Is it? Peter had a good idea of who was behind the wall. Professor X is here after all. His nemesis wouldn't be too far behind, would he? Instantly, Peter took his phone out of his pocket and opened a mini portal under the desk, throwing it inside stealthily. Every portion of Peter's suit is metal-free, so the only object on his person that could be used against him is his cell phone. Once his ghost phone was sent to his bedroom, Peter closed the portal and sat back, casually watching the show that would unfold. 
He would act if people started fighting and endangering the innocent individuals in the room, but it looks more like Magneto wants to make a grand entrance. Looking over at Peter, the president sees his spider friend's calm demeanor while looking at a portion of the wall. As Obama looked over at the wall as well, suddenly a huge chunk of it breaks off and floats away from the building. As the huge chunk of the UN building floats away, they could all hear the sound of the metal pipes underneath creaking and rattling. When the broken piece of the building crashes to the ground outside, the sun's rays stream into the meeting hall, but something floated in the air, blocking a portion of the light. Charles. A voice fills the area as a human-shaped outline floats into the building. It's good to see you again, old friend. Eric. Professor X replies curtly as Magneto enters the building, metal helmet and all. Almost instantly, Storm rushes to the professor's side, ready to fight at any moment, as she glares in Magneto's direction. Clouds begin to form outside as the low rumbling of thunder can be heard in the distance. Put your hands up? A particularly brave security officer pulls his pistol and aims it at Magneto shakily. Sighing to himself, Peter acts before Eric could and shoots a web at the weapon, pulling it out of the man's grasp. Everyone in the room saw this and looked at Peter in shock, not expecting Spider-Man to help this intruder. Even President Obama looked at Peter with surprise and a small amount of suspicion. Don't look at me like that. He used the metal pipes in the wall to make his entrance. It's obvious that he has some sort of metal manipulation powers. Do you think some bullets will do anything but make him angry? Peter comments with a shrug, causing every security officer to unsurely and reluctantly lower their weapons. A look of realization instantly filled everyone's faces, as they looked at Spider-Man apologetically for their earlier thoughts. Especially the president. Are you sure you aren't one of us, Spider-Man? That kind of quick thinking can only come from a mutant. Eric says as a small smile graces his lips. Or is it metahuman now? Magneto seemed to forget about the man that drew his gun on him, which was good as Peter would have to act if the man started attacking innocent people. I don't know if I'm a metahuman, but I wouldn't mind either way. Peter answers with a shrug. Though, shouldn't you be introducing yourself? Maybe land while you're at it? I don't feel like looking up while I'm talking to someone. It feels disrespectful. While Peter is talking with Eric, Charles and Storm have been talking over some sort of earpieces. They seem to be communicating with other members of the X-Men. I would love to introduce myself and speak with you, but it seems my presence has attracted a few flies. Magneto replies as he can hear Charles and Storm's conversation. Their earpieces have some metal in them, so Eric could easily listen in. Charles could probably use telepathy instead of earpieces, but the X-Men are most likely uncomfortable with having him in their heads. Suddenly, a thin blue mist fills a small portion of the area near Charles and Storm, and two very recognizable individuals appear. The first person was hard not to look at, as his indigo-colored velvety fur, blue skin, two-toed feet, three-fingered hands, yellow eyes, pointed ears, and prehensile tail were truly shocking at first glance. Insert picture of Nightcrawler here, Nightcrawler possesses superhuman agility, the ability to teleport, and adhesive hands and feet. The other person looked exactly like a scruffy-haired and bearded Hugh Jackman. As soon as he appeared alongside the Blue Beast Man, the Hugh Jackman lookalike appeared to be disoriented and off-balance, as three metal claws extended out from between his knuckles. Insert picture of Wolverine here, Wolverine is a mutant who possesses animal keen senses, enhanced physical capabilities, a powerful regenerative ability known as a healing factor, and three retractable claws in each hand. Wolverine and Peter couldn't recall the blue man's name. Kurt, I specifically said not to bring Logan. Charles admonished with a tired sigh. He wouldn't let go. Nightcrawler answers, giving an annoyed look toward Wolverine. There's no way I'm sitting on the sidelines. Logan says as he sends a death glare toward Magneto while growling. This schmuck sent me flying for miles last time. I need some good old-fashioned revenge. Every normal person in the room watched this play out without a clue as to what was going on. First, an intruder with superpowers breaks in and now two beast-like people somehow appear out of nowhere. This is the most confusing and scary situation all of them have ever been in. I would appreciate it if you kept your revenge for another day. Peter speaks up, drawing attention towards himself. I'm trying to have a conversation with Eric here. That is your name, right? Yes, but some call me Magneto. Eric replies, sending a taunting smirk in the X-Men's direction. Listen here, bub. Logan looks to Spider-Man as he points an accusing claw toward Magneto. I don't know who you are, but this doesn't concern you. Stay out of it. How do you not know Spider-Man? Kurt mutters in shock. Logan swiftly ignores Spider-Man's words and launches himself toward Magneto, who was still floating mid-air with an infuriating smile plastered all over his face. 
Sai, you brought this on yourself. Peter muttered as he shot a web at Logan's back. Huh? Wolverine grunts in surprise as Peter yanks the web, pulling Logan back and smashing him into the ground, breaking through to the floor below. Bang, I will say it again. Peter addresses everyone in the hall. I'm trying to have a civil conversation. The next person to. As Peter was speaking, Wolverine shoots out of the hole in the floor, thrusting his sharp claws in Peter's direction. Logan no. Professor X shouts. Peter didn't need his spider senses to know what was coming his way. Wolverine isn't the most stealthy of individuals, so he heard every stomp, grunt, and growl the beastly man made as he came barreling toward Peter's back. Without looking back, Peter sidestepped Logan's claws, which were aimed at his lower back. Logan, stop this instant. Charles yells once again as Wolverine swipes his claws toward Peter. Grr. Logan growled angrily as Peter once again slipped away from his attack. You should really listen to Charles over there. You're setting a bad example for your people. Peter comments, but Wolverine wasn't listening. Instead, a flurry of claw swipes launches Peter's way. Even though he couldn't land a single hit, Logan seemed to have entered a sort of beast mentality and just wouldn't give up. Okay, you brought this on yourself. Peter mutters as he turns toward the group of X-Men, who were torn between stopping Logan or attacking Magneto. I'll only knock him out. Just give me a minute. With that said, Peter went on the offensive. Ducking under a claw swipe, he juts his leg out, throwing Logan off balance. As his opponent tries to regain his footing, Peter stands back up and Spartan kicks Wolverine into the wall on the other side of the room, embedding the man into the wall. Not giving the raging Wolverine even a second to regain his bearings, Peter shoots a web, which sticks to the man's forehead. Just as Peter was about to pull him out of the wall, Logan swipes the web with his claws, cutting through it like a hot knife through butter. Hmm, webs seem to be useless unless your hands are bound somehow. Peter thought out loud as Wolverine kicked off the wall and rushed in his direction. Get over here, punk! Logan yells as Peter begins dodging his claw attacks yet again. Okay, this has gone on long enough. Peter mutters as he sidesteps an attack and sends a powerful punch to Logan's solar plexus. Ugh. Wolverine grunts in pain as he falls to a knee. As he takes a knee and supports his aching stomach, kidneys, and liver, Peter swiftly lifts his leg, driving his knee into Logan's forehead. The hit could be heard all across the hall, as everyone flinched in pain from just the sound. Crack Wolverine instantly toppled over onto the floor, knocked out cold. His claws even retracted as his body hit the ground, no longer moving. Logan. Nightcrawler appears beside the downed body in a puff of blue smoke, checking Logan's vitals and sighing in relief. He's fine. Good, why don't you teleport him home? Peter says as he walks over to his chair next to the president, who was watching the whole scene, impressed by Spider-Man's performance. He wasn't the only one, either. Everyone in the meeting hall was looking at Peter with the same look as President Obama. They were all very impressed with how the situation was handled. Do as Spider-Man says. He's useless against Eric anyway. Charles said, as Nightcrawler looked toward him, unsure of whether to listen to Peter or not. I'll return in just a moment. Kurt says as he lays a hand on Logan's shoulder and disappears in a puff of thin blue vapor-like smoke. Eric, you shouldn't have come. Charles looks toward Magneto, ready to fight at any moment. None of that, please. Peter speaks before fighting words could be said. There will be no fighting here. Spider-Man, you don't understand. Charles turns toward Peter, but still keeps Magneto in view. Eric is an extremist criminal. I'm neither of those labels. Magneto speaks up with a mock hurt look. I happen to be an upstanding citizen. There's not a single blemish on my record. As for extremist, I prefer realist. A realist would have used the door. Peter cuts into the conversation. An extremist breaks open his own entrance like the Kool-Aid man. As Peter says this, a few people in the hall chuckle, while the X-Men appear vindicated in their earlier statement. As for Magneto, his smile disappeared as soon as Peter finished speaking. He didn't like being called an extremist, but he couldn't refute Peter's words. He did break through the wall after all. As for being a criminal, Dash, Peter speaks as he turns to the many UN representatives in the room. Do any of your countries recognize this man as a criminal? What's his full name, Professor? Eric Lencher. Charles replies instantly. After a moment of silence, none of the country's representatives spoke up. Well, why don't you all make some calls and find out for sure? Until we have information, we'll treat Eric here as another representative for metahumans. Peter says as he turns to Magneto. That is why you came here, correct? Yes. Eric nods as the smile returns to his face. I can't let old Charles take the lead over me, can I? It's not a competition, Eric. Charles admonishes his old friend. 
I'm trying to set up a safe future for metahumans. That's it. If you wanted the same thing, you wouldn't have broken into the building, scaring all of these people. People that we need to make a good impression on. He's right. One of the representatives in the crowd speaks up. Why are we treating this man like a guest? He broke into the building like a common criminal. The crowd of normal humans in the room couldn't help but nod at this statement, wondering why Spider-Man was doing this. Would you rather make the superpowered man our enemy or give him a chance to become an ally? Peter speaks from his seat, gesturing toward the still floating Magneto. I, for one, would rather make friends over enemies. He may have broken in, but that can be easily fixed. Spider-Man has a point. Obama speaks up for the first time in a while. No one has been hurt after all. Let's not make enemies and speak like civilized people. The United States Treasury will cover the damage to the building as well. Everyone seemed to calm down after Peter and the President's words. The Japanese Prime Minister looked very pleased with Obama's words as well. After all, this was his country's building that was damaged. After hearing this and seeing which way the wind was blowing, Charles and the X-Men bit their tongues, not knowing what to say at this point. Blue mist filled the air once again as Nightcrawler returned without Logan this time, thankfully. He simply walked over to Charles, unsure of what was happening anymore. It seems we've come to a conclusion. Peter pulls up a seat next to him and looks back at the still floating Magneto. Land and take a seat. You'll be allowed to speak after Charles. Floating over to Peter and the President, Magneto takes the seat on the other side of Peter. As this was happening, the X-Men didn't look pleased at all. On the other hand, Eric was loving every moment of this. One moment, there's a breeze. Peter says as he walks over to the broken wall. Using his webs as rope, Peter pulled the missing piece of the building back into place and glued the cracks with some quick web shots, closing off the meeting hall once again. That should hold until some repairmen can work their magic. Peter says as he walks back to his seat, looking at the out-of-place UN representatives. You can all sit as well. The meeting isn't finished yet. No one has to worry. If a fight breaks out, I'll put a stop to it, I promise. Breaking out of their shock, the many representatives fix their clothes and take a seat once again, putting back on their professional personas, please continue your presentation, Professor Xavier. President Obama says as everyone was back at their desks. Sigh? Charles looks around the room in exasperation. I would like to go on record saying you shouldn't allow Eric to speak. He's an extremist who would rather build up metahumans into some sort of master race, than work together and coexist with the rest of the world. I? Eric goes to speak, but Peter places a hand on his shoulder, stopping him. You'll have your time to speak after, Charles. Peter says with a shake of his head. Magneto shut his mouth, knowing he could make his point soon enough. With the mic all to himself, Professor X went into a long presentation about his boarding school and how it would work. He also mentioned briefly about a team of trained metahumans that would protect the world from any criminals of their kind. As he said this, Charles and the rest of the X-Men looked over at Magneto, making sure the people in the room understood who would be their main target. The X-Men's goal in coming here is to gain funding and the ability to recruit metahumans from all around the world to this school. As Charles finished up his presentation, the X-Men left the stage and Magneto took their place. The smile on his face truly infuriated every member of the X-Men. As Magneto walked onto the stage and took the podium, everyone in the room waited with bated breath. They wondered if this man was as crazy as he seemed. After all, he broke into the building like some comic book villain. Good evening. As you've already heard from my old friend Charles, my name is Eric, Eric Lencher. Though some have taken to calling me Magneto, for my magnetic powers, of course. Eric introduces himself very charismatically. I have lived a troubled life and felt the true cruelty of mankind, not only as a mutant but also as a Jew as well. When I was only a child, I was forced to watch as my people suffered under the horrors inflicted by the Nazis. I was filled with hatred and anger, mainly toward a certain Nazi scientist named Sebastian Shaw. Shaw murdered my mother before my very eyes and forced me to experience horrendous tortures. Magneto explains. Of course, these tortures were of him experimenting on me, like some sort of lab rat. Eric says in disgust as he makes the microphone float above the podium. He knew that I had this power and treated me less than human. Like a Jew. After all, we were in Auschwitz. A Jew has no rights or freedom there. He could do as he pleased to any of us and no one would bat an eye. In fact, they would celebrate my torture. Eric pauses for just a moment, really letting his words sink in. He is truly a very charismatic man. I am absolutely devoted to the cause of protecting mutant kind, or metahumans as it's called now. I refuse to let my people suffer a similar holocaust, not when I have the power to protect them. I will protect my race at any cost, no matter who gets in my way. 
I will not allow a single man, woman, or child to go through the horrors I was subjected to. Magneto continues. Whether this makes me your enemy or not means little. So very little. Eric says this and turns to look Professor Xavier in the eyes. I will become the cruelest of villains if it means keeping my people safe and happy. Though, I hope it never comes to that. The room becomes deathly quiet as everyone took in Magneto's speech. They could all feel the emotion in his voice and the truth behind his threats. He would really slaughter them all if it meant keeping his people alive and safe. Clap clap clap, clapping was heard as everyone turned to Spider-Man, who was giving Eric a standing ovation while wiping some non-existent tears from his masked face. I applaud your ideals, and I'm sorry you had to go through that. Peter says as he stops clapping. Though, have you ever thought that maybe, just maybe, you're wasting a perfect opportunity? How so? Eric asks in confusion. Well, Peter gestures toward Charles. We have the carrot dash, then motions back toward Magneto. And the stick. A reluctant look appears on Charles's face as Peter says this. He knew exactly where Peter was going with this. The kind guiding hand and face of metahumans. A poor crippled man who wants nothing more than to make a school and protect superpowered children through peace and cooperation. Peter says as he takes a seat once again, then we have you, Eric. The man that comes knocking when that cooperation and peace is being threatened. Whether it be from normal humans or metahumans alike. I? Eric was lost for words. He tried working with Charles once before, and it didn't end well. Their friendship was irrevocably ruined due to their different schools of thought. We've tried this before. Charles interjects. Our opinions are just too different. Eric simply nodded at his old friend's words. If there's one thing they can agree on, it's this. Except they're not. Peter says with a shake of his head. Charles, you briefly mentioned the creation of a team of metahumans, which would protect normal people from criminals of your kind, right? Charles nods, not fully understanding where this was going. Okay, so what happens when that team runs into criminal humans attacking a metahuman? Peter asks, causing Charles to go silent. T they would. Charles was lost for words. What would you do, Eric? Peter turns to the stage and asks. I would save my people with any means necessary. Magneto answered instantly, sending a disappointed look toward Charles. You two old senile idiots may not see it, but you are made for each other. The carrot and the stick. The politician and the enforcement. The guiding hand and the hand that strikes when the other is bitten. Peter says, gesturing between the two. The principal and the leader of the team, which protects the peace through force when necessary. Partners working together for the betterment of mankind as a whole. Because that's what metahumans are. Just a new part of mankind. The room goes quiet as Peter pauses, looking at the confused and reluctant look on Professor Xavier's face. Meanwhile, Eric seemed thoughtful as he heard Peter's viewpoint of their situation. We can't. He's just too extreme. The second a metahuman is attacked, he'll slaughter everyone in the vicinity. Charles says in sadness as he shakes his head negatively. Then what happens to all of my work? He's a liability. Do you truly think so little of me, Charles? Eric asks with a surprised and sad look on his face. Yes, I've seen what you've done. Professor X says as he looks at Magneto in disgust. I don't know what you're talking about, but I've never killed anyone that didn't deserve it. My death count is filled with grapists, torturers, mad scientists, and other rotten folks, who have committed countless atrocities against our kind. Eric clarifies, shocking everyone in the room. So, you're telling me that if you see a normal man strike a weak and helpless metahuman in the face, you won't act rashly and murder him? Charles throws out a theoretical scenario. Pfft. No. I may rough him up a bit, though. Magneto laughs incredulously. You really believe that I'm some sort of madman, don't you? Yes. Charles answers instantly, without a hint of remorse. It seems that you two have some issues to work through, but that doesn't mean my assumption isn't correct. If you two truly want what's best for your people, then working together is the best decision on the table. Peter addresses both of the elderly mutant leaders. Divided, you and all metahumans will fall, but together I can see this whole thing really working out. Separate, you two will be far too busy fighting each other to truly fight for the cause of metahuman equality. Peter says, getting reluctant nods from both parties. At the end of the day, both of you want the same thing. A safe world, where metahumans are accepted like any other race of people, so why not combine forces? Based on what I've seen here today, I'm sure arguments will unfold almost constantly, but you're both grown men. Elderly even. Speak like adults and come to the best solution possible. It's that easy. As Peter finished speaking, neither side could find words to say and today's meeting was coming to an end. When everyone saw the time, the meeting was called to a stop for the day. Charles and the X-Men left the building almost immediately.
Professor Xavier had a contemplative and undecided look on his face as he left in a puff of blue smoke alongside Nightcrawler and Storm. Peter wanted to invite him to a meeting again, but sadly, they left before he could even ask them to join him. With one option gone, Peter turned to the other. He would love to involve a level-headed Magneto in the Avengers plan, after all. Hey, Eric. Peter calls Magneto before the man could take off as the X-Men had. Yes? Eric breaks from his contemplative thought and walks over to Spider-Man. I have a meeting, and I'd like to invite you along. It's about something you may be interested in. Peter says, motioning for Magneto to follow him. The president had already left to meet with the South Korean UN representative, so they needed to hurry. All right, lead the way. Eric agrees with an interested glimmer in his eyes. You haven't let me down so far. After going through yet another explanation of the Avengers plan, but this time with the South Korean representative and Magneto, the South Korean representative instantly agreed with everything. She was even more excited about it than the UK representative was yesterday. It seems that the demonstration of metahuman powers from today's UN meeting was really helping Peter's cause. He now had the United States of America, the United Kingdom, and South Korea backing the Avengers initiative. Seeing as every country was delighted to get involved with the Avengers now, Peter told the President and the UN representatives to get a meeting with China, France, and the United Arab Emirates all together tomorrow. If they all agreed, then Peter would have enough backing to bring the Avengers plan to the rest of the UN and 100% get their agreement. They didn't plan to be as secretive as S.H.I.E.L.D., after all. These secretive meetings are only to make sure it gets passed when that time came along. Peter was tired of meetings and just wanted to get the ball rolling on building the Avengers, which would happen soon. With Stark's money and S.H.I.E.L.D.'s intel, it wouldn't take long for the Avengers to become a real thing. Little does Peter know that as a member of the future Avengers Council, meetings like these will be a fairly regular occurrence for him. When the South Korean representative left the room with everyone else, leaving Peter and Magneto behind, Eric turned to Peter with a thoughtful look, you want me to become a part of this Avengers organization? Magneto asks, unsure of himself. Yes, and I'd like to get Charles involved too. Peter replies with a nod. This hero business is something that Charles would definitely go for. Me, on the other hand, not so much. Eric says with a shake of his head. All I care for is the safety and well-being of my people. That's it. Haha, <laughs> and you think that doesn't make you a hero? Peter laughs at Magneto's way of thinking. You rant about how you want to save metahumans and keep them safe from harm. What do you think that makes you to them? Their leader. Eric replies with a thoughtful look. A leader can be a hero as well. In fact, they happen to make the best leaders in my opinion. Peter comments matter-of-factly. I plan for the Avengers to be a group of the strongest people on this planet. We would keep the peace and handle any situation that calls for our assistance. Are you telling me that, as a leader of metahumans, you don't want your people to be a part of this? Metahumans are the most powerful people on this planet. Anyone else in this organization of yours would be nothing but weak humans. Eric scoffs and shakes his head. Do you really think that metahumans are the only superpowered group of people on this planet? Let's not even mention the threats outside of our solar system. There are people on this planet, who were born as normal humans, that could slaughter you in the time it takes to snap their fingers together. Peter says, referring to the masters of Kamartage. Of course, Peter has had the anti-surveillance function on his phone switched on since the beginning of this meeting. He wasn't worried about anyone overheating either, as he could sense anyone in the area. What do you mean by that? Eric asked, not sure what Spider-Man was talking about. He's been alive on this earth since the Second World War and hasn't seen a single person, other than mutants, who had any sort of superpower. Not including Captain America, who was made that way in a laboratory and has been dead for a long while now. Why do you think I have my powers, yet I said that I'm not a metahuman? Peter asks as realization slowly fills Eric's face. I got my powers from another source and I've met others that are far stronger than myself. Why haven't I heard of these people? Magneto asks, not fully believing Peter's words. They are very secretive, but they aren't the only ones out there. We have information on some other superpowered individuals on Earth as well. After all, the Avengers need to do some recruitment after our establishment. Peter doesn't fully explain as he doesn't want to out Kamartage completely. On Earth? Why do you keep using these terms? Eric asks. I'm afraid that I can't explain any further. Peter says with a shake of his head. You'll have to join to get more details. Instantly, Magneto became quiet as the room descended into silence. He just sat there and looked at Peter in contemplation, reading his every movement and expression. Peter didn't mind and waited patiently for Magneto's reply. By this point, Peter was sure that the man before him hasn't radicalized into the true villain that is Magneto just yet. 
He was on the path to that fate, but Peter wanted to change that. Not only to get rid of a future enemy but also to add a powerful ally to his arsenal. That arsenal being the Avengers organization. Peter's vision for the Avengers, other than protecting the Earth, is a true powerhouse that pretty much runs the world. Though they wouldn't actually have a position in any government. They would become the thing that stops all conflict on the planet. All war would cease to exist. Governments, companies, and other organized groups would fear and respect them. Every country on the planet would have its own nuclear deterrent in the form of the Avengers, who would protect the peace. Of course, this would take some time to set up fully, but Peter was hopeful and ready to make it happen. Soon enough, Magneto looked determined and spoke up. Fine, I'll join, but I want a seat on the council you spoke of earlier. Eric agreed but gives a stipulation as well. I'll have to speak about this to the other soon-to-be councilmen, but I agree, so they should be amenable to the idea. Peter answers with a shrug. Although he's been the one spearheading this whole project since Fury brought it to them, Peter isn't the one in charge. The Avengers Council would be working as a group to come to every important decision, and this happens to be one of those decisions. Peter wasn't worried about Eric taking such a high position. He already planned to offer a similar position to Professor Xavier, and if he wants Magneto to join as well, the man wouldn't take anything less than being on the same level as his old friend slash nemesis. All right, here, take this. Eric nods understandingly as he writes down his phone number. Call me when everyone has come to a decision. All right, I'll have an answer for you in a couple of days. Peter says as he accepts the number. I expect that you're going to offer Charles a council position as well? Magneto asks. Yes, he was here for a similar meeting yesterday. Though he hasn't given me an answer and ran away today before I could speak about it. Peter says in mock annoyance. After finishing their meeting, Peter walked Eric out of the building, but before he could fly away as he came, one of the workers from the UN building walked toward them. It was a balding middle-aged man in a shitty tan suit, which didn't seem to be the right size. He was an assistant that would do grunt work during meetings. Fetching supplies, refreshments, and the like. As he gets closer to them, his demeanor and walk suddenly changes from a modest, conservative man to the swinging hips of a confident woman. Instantly, a smile graced Eric's lips as he sees this change happen, realizing exactly who this is. After the person's walk changed, scale-like movement shuddered along their skin and clothing, as their entire being morphed into a beautiful naked blue-skinned woman with orange-red hair and yellow eyes, similar to Nightcrawler. Insert picture of Mystique here, Raven, as ravishing as ever. Eric says as he leans forward and pecks her on the cheek. Eric, it seems our cause is changing. Raven says with a smile. Though I like the way things are headed now. Of course, you do. Magnetic says with a laugh. You just want to spend time with Charles again. As for our cause, it's always been the same. The only thing that's changing is the plan. I guess you're right? The only thing that's changing is the plan. Magneto says with a thoughtful look. I guess you're right? Mystique says as she turns to Spider-Man, who was having a hard time looking away from her exposed body. You should take a picture. It'll last longer. At the end of the day, Peter is only 15 years old, so his hormones are all over the place. He's about as horny as it can get for a teenager these days, so seeing a naked woman that he 100% whacked off to in his past life was shocking to say the least. Well, don't walk around naked if you don't want people to look. Peter replies as he embarrassingly looks away, getting his hormones under control. I may need to visit MJ after this. He has a point, Raven. Magneto chuckles as he pats Peter's shoulder. Spider-Man, this is my good friend Raven. Mystique. Raven corrects as she nods toward Peter. Only those close to me can call me Raven. Mystique it is. Peter nods, not offended by her prickly personality. I'm guessing it was you who tipped Eric off about Charles visiting the UN? There was no news coverage or posts online about the contents of this week's meetings, and she was disguised as a member of the UN only moments ago. I hope the man you're impersonating is still alive and well. Peter asks with an unseen eyebrow raise. He won an all-expense paid trip to Hawaii for himself and his family. Mystique says with a smile and a shrug. Good, I'll overlook the spying then. After all, we'll be working together soon enough. Peter says and turns to Eric. I'll speak to Stark about your stipulation today. All right, we should be going. Eric says as he turns to see some people gathering to look at Spider-Man, the oddly dressed man, and the blue-skinned woman. We seem to be drawing a crowd. Okay, I'll message you soon. Peter says as Mystique grabs hold of Magneto and they soar into the air, disappearing over the horizon. Camera flashes started going off as some fast-handed civilians tried taking pictures of the two flying away. Peter simply shrugged and swung away, 
finding a safe place to portal home and spend some time with MJ. Because Peter portaled home after the meeting, intending to visit MJ and then speak to Tony later on, the Hand, who was lying in wait near the UN building had a hard time finding Spider-Man. After trying to follow him as he swung away, they soon learned that Peter moves far too fast for them to follow. Once they lost sight of their target, Hand Ninja searched the whole city including the hotel where the US president was staying, but Spider-Man was nowhere to be found. After searching for who knows how long, the fingers of the Hand met in Murakami's mansion, standing around his office and admiring the blood and destruction that filled the room. This place is a mess. A middle-aged white woman with short brown hair and matching eyes spoke. Insert picture of MCU Alexandra Reed here. Alexandra Reed is the leader of the five founders, or the fingers, of the hand in the wake of their own banishment from Kuanluan for their heresy. Kuanluan is a mystical lost city located in a different dimension, and one of the seven capital cities of heaven. The gate to Kuanluan can be accessed from China once every 15 years. Over 2000 years ago, Kuanluan was the base of operations of a monastic order called the Order of the Crane Mother. The elders of the order studied the properties of the ancient mystical force known as Qi, using its power as a healing agent. Five disciples of the order sought to use their knowledge of this Qi to attain immortality, transgressing the order's teachings. The five were swiftly banished from the order and thrown out of their home, Kuanluan, eventually forming the shadow organization known as the Hand with the ultimate goal of regaining access to their home once again and earning perfect immortality. Four of these five disciples are currently in this room. With the last one trapped in the mirror dimension by Spider-Man, but they don't know that. Of course, it's a mess. That hermit, Murakami and his men fought one of the strongest men on this planet. I still don't understand why he would pick such a fight in the first place. An elderly Chinese woman with black hair with a cane holding her up comments. Insert picture of MCU Madame Gao here, Madame Gao has spent the majority of her life as the money-making finger of the hand. She has always been the one to run their businesses, whether they be legal or otherwise. She has especially spent a lot of time recently in New York City, running the hand's heroin trade with the help of Rand Enterprises, so she knows the kind of power Spider-Man possesses. Madame Gao is a diminutive elderly woman, who hides a great deal of wicked wisdom and superpowered strength under the guise of a weak elderly woman. Who cares? We need to find this Spider-Man. Anyone who dares to offend the hand must be dealt with. A bearded black man in an expensive looking white suit and hat scoffs. Insert picture of MCU Sound here, Sound, also known as White Hat, is not only one of the five fingers of the hand but also a powerful African warlord. He can be described as a truly twisted individual, who takes great pleasure in causing as much pain as he can to his enemies. In the many years of Sound's life, he has been constantly at war with the Chaste's forces. The Chaste is an ancient organization created to oppose the Hand, and he is the finger of the Hand that mainly handles this enemy. Centuries ago, the Hand swept across Asia, killing anyone who stood in their way. They slaughtered everyone in a village except for a single boy, who fought back. Using a knife he pulled from his dead mother's body, this boy was able to defeat the Hand's best warriors. He became known as the Chaste and as he grew, he recruited as many warriors as he could to his side, training them how to fight and passing down his knowledge of the Hand. That group later named themselves after their founder and has been fighting against the Hand for hundreds and hundreds of years. Sawin was once captured by the Chaste, who trapped him inside a castle, attempting to torture information out of him. After three days, Sawin's armies approached the fortress where the Chaste held him. The armies of the Hand starved out the fortress and on the tenth day, when they had run out of food and water, the Chaste knelt before Sawin and begged him to make it stop. Of course, Sawin tortured them to death for just as many days they kept him there, starting his vendetta against the Chaste. Ever since that day, Sawin has made it his personal duty to battle the Chaste, torturing all members they capture for the ten days he was held, before brutally ending their suffering. It may be best to negotiate with Spider-Man. He isn't someone we should make an enemy of. Let's just get Murakami back and go our separate ways. A bearded Spanish-looking man with black hair and dark brown eyes tries to calm the situation. Insert picture of MCU Bakudo here, Bakudo is a very manipulative man. He would smile and treat anyone like a friend, but only a moment later chop their head off without an ounce of regret. Recruitment is Bakudo's specialty. As a very charismatic man, he has been in charge of recruiting and training for the Hands Army since the beginning of their organization. Since Bakudo has to travel between the many dojos he operates around the world, he has spent a good amount of time in New York and has personally seen Spider-Man in action a handful of times. The only one in the room that understands his reluctance is Madame Gao, as she has been spending time in New York lately as well. They both understand the power Spider-Man possesses very well. 
Before anyone could speak any further, the door to the bloody and destroyed office flew open, and in walks a ninja with black eyes. Murakami. The ninja shouts angrily in a deep rumble demonic voice. Where are my servants? Keikaiji sama Sawan mutters in perfect Japanese with an extreme amount of respect. All four founders of the hand were shocked and slightly scared. The demon before them rarely leaves its temple, yet here he is, and he looks angry. Where is that waste, Murakami? The demonic ninja asks in annoyance. Why are all of you suddenly in my country? H.E. has gone missing. Alexandra Reed takes control. We came looking for him. He was last seen with Spider-Man. The Spider? Westchester, New York. Upon returning to his family mansion, which was currently under construction as it is being renovated into the metahuman boarding school that it would soon become, Professor Xavier rolled past some workers and into his office followed by Storm and Nightcrawler. As they entered the office, they couldn't help but notice the still sleeping form of Logan, laid out on the leather couch with a stupid look on his face. Though he was kneed in the face by Spider-Man earlier in the day, nothing but Wolverine's clothes gave away that he was just in a scuffle. The healing factor is a truly useful power to have. As the door to the room closed almost silently, Logan sprang up from the couch, landing on his feet with his claws instantly shooting out of his knuckles. Looking around the room as he growled like a feral animal, Logan searches for the iconic blue and red spider suit, ready to tear Spider-Man apart with his claws. Where's that spider? I'll tear his head off. Logan asks as he noticed Charles and the rest standing in the room, looking at him with vigilance. They knew Logan's mutation made him sort of animalistic and wondered if they would have to physically restrain him until he calms down. He isn't here. Kurt says as he and Storm stand in front of Professor Xavier protectively. You need to calm down, Logan. Shit. Wolverine breathes heavily as he thinks for a moment before storming out of the room. Logan. Charles yells, briefly stopping Wolverine before he rounded the corner. Where are you going? I just need some air. Logan says in a false calmness as he paces down the hall and out of the mansion. Well, at least he's calming down. Kurt mutters as he takes a seat in front of the professor's desk. No, I may not read your minds, as it's a breach of privacy, but I can still feel the emotions you radiate. Charles says with a shake of his head, pulling up his chair behind the big oakwood desk. Logan is enraged right now. He's probably been waiting for the day he could get back at Eric, but that moment was ruined by Spider-Man. Now he doesn't know what to do with all of that bottled up anger. It's for the best though. Storm finally speaks. Yes, we can't leave a bad impression on the UN. If a full-scale fight broke out, then all of our plans for the future would have been derailed. Kurt says, appreciating Spider-Man's help. Silence suddenly fills the room, as Charles gets lost in thought. The events of the day played out in his mind, reviewing every aspect of his experience. Charles wanted nothing more than to work with Eric in their quest to save metahumankind, but sadly, the man didn't trust his old friend anymore. He has seen the aftermath of Magneto's work in the many years they've been apart. Eric has killed hundreds of people, but now that he thought of this, Charles wondered if they deserved it, as he said they did. My death count is filled with grapists, torturers, mad scientists, and other rotten folks, who have committed countless atrocities against our kind. Charles remembered every person Magneto has killed in front of him or the crime scenes he's visited where Eric had been, and he couldn't say for sure that none of them didn't deserve it, which scared him. As his mind went down this rabbit hole, Charles questioned his entire ideology and separation from his old friend. Maybe we were both wrong. Charles thought as he looked back at his past. Charles was too trusting and optimistic, while Eric was too violent and vengeful. They needed to come to a happy medium and work together instead of against one another. Professor, I think we should consider working with Spider-Man and Magneto. Kurt breaks the silence, receiving a raised eyebrow from Storm. No, I agree with Spider-Man, but Magneto will never see things our way. Storm refuses with a shake of her head. Hearing the disagreement going on, as if his thoughts were being echoed from Nightcrawler and Storm's mouths, Charles let loose a chuckle in self-deprecation. I need to make a phone call. Professor Xavier says, motioning the two toward the door. Would you mind giving me some privacy? As the two confusingly leave the room, shutting the door behind them, Charles takes out his cell phone and dials the number Spider-Man gave them yesterday. Ring ring ring. Hello? The familiar voice of Spider-Man is heard as the ringing stops. You've reached their amazing Spider-Man. How can I help you? Though some heavy breathing could be heard as well, Charles writes that off as the man running around, catching criminals. Hello, it's Charles Xavier. Hello, it's Charles Xavier. A voice says over the phone. As soon as he hears who it is, Peter looks down to see a curious and slightly annoyed MJ staring up at him. Peter had practically barged into her room, 
jumping onto the bed, and sealed her lips with his. Sadly, that wonderful moment didn't last very long, as his phone started ringing only moments after. It wasn't his normal phone either, as he would have gladly ignored that. It was his ghost phone. He couldn't ignore that as it could be something important, so he pulled away and answered, revealing that he is Spider-Man. Thankfully, MJ's mother wasn't home, or else another person would learn of Peter's secret identity. Charles, I'm happy you called. Peter says, looking down reluctantly at MJ, who sighed and nodded toward him. Covering the phone microphone, Peter bends down and gives MJ one last kiss. I'm sorry, feel free to listen in. I'll put it on speaker. Rolling off of MJ, Peter turns on the speakerphone and places the phone between them. Peter knew that his job as a hero would come between him and MJ, but as long as he involves her as much as he can, she hopefully won't feel left out. This is why Peter tells her and his loved ones almost everything about his life and asks for advice here and there when he needs it. After today's events, I've thought about what you offered. Professor Xavier says as he pauses for a brief moment. And? Peter asks as MJ started putting the pieces together. Peter told her about yesterday's UN meeting, so MJ knows about the metahumans that her boyfriend is trying to recruit, but she knows nothing of what happened today as Peter hasn't said anything yet. I'm willing to join the Avengers and work with you, but I want a position on the council. As Charles says this, Peter couldn't control himself and muted the microphone before he started laughing uncontrollably. Both of them made the same exact stipulation, which Peter found hilarious. Charles may not trust his old friend Eric, but they were more alike than either of them would like to admit, which was good for their future cooperation. MJ just looked at Peter weirdly as he started laughing out of nowhere on her bed. I'll explain in a minute. Peter says as he unmutes the phone. That sounds reasonable. I'll have to speak with the other future council members first, but I see no problem with that. Good, thank you for your time. Call me back when you have an answer. Charles says and hastily ends the call, purposely not giving Peter any time to speak about Magneto. These senile old men are truly blind. Peter mutters as he puts the phone on MJ's nightstand. Was that the guy who wants to open a metahuman school? MJ asks and Peter nods, launching into a whole explanation about today's events and his plans. So, you're trying to combine these two rival groups into one, and add them both to your Avengers plan? MJ sums it all up. Yeah, pretty much. Peter nods as he pulls her closer, wrapping his arms around her waist. Do you really think these aliens you saw when you met my dad will actually come back? MJ asks, as that was the reason for all of this planning. Truthfully, I don't know. Peter says, unsure of how to answer that, as he has future knowledge. It doesn't matter, though. With these metahumans popping up and everything else that's happened, it's just best to be safe. Silence fills the room as MJ squeezes Peter in a tight hug. I don't want anything to happen to you. MJ says as she buries her head into Peter's shoulder. Nothing bad will happen to me. Peter says, knowing that this is a typical death flag. Where's this coming from? I'm just worried about everything that's happened. MJ says as she looks up into Peter's eyes. You went from a normal hero, saving people from burning buildings and stopping the occasional bank robbery, but now you're starting some superhero group, aliens exist, and these other super-powered people are popping up. It's just a matter of time until someone strong enough to hurt you comes along, and I'm not strong enough to help at all. By this point, some tears were streaming down MJ's face as she looked up at Peter in worry. Peter was speechless for a moment, as he didn't expect this. MJ seems to have been holding this in for a while now, yet she hasn't said anything until now. You don't have to worry about me. Peter says as he wipes the tears from MJ's cheeks. I'm working my way to being the strongest person on this planet. It may take some time, but I'll get there eventually. I know that but... MJ says, but stops reluctantly. What? Peter asks. Nothing. MJ says, obviously holding something back. I just want you to be safe. After comforting MJ for a while, she fell asleep and Peter left the bed, taking a moment to tuck her in before leaving. When she held back whatever she was going to say, Peter had a good idea of what it was. MJ said it herself just moments beforehand. And I'm not strong enough to help at all. MJ was feeling useless. Peter was out here stopping crime, preparing for future enemies, and building a world-saving organization. Meanwhile, she was just a normal girl without powers and felt inadequate in a way. This didn't bother Peter one bit, but it seemed to eat away at her, as humans are very protective of their loved ones, like most animals. It wasn't a big deal when the worst Peter was fighting were armed gunmen, but now that the X-Men have surfaced and aliens are a thing, MJ is worried about him and wants to protect him. Sadly, she has no powers to do so. Her only option is to train her body and learn martial arts, but that would do nothing against the average metahuman. 
Even Black Widow is pretty useless against these people, and she's slightly enhanced herself. Peter didn't push her to say it, but he knew what she was feeling and thinking. Ned doesn't think like this yet. At least he hopes that Ned doesn't, but even in the movies, Ned had a natural skill in the mystic arts, so he would sooner or later be able to help out. As for MJ, she never showed a proclivity toward the mystic arts. Though that doesn't mean she can't learn. The only problem is getting the Ancient One to agree and accept either of them. She specifically said that she hates teaching children and teenagers, as they have other commitments, like school, sports, clubs, etc. Peter was an exception, as he was a hero with superpowers already, who piqued the Ancient One's interest due to her inability to see his arrival and change from the normal Spider-Man. He doubted she would sign up for taking two other teenagers that needed special treatment due to their school schedules. Getting the Ancient One to take them into Kamar Taj may be impossible. Not to mention the fact that Ned and MJ may fall behind in school if they start learning at Kamar Taj. They're both astoundingly smart, but at the end of the day, Peter is an anomaly. He could miss the next thousand days of school, and still pass as long as he comes in to take tests. I could teach them, but I don't have the time. Peter thought as he switched to his spider suit and opened a portal to Tony's house in Los Angeles. He would go and ask the Ancient One if she would accept them as students anyway, as you never know unless you try, but she isn't around right now. Peter hasn't even gotten a text back yet, so she's probably still in some other dimension. If she says no, I can still make a way for MJ to get stronger. Peter thought as he stepped into Tony's mansion, which was practically empty due to him moving to New York. They live in a comic book world, so there's always a way to gain superpowers. Peter just has to find the best and safest route and MJ won't feel useless anymore. Who knows, the odds are against her, but MJ could have the X-Gene. All he would have to do is find a way to activate it, as Professor Xavier stated. Peter could have the X-Gene as well. I'll have to look into this. Peter thought as he spotted Tony going over some papers in his kitchen. Yo. Hey, Webhead. Tony says as he looks up from his papers, pushing them away with a tired sigh. What's up? We need to have a meeting with Fury about Avengers business. I have some information and recruits to speak about. Peter says as he opens the fridge to find nothing but condiments. Dude, you need to go shopping. I'm moving. What's the point? Tony shrugs as he looks over at a nearby laptop. Jarvis, text the angry pirate and tell him we need to meet at my place. Yes, sir. Jarvis answers. Ah, are you and Fury pen pals now? Peter asks as he closes the empty fridge disappointedly. No, I still don't trust him, but it seems I don't have a choice in the matter. Tony says as he gives Peter an accusatory look. What? We need his help either way. As long as he keeps sensitive information to himself and acts like a team player, I see no reason not to give the guy a chance. Peter says with a shrug. Though that doesn't mean we shouldn't be cautious. All right? Tony says reluctantly. Sir, Director Fury is on the way. Jarvis says announces. After half an hour of just messing around and talking about Tony's move to New York City, the Quinjet landed in the backyard and took off as soon as Fury stepped out. Is this about the mutants? He says as soon as he steps inside Tony's house. Mutants? Tony asks excitedly. It's metahumans and, yes. Peter answers as Fury walks up to the fridge and opens it up, looking for a drink to quench his thirst. You need to go shopping, Stark. Fury comments as he closed the fridge and leans on the nearby counter across from Peter and Tony. Why does everyone keep saying that? Tony says in annoyance. If you want food, then go to your own house. Alright, let's get down to business. Peter says as he takes out his phone and switches on the anti-surveillance. Sorry, Jarvis. What do you? Jarvis answers, but soon his voice distorts and cuts off. Did you really have to do that? Tony asks, feeling bad for Jarvis. Yes, you never know who could be listening in. Peter says as he motions around the room. After all, I doubt you moved all of your belongings out of here on your own. There had to have been movers who came into the mansion to move Tony's belongings, so it's not impossible for one of these people to plant some microphones or cameras. If you want, I can have a shield team sweep for bugs? Fury offers. No, I'll do it myself. Tony refuses instantly, not wanting any unknown secret agents in his house. You're more likely to plant something as well. Who says that I haven't already? Fury says, messing with Tony. Alright, let's get back to business. Peter says and goes into an explanation on metahumans and his plans to add them to the Avengers. They seemed perfectly happy with Peter's plans until he mentioned adding two unknown metahumans to the Avengers Council. I don't think this is a good idea. We don't know these men, and this magnet guy sounds, volatile. Tony comments disapprovingly. For once, we agree, Stark. Fury nods in agreement. 
I have files on both Charles Xavier and Eric Lencher. Charles is a definite possibility, but Magneto is a dangerous man. We've had some run-ins with him over the years. Was S.H.I.E.L.D. taking advantage of metahumans at the time? Peter says accusingly. Because his goal seems to be to protect his people. I don't see him attacking S.H.I.E.L.D. for no reason whatsoever. Not to my knowledge, no. Fury answers after thinking for a moment. Are you sure? Peter keeps pushing. You run a very big ship, Fury. It's very possible that you were lied to. Fury goes quiet as he stares at Peter in contemplation. This isn't the first time that Spider-Man has hinted at the fact that S.H.I.E.L.D. may be compromised. His mind raced as Fury began to question his own organization. Fury knows that Peter won't elaborate any further, so he would have to figure it out on his own. I'll look into it. Fury says as he presses a button on his phone and wordlessly walks to the backyard, where the Quinjet landed once again. Peter knew that his actions with Fury may bring up the timeline for the Hydra Rebellion, but that's not exactly a bad thing. The sooner Hydra is removed from S.H.I.E.L.D., the better. Also, Peter still wants to absorb S.H.I.E.L.D. into the Avengers, so this may speed up that process as well. After all, once Hydra and S.H.I.E.L.D. are revealed to be one and the same, S.H.I.E.L.D. will most likely be put out of business. That's the time when the Avengers will pounce and start poaching workers and buying up every S.H.I.E.L.D. property. They'll even have the help of Director Fury himself, as the man would be a member of the Avengers Council. At least, that's what Peter hopes to happen. As the Quinjet flies off, taking Fury away with it, Peter sighed and turned to Tony. It looks like we'll have to continue this another day. Peter says with a shrug. After saying their goodbyes, Peter returned home for the night, but instead of going to sleep, he went out on patrol. Peter has been busy these days with his Japan trip, so he needed to show his face or else the crime rates would rise. Flying off in the Quinjet, Fury couldn't get Spider-Man's constant warnings about S.H.I.E.L.D. out of his head. Situations that seemed fine before played out in his mind, and questions appeared. Questions that he didn't need to ask before, as he trusted S.H.I.E.L.D. Nick Fury wasn't a trusting man, yet before Spider-Man's warnings he could undeniably say he trusted S.H.I.E.L.D. Now, he feels that trust may have been misplaced. Commanding the pilot to fly to a S.H.I.E.L.D. facility that's used to store data, Fury sat back and enjoyed the ride. After a long flight, the Quinjet landed beside the bottom of a mountain in an undisclosed location, where a huge and thick bunker door could be seen attached to the mountain. This underground bunker is one of the most top-secret S.H.I.E.L.D. facilities they have, as it stores digital and physical copies of every field report ever filed. If he wants to look into the incidents involving Magneto, then this is the place to be. Hopefully, this doesn't take long. Fury thought as he entered the underground bunker with a very long code, card swipe, and retinal scan. After surprising some criminals, who thought that they could get away with some crime while he was in Japan, Peter returned home and hopped into bed. Peter wasn't worried about people finding out about his portal ability anymore. S.H.I.E.L.D. knows, which means HYDRA knows, so anyone affiliated with HYDRA probably knows as well. He won't reveal it on purpose, but if people find out on their own, then he doesn't really mind. Before getting to sleep, Peter took out his ghost phone and texted MJ goodnight. Peter, good night, I'll come by after tomorrow's meeting's red heart she didn't answer, as MJ was probably still asleep, so he tossed his phone aside and went straight to sleep. The UN meeting on the next day was the tamest of them all. Neither Charles nor Eric attended this one. Charles is waiting for their decision on his presentation, while Magneto has no interest in the meetings if Charles isn't there, and it's not about metahumans. Since the meetings became boring again, Peter went back on his ghost phone and found some articles about metahumans at the UN summit in Japan. It seems someone finally leaked it. Peter thought as he read through some of the articles. There were some blurry pictures and videos of Magneto, floating in the air, and the destroyed wall of the building, alongside some privileged information about the meetings, alongside Spider-Man's involvement in them. It especially showed Spider-Man in a good light, keeping the peace between the new superpowered groups that appeared. The reaction online about metahuman seems to be mixed. Some hate groups like racists and extreme religious communities were reacting badly, but the rest seemed to be alright. Most responses are curious, excited, scared, or other normal reaction, but the large majority is skeptical. After all, there isn't much clear proof behind all of this. The only proof is blurry and could easily be faked, so Peter decided to clear things up. At Spider underscore man, expect a video on metahumans to come out soon. Peter knew that seeing was believing, so he would contact Charles to film a YouTube video on the new race of people stepping into the world. They needed some good publicity as early as possible, or else people with bad intentions will start taking advantage. As Peter makes this tweet, the meeting came to an end. He and the president went to the normal meeting room, where they went through the same exact explanation as the last two meetings. 
This meeting included representatives for the United States of America, the United Kingdom, South Korea, China, France, and the United Arab Emirates. It was harder to conduct a meeting with so many people, as they all had questions and input to give so this meeting went on far longer than the other two. Though that doesn't mean that they weren't excited and agreeable to the Avengers plan. Peter was truly happy about the X-Men showing themselves at such a perfect time. He really owes them a lot, as the introduction of metahumans has sped things up. Fear is truly a good motivator. When the meeting finally came to an end, Peter officially had the agreement of six of the strongest countries in the United Nations. Tomorrow, they would present the Avengers plan in front of the entire UN, as Charles did with the metahuman announcement. It's going to be approved no matter what, as they already laid the groundwork with these meetings, so this is really just a formality. Though this action will definitely tip off the World Security Council, by that point it would be too late for them to interfere. That is if they haven't already found out somehow. Returning home after the meeting, Peter went straight to MJ's house, where he find her getting ready for school. The meeting ended at 7 p.m., but due to the time difference, Peter returned at 6 in the morning. The sun has risen and MJ was in the shower. Letting himself in, Peter started cooking breakfast for her. Her mother, Grace has already left for work and he knew MJ sucked at cooking and would end up eating cereal. Ring ring ring, when he finished cooking and was patiently waiting for MJ, the ghost phone started ringing. Looking at the phone, Peter was surprised to see who was calling him. Charles, why is he calling? Peter thought as he picked up the phone. Yo. What's this I hear about a video you're making on metahumans? Charles skips introductions and gets straight to it. Well, I was actually going to call you later about this, so this is perfect. As Peter says this, MJ opens the bathroom door and walks out with a towel around her body. Please hold for a moment. My beautiful girlfriend just walked in. MJ heard this and froze as she turned her head to see Peter on his phone in the kitchen. The smell of bacon, eggs, and French toast entered her nostrils soon after. Stop looking. MJ yells as she rushed to her room and slammed the door. What was that? Did someone slam a door? Charles asks as Peter forgot to mute the phone. Yeah, don't worry, she's fine. Peter says with a laugh. Peter and MJ may have gotten hot and heavy recently, but they haven't seen each other completely naked just yet, so MJ was self-conscious. Do you have an address I can meet you at? I can stop by after eating breakfast. Peter changes the subject. Are you back in New York already? Charles asks. For now. Peter answers cryptically. Soon enough, Peter gets an address in upstate New York. Just as the call ended, MJ walks out of her room, fully clothed and with an embarrassed look on her face. I made you breakfast. Peter says as he brings MJ a plate and pecks her on the lips. MJ sat down silently and ate awkwardly, still self-conscious about being seen in nothing but a towel. Don't be nervous. You're beautiful. Peter says as he starts cleaning up the kitchen. If you want, I can get naked for you so we're even? MJ looked at Peter's exposed muscles and looked away when he caught her looking and smirked. No, it's fine. Well, I'm ready to strip at a moment's notice. Peter smiles over his shoulder as he does the dishes. Just let me know. After speaking to MJ, who was back to her normal self compared to yesterday, Peter walked with her to school before opening a portal to the address Professor Xavier gave him. Stepping out of the portal, Peter is met by the familiar mansion that was shown in the X-Men movies in his past life. Walking up to the door as the portal closed behind him, Peter didn't even have a chance to knock as the door was thrown open and Wolverine came flying out with his claws extended, growling like a wild animal. Hello, again. Peter says casually as he sidesteps Logan and kicks him to the side. Stepping into the house, Peter ignores the feral animal that he just kicked away with a chuckle. He was starting to enjoy messing with Wolverine. Charles came rolling down the hall just in time to see Peter walking in with an angry Wolverine appearing behind him. Logan stop. Logan stop. Professor Xavier yelled as he saw Wolverine running at Spider-Man's exposed back, his fists wound back and claws pointed forward. Before Peter could act as his spider senses were going off, Charles took it upon himself and used telekinesis to toss Logan onto the nearby wall, pinning him there by his arms and legs. Gerrrrr? Ah! Logan growled and screamed as he tried to break out of the professor's hold. As Wolverine strained against Charles's hold, the professor grabbed his head in pain, unable to hold against Wolverine's strength for long. Sigh? Peter saw this and walked up to Logan. You keep making me do this. Peter shook his head as Wolverine growled at him like an angry animal. Pulling back his fist, Peter launched a well-placed punch at the side of Logan's head, causing his body to go limp against the wall. Ah, thank you. Charles breaths out in relief as the pain in his head disappears. No problem, want to show me to your office? 
Peter says as Wolverine slides down the wall and toppled onto the floor. Yes, we can talk privately there. Charles says as he wipes some sweat from his brow. As he says this, Nightcrawler comes walking down the stairs and sees the odd situation. What happened? Kurt says as Spider-Man appeared in his line of sight. Oh, I see. Shaking his head at his friend's actions, Nightcrawler strolls over and picks Logan up off the floor, carrying him like a prince would in a fairy tale. I'll put him in his room. Kurt says as he ascends the stairs. It was good seeing you again, Spider-Man. All right, follow along. Charles says as he leads Peter to his office. Along the way, Peter saw a few children, who were most likely metahumans that joined the school early. They all nervously peered at the superhero that came to visit, excited to see him but too scared to come forward. As they entered the professor's office, Charles pulled up behind his desk and motioned for Peter to sit. The children you saw are the first of our budding school. Charles says as Peter sat down. Most of them come from sad beginnings. Parents that didn't understand their child's change, orphans, liberated test subjects. They've all been through a lot and you're actually a big part of their life. They see you as a hero. Someone they aspire to be. Well, they do have superpowers, so a good amount of them probably will be like me in the future. Peter says with a shrug. True, though that doesn't mean they can't choose normal career paths. Charles clarifies. Of course, but they can make that choice when they're old enough. Peter says, agreeing completely. Now, what's this I hear about a Spider-Man YouTube video on metahumans? The professor asks curiously. The children won't stop talking about it. As soon as Peter tweeted about it, the halls of Xavier's mansion were filled with talks of Spider-Man and his coming video. The older students, who are in their teens, have a smartphone, so they knew instantly and spread the word. Of course, the word about Spider-Man travels fast, so everyone knew within minutes. Even Professor Xavier. I was going to contact you and ask for an interview with you and a few others. You would answer some questions and show off some powers. It wouldn't take too long. We can bang out the entire video in a day. Peter explains as he leans back in his seat. Why are you doing this? Charles asks. Maybe you don't understand how the internet and media in general works. With the news articles about metahuman surfacing, people with bad intentions will start taking advantage. Fear and outrage gets clicks and boosts ratings after all. The faster we get some good publicity out there, the better our chances are to protect metahumans. Peter explains. Our? Charles asks. Yes, the Avengers stick together. Peter smiles under his mask. I see. Charles mutters with a smile as well. Speaking of Avengers, have you come to a decision yet? No, but it's looking favorable for you. Just give us some time. Peter says, not mentioning anything about Magneto's involvement. He would keep that quiet until their first meeting as councilman, which Peter is sure will be an interesting encounter to deal with, to say the least. All right, do you want to do this interview today? Charles asks, totally on board with this. Sure, we can film it on my phone. Peter says as he pulls out his ghost phone. Do you have anyone here that would be interested in this? Three metahumans is probably the best, so we need two more people. Hmm, Storm is a bit camera shy and Logan can't be in the same room as you. Charles thinks out loud. Then Kurt and someone else. Kurt will make a good addition. His appearance will shock some but that will help show the physical differences metahumans can have as well. Anyone else or should we recruit one of the children? Peter asked. I don't know if we should involve the younger children. Professor Xavier comments with a thoughtful look. I saw some teenagers out there. We can ask them. Peter offers. After a moment of thought, Professor X agreed and they got to work. After getting Kurt's agreement, which was hard as the blue man is self-conscious about his looks, Charles called one of the older students to his office, who agreed instantly to be in the video. Who wouldn't agree to be in a Spider-Man YouTube video? He would be mad to say no. Surprisingly, this boy turned out to be a young 13-year-old Scott Summers, otherwise known as Cyclops. Before he came inside, Charles gave Peter a brief description of Scott and his powers. Scott Summers is a mutant with the ability to fire destructive optic beams. Meaning he shoots lasers from his eyeballs, which is a pretty inconvenient power for the boy. He has to wear special glasses made with ruby quartz lenses to keep the laser beams from destroying everything Scott looks at. Otherwise, the boy would have to keep his eyes closed constantly and live as a blind man. When Charles found Scott, he was an orphan living on the streets and either doesn't remember much of his life or refused to speak about it. As soon as he walked in the door, Scott dashed straight to Peter and started firing off questions. The boy was obviously a fan, which was flattering for Peter. Though he didn't really like Cyclops' character in the movies from his past life, Peter wouldn't hold that against the boy. He only wished the character wasn't such an annoying simp. 
Calming the boy down from his fanboy state, they started the interviews with him. After setting up his phone with a makeshift stand Peter put together with some web, he started the interview on the couch in the office. Once the easy questions were out of the way, like his name, age, grade, and powers, Peter got into the interesting stuff. How do you feel about having superpowers? He asks. Well, Scott goes silent for a few moments before answering. I think my power would be cool if I could control it. Professor X said that I could get it under control with enough time and effort though. Professor X? Peter asked as that's the first time he's heard that nickname out loud. Do you mean Professor Xavier? A lot of the kids call him that. It's hard for them to say his name. Everyone calls him that now. Scott explains as Charles smiles heartwarmingly from the other side of the room. I see, how was your life before you met Professor X? Peter asked. Charles didn't look pleased with Peter's question, as this was a big part of their therapy sessions. Though he never told Peter not to ask this, so he couldn't blame him. Scott tensed up immediately. He's been avoiding these types of questions for a while now, as it's easier to forget, yet this time was different. Scott's hero, Spider-Man, was asking the questions this time. I, I was in an orphanage for a while. Scott starts talking reluctantly. I don't remember my parents or any time before then. The orphanage was, not the nicest place. Was there not enough food or? Peter asked, not knowing the backstory for Cyclops. There were a lot of doctors there. Scott says, shocking everyone in the room as they knew what this meant. They would stick me with needles and connect these wires to me. I didn't like it there so I left. They let you leave? Peter asked. No, I escaped. Scott says with a shake of his head. They didn't let me leave my room, so I used my eyes to cut a hole in the walls at night. What happened after that? Peter asked. I lived in an alley for a while. Scott says as he turns to look toward Professor Xavier. That's where Professor X found me. The sad look on Charles's face disappeared as he heard this. He sent a warm smile toward the boy. Charles just wished that he found him sooner. Once the first interview was completed, Scott was sent off to play with the other children. They would need him to film his powers later, but they could find him at that time. As soon as he left the room, Charles looked at Peter disapprovingly. Did you have to ask such personal questions? The professor asks with a tired sigh. People need to know what has been happening to metahumans. Without an interview like that, they won't believe these things happen. At least not fully. Peter explains his train of thought. What I want to know is where was this orphanage and who ran the place? You're right? Charles mutters as he thinks carefully. I'll try speaking with him about it when you leave. Good, they've most likely moved since he escaped, but we may be able to follow some clues left behind. That is if he can remember where it was. Peter says as he motions toward the couch. Until then, let's finish this video. Peter spent the next few hours doing the interviews for Charles and Kurt. Kurt's interview was kind of sad, as Peter could tell right away that he didn't feel comfortable in his own skin. The man said as much himself in the interview, but it's good to show that to the viewers. They need to see that behind the more monstrous looking metahumans is just your average self-conscious, insecure human being. Just like everybody else. Professor Xavier's interview was all about the school and his mission to safely integrate metahumans into normal society. It was pretty much the same as his presentation to the United Nations. After the interviews were handled, they all went out to the huge backyard, including Scott. Peter recorded each of them using their powers and that was it. Kurt teleported a bit. Charles telekinetically lifted some fist-sized rocks as if he were juggling them. Scott was the most interesting and dangerous of the bunch. He took off his glasses for just a moment and shot a pillar of red energy into the sky. Superman's heat vision had nothing on Scott's eye power. It was truly impressive and powerful. Cyclops is 100% a glass cannon though. He has extreme firepower, yet his body is the same as any other normal human on this earth. As long as someone can dodge his attack, winning a fight against him would be fairly simple. Once the recording was over, Peter hung around the soon-to-be Xavier Institute or whatever he'll call the school. Instead of returning home, Peter edited the video on his laptop while spending some time with Charles and Kurt. While he was editing the video, Logan woke from his second consecutive knockout, which definitely ruined some of the man's confidence in taking on Spider-Man. Though that did mean he gave up. No, for the third time, Wolverine attacked Peter like a wild animal. While dodging Logan's attacks once again, Peter's phone rang and the name, Bald Cyclops appeared on the screen. Sorry, it seems I'll be leaving early. My friend is calling. Peter says as he dips away from some sharp metal claws. I'll see you guys another time. Expect the video to be up tomorrow. After easily knocking out Wolverine for the third time, Peter left the mansion and portaled home before answering the phone. What's up? Peter asked. Get to Starks. 
We need to talk. Fury says and hangs up the phone immediately. Can't even greet people properly. Peter mutters as he opens yet another portal and appears in Tony's mansion, where he found the man himself sitting on the couch with some tiny devices in front of him. Webhead. Tony notices Peter's arrival and motions toward the tech in front of him. You were right about the bugs. I swept the house and this is what I found. Looks about right? Peter says as he looks them over. Which ones do you think belong to S.H.I.E.L.D.? Half of them. A voice says as Fury walks into the room with a stack of folders. Well, don't leave any more junk in my house. I don't want to clean up again. Tony says as he throws all of the surveillance equipment into a nearby trash can. Don't worry, you're moving to New York so there's no point in bugging this place anymore. Fury shrugs as he slams down the pile of folders in front of Peter and Tony. What's this? Tony asks as he grabs the top folder and opens it up. This is every encounter S.H.I.E.L.D. has had with Magneto. Fury says as Peter grabs a file as well. After speed reading through every file, Peter and Tony found some odd recurrences in every single file. They all depict Eric and his team of mutants attacking S.H.I.E.L.D. bases to steal information, technology, and other things. Meanwhile, some of these items either don't exist or were never in these bases, to begin with. A good amount of them wouldn't even pique Magneto's interest in the first place. Why would Magneto, a man who commands a team of superpowered individuals, need mundane weapons or tech? Not to mention the fact that Mystique could infiltrate and steal any information or devices listed in these folders. Eric doesn't need to assault S.H.I.E.L.D. bases like this unless the real reason for these attacks was different from the reports. I was right. Peter says as he throws the last folder onto the coffee table. Yes, it seems that a high-level member of S.H.I.E.L.D. is interested in metahumans. Tony agrees with a nod. That interest has drawn Magneto's attention, which then leads to these raids on my facilities. Fury agrees as he takes a seat on the couch with a tired sigh. He's been inside a mountain bunker all this time, looking for each and every one of these files, which were most definitely filed incorrectly. Probably on purpose as well. So, which one of your bosses is the shadiest? Because it's definitely at least one of them. Peter asks. I don't know. Fury replies after a moment of thought. They're all annoying in their own ways. Alright, does this mean you agree to accept Charles and Eric as members of the council? Charles is a good egg and Eric can help your little internal investigation. He knows the truth about these incidents after all. Peter says as he points to the folders. He may even know which one of your bosses is behind this. The room goes silent as Fury thinks carefully. Tony didn't speak, as he had no real opinion of these two people. He doesn't trust them, but he does trust Peter, so he'll go with whatever his friend decides. At least until he meets Charles and Eric. Fine, call a meeting. Fury says after a moment of thought. I won't agree until I've sat down with both of them. I'll speak to them tomorrow after the UN meeting. After editing the metahuman video to completion at Tony's house, Peter returned home, patrolled the city for a few hours, and went right to sleep. When he woke up, Peter uploaded the video and quickly got ready before he portaled over to Japan, where he attended yet another United Nations meeting. Scaffolding was put up by the building, where Magneto ripped his own entrance a couple of days ago. As the meeting was halfway through, Peter stepped up to the podium, surprising those in the room who didn't see the schedule change. He was never supposed to speak like this, but with the help of six different countries, getting his name on the list was easy. Hello, I'm here to speak about the Avengers Initiative. While Peter was speaking, an army of hand ninjas stand on the rooftop. They've been trying to track Spider-Man for the past couple of days, yet he would always disappear shortly after leaving the UN building. Even the Beast couldn't find him. Once the meeting comes to an end, we attack and lure Spider-Man to Kaijusama's temple as planned. Alexandra Reed orders as the ninja scatter into hiding spots amongst the area. With the appearance of metahumans and other world-threatening situations, it's important that we have an organization that's not only willing to protect the world, but strong enough to take on any possible threats. Peter says, getting nods of agreement from everyone in the room. Would this be an American organization? Someone asks. No, we would have more of a worldly viewpoint. No country's interests will be put over the interests of another. The Avengers will simply protect the world when normal means fail or wouldn't be able to measure up in the first place. Peter explains. So, you would accept heroes from other countries? Another asks. Of course, they have no heroes as of yet, but with metahumans appearing, they will soon enough. Gladly. Peter nods in agreement. As many countries that wish to be involved are welcome to offer any resident heroes a place in the Avengers. We only care about protecting the world and its people, nothing more. They may have to go through some training though. We won't send inexperienced or untrained individuals into the field. 
Is this not a ploy to ship our heroes to America? One asks skeptically. No, they won't have to live in the United States. World-ending situations aren't exactly common. They may need training but they would return home afterward. We'll simply call upon them when they're needed. Peter explains, calming the room. After answering a ton of questions, the meeting came to an end. They would be discussing this for the rest of the week before voting on whether to back it. Though with Peter's groundwork beforehand, there's no chance that they disagree. It's only a matter of time. As everyone was exiting the large meeting hall, the lights suddenly cut out and Peter could hear the sounds of hundreds of light footsteps in, on, and around the building. Every single one of them was heading his way. Knowing that there's only one group in Japan that he has angered, Peter instantly guessed who this could be. You all should probably get somewhere safe. Peter says to the few in the room that haven't left yet. Thankfully the president left already, as he had some sort of emergency to deal with. Though Peter doubted that the hand would pick a fight with the US government. That would risk outing their millennia-old secret organization to the world. No, they were here for him. At least, Peter hoped so. Heeding Spider-Man's advice, everyone in the room froze for only a second before rushing out of the building. As they left, Peter could sense the intruders passing the civilians without attacking and continuing his way. Soon enough, the meeting hall was empty and the army of insurgents made its debut. As Peter guessed, Han Ninja poured into the room with sharp and pointy weapons in hand. What do you guys want now? Peter asked casually, not flustered as he has already defeated the Han once before. You've already lost against me once. What's the point? You can't win. None of them answered as they rushed forward like a tidal wave. Sigh? Peter sighed in annoyance as he walked toward the wave of ninjas. Let's see if any of you have improved since our last encounter. As the two sides clashed, Peter was surprised to see that they came up with an odd strategy this time around. The last time they fought, Peter was attacked in small manageable groups, as it's hard for a large group to coordinate without some friendly fire happening here and there. This time, the ninja didn't seem to care and acted like a mob of zombies, not caring for the lives of their own men and women. Within the first push, Peter could already see three ninjas get stabbed by their own comrades. As he saw this happening, Peter leaped onto the ceiling and started firing webs from above, dodging the wave of Berserker Ninja with ease. Since they want to act like a bunch of zombies, making it harder for Peter to handle them at close range, he'll just treat them like zombies and keep his distance. He may not be able to fight close up, but Peter has every advantage at range. Especially since he can walk on the walls and ceiling. This room ceiling is extremely high as well, so they have no chance of ever getting close to him. As Peter started webbing up the giant clusters of ninja, they began throwing knives and other projectiles at him, which were easily dodged or reflected away with a swipe of his hand. Technically, Peter's spider suit should be able to resist such normal weapons, but it wasn't hard to just dodge and redirect them. Thanks to the hand's new strategy of rushing in with packed crowds to overwhelm him, Peter found it extremely easy to web them up into big clusters. Within minutes, everyone that rushed inside was tied up in web and squished by the bodies of their own comrades. Peter smelled blood in the air and saw a few ninjas bleeding out because of their strategy. You guys are really dumb, huh? Peter commented as he falls from the ceiling and landed on his feet with the poise of a superhuman gymnast. I guess it's hard to come up with a plan against me, so I'll give you guys a pass for the stupidity. Using some web to stop the few people from bleeding out, Peter walks out of the room and doesn't encounter a single ninja along the way, which put him even more on guard, as he could still sense many ninjas outside. On his way through the building, Peter saw a few stragglers who didn't make it out in time or decided to hide instead. Thankfully, they were unhurt, or else Peter would have to go a bit harder on the hand than he already was. It seems that they don't want to mess with any government officials, which is smart of them. Peter thought as he opened the front doors of the building and stepped out. The second the door opened and Peter made his appearance, about a thousand projectiles came flying at him. It was like one of those moments in a movie where the archers fire and the arrows block out the sun. Huh? Peter grunted as he took a step backward and closed the door for a brief moment. Do 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 do, the sound of arrows constantly striking thick wood echoed from the other side of the door. Once the constant banging ceased, Peter opened the door and saw the building's entrance riddled with arrows, like the back of a porcupine. Wow, that was cool. I'll give you that. Peter says as he sees the many ninja on the surrounding rooftops knocking their bows once again with another arrow. Oh, no you don't. Not giving them another chance, Peter shoots a web at a nearby high-rise building and pulls, launching himself up to one of the many buildings with bow-wielding ninjas perched on top. Scatter! One ninja yells, which is repeated by each group on every building. Scatter! 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 As they start screaming this, all of the ninja starts to run in different directions. 
Though something caught Peter's attention almost immediately. As the ninjas began to disperse, running for their lives, a helicopter suddenly powered on nearby. Turning his head toward the sound, Peter saw someone he recognized sitting in the co-pilot seat of a helicopter, which was parked on top of the UN building. Isn't that the woman from Daredevil? What was her name again? Peter thought as he saw Alexandra Reed, who looked back at him with a stone-like glare. As Peter was thinking this, the helicopter hovered into the air and flew off in the opposite direction, trying to get as far away from Spider-Man as possible. Where are you going? Peter thought as he ignored the fleeing ninja and started following the helicopter. He thought that this could be another trap that they were luring him into, but at the end of the day the hand is pretty weak compared to him, so he just followed along. He could have tried to take down the helicopter or something like that, but they were still in the middle of a very crowded city. Peter didn't want to accidentally send the thing into a building or a crowd of civilians. As Peter left after the helicopter, the ninjas that were running from him stopped in their tracks and returned to the UN building. Entering the building, the ninjas freed their comrades and escaped, with a few of them carrying the wounded on their backs. Their plan was working as expected. The breaching team lost and Spider-Man followed the helicopter instead of the fleeing ninja. Since the hand practically owns Japan, no police or other authorities arrived on the scene until after everyone had left. The only remaining people were those that hid in the building, waiting for the chaos to stop. In a temple on the outskirts of the city, a giant, fat, grayish-black demon with red eyes sat on a stone throne. Its giant hands held a large chalice filled with a thick, blood-colored liquid. Insert picture of the beast here, red-clad ninjas stand guard at the demon's side, as frightened men, women, and children serve at the monstrous being's every whim. Just moments ago, while pouring the demon's drink, one of the servants spilled a single drop and had her stomach cut open by the demon's sharp fingernail. The poor woman screamed in agony as her insides fell out, along with enough blood to kill her within a few seconds. The blood from that incident remains on the stone floor as scared servants were hard at work scrubbing and soaking up the mess. The demon sat on its throne, watching with an amused grin on its face. You missed a spot. The demon's dark and deep voice rumbles happily as it splashes its drink on the floor. Hey hey hey. As the liquid splashed onto the floor and the nearby servants, an iron smell of blood thickened in the air. None of the servants dared to speak out, as they started working harder to clean the floor, ignoring the cackling demon before them. Suddenly, the sound of helicopter blades could be heard drawing closer to the temple. The demon immediately stopped laughing and looked toward the door expectantly. Did the spider follow? After following the helicopter to the outskirts of the city, Peter was planning to finally take it down, as it was safe to do so now. Just as he was about to act, the helicopter began to descend toward a very old but well-kept stone temple. This is ominous looking. Peter muttered as he saw the dark torchlit temple. It didn't help that the sun had completely set by now, adding a much more spooky feel to the place. As the helicopter landed, the passengers hopped out and rushed up the long stone steps, disappearing into the ornate entrance. The helicopter blades didn't have a chance to slow to a stop by the time Peter landed and saw the cowardly backsides of those entering the temple. Hmm. Peter thought as he stopped in his tracks and observed the area. This is definitely a trap. Shaking his head at how obvious these millennial-old ninjas were being, Peter ascended the stone stairway, following the trail of his escaped prey. While walking up and into the dark and spooky temple, Peter racked his brain for anything that he could remember from the Daredevil TV series. Sadly, all he could remember from the hand was their use of dragon bone elixir and that they were ninjas. He didn't have any other recollection that could explain the odd almost supernatural feeling he was receiving from this temple. Walking inside, Peter found nobody as he went from room to room, each one was in pristine condition and lit by torches, which were hanging on almost every wall. After searching all of the upper floors of the temple, Peter found no one and decided to descend downward. Though he hated the thought of it. The only staircase leading down looked like it was straight out of some horror film. It was dark and disheveled, nothing like the pristine quality of the rest of the temple. God, I hate scary movies. Peter muttered as he descended with only slight reluctance. Put him up against villains such as Thanos or Dormammu, but the second things start looking like the ring, then Peter may have some confidence issues. Thankfully, Peter has superhuman senses, so he knew that no one was hiding in the shadows below. Unless, of course, there was a ghost, but through his study in Kamar Taj, Peter learned that he would still be able to see and hear a ghost. After watching some scary movies with MJ, Peter was curious whether ghosts actually existed, so he spoke to a master about them and learned a bit of useful information. Though that can be saved for another time. Why must they leave me here? Peter thought as he made it to the bottom of the stairs and walked down a long stone hallway. Why not a well-lit warehouse or something? Anything but this. 
Thankfully, the hall was only dark for a short time as halfway through Peter could see a light at the end of the tunnel, quite literally. Following the tunnel-like hallway, Peter made it to the end without a single trap or attack, which only made him more vigilant about whatever they were planning. It had to be coming soon after all. Stepping out of the hall, Peter's eyes adjusted to the light and he saw something that he didn't expect. Under the temple was a huge stone throne room, which was being held up by large chiseled pillars. Hand ninjas were posted around the room alongside normal-looking servants. Peter could even see Alexandra Reed, who had just run from him, standing beside the large throne alongside the other fingers of the hand. All of them were here, besides Murakami, who was still trapped in the mirror dimension. Peter stealthily checks on him and Nobu every morning, seeing if he thinks they're ready to speak yet, but sadly neither of them were weak-willed men. It would take some more time to break them into talking. Though maybe he wouldn't need them anymore after this. Sitting on the throne at the back of the room was what truly shocked Peter upon his arrival. What's a demon doing here? Peter wondered out loud. Peter has read a few books on demons and has even had a bit of instruction from the Ancient One on how to handle such beings that make it into their world. Either by their own power or through the help of someone on the planet, usually through some sort of ritual, low-level dimensional beings like this can slip by unnoticed. It's not that they're so strong that they can get in, but that they're so weak that the alarms set in place by the masters of Kamar Taj don't register their breach into the world. Although Peter is most definitely a novice when it comes to fighting demons, he's up for the challenge and happy that it wasn't a ghost. The only question now was how and when did a demon team up with the hand? Was this a recent thing, or are they merely acting together to get rid of him? Oh, the spider has arrived. The fat dark demon heard him and spoke from its throne. The grin that spread along the demon's face as it eyed Peter up and down was about as creepy as he expected. It's Spider-Man, actually. Peter corrects as he takes out his phone and sends a quick text to the Ancient One with his location and predicament, just in case anything goes wrong. He has never fought a demon before, after all. Hee <laughs> hee, such an odd name you've chosen for yourself. The overweight demon laughs gleefully as it drinks from a big chalice. Eh, I like it. What's your name, demon guy? Peter says, buying time as he prepares an important spell. The Japanese call me Kaijusama, but you may call me the Beast. The Beast introduces itself, still looking at Peter's body with an unhealthy amount of interest. So, what's this whole plan about? I mean, you lured me here, right? Now what? Peter asks, as he knows that big villains like to reveal their master plan at the last moment. Peter always thought it was dumb to do, but they always seem to get a kick out of it. Even some of the criminals he stops would now and then go on tangents about their plan, only to get captured soon after. Kaijusama is interested in using your body as a vessel. Alexandra Reed reveals as she and the other fingers of the hand watch between Peter and the demon with interest. We would also like to know where Murakami is? Madam Gao spoke next. We've searched the entire county by this point and still haven't found a single sign of him. Oh, forget about that waste for now. The beast speaks forcefully. Once I have his body, I'll know whatever the spider knows. We can find him then. Yeah, no, thanks. Peter says as he brings his hand forward, summoning dozens of golden sparks in front of him. I like my body very much, so I think that I'll keep it. Spinning his arms, the sparks draw themselves into individual, intricate spell circles. As everyone in the room watches in surprise, only one of them knows what's happening, and it frightens them beyond belief. The great beast that has been pulling the strings behind the hand for millennia began shaking in its throne. A sorcerer? The demon spoke with a voice laced with fear and anxiety. After thousands of years spent on earth, the beast knew one thing for certain. Never mess with the sorcerers of earth, as they are far stronger than anyone would expect. Throughout its entire time spent on earth, it was able to avoid these sorcerers by hiding behind the hand, yet it seems that has backfired now. The beast's shield has brought danger to its front door. Once the spell circles were formed, each of them spread out to every corner of the room, branding its markings on every inch of the throne room. That should keep you from escaping. Peter muttered as the beast's body turned into a shadow-like figure, which dashed for one of the side exits. I wouldn't do that if I were you, asterisk bang. Tzzzzzzz, asterisk as the shadow approached the doorway, a golden force field appeared and blocked the way. The beast slammed into the almost invisible wall, but that wasn't all that happened. Lighting courses through the force field soon after, electrocuting the poor helpless demon. I told you not to do that. Peter commented as he watched the whole thing with an amused look. The Ancient One taught him that demons are crafty and good escape artists, so she invented this very spell in order to keep them from constantly running away from her. Back at the side of the throne, the founders of the hand were shocked. Never before have they seen anyone capable of something like this. Let alone being able to somehow get one over on the beast. 
Maybe we should have stayed away from Spider-Man? Each of them had a similar thought as they watched the beast being electrified. After a moment of being electrocuted, the beast backed away, keeping a good distance from the walls and doors. Although he was just electrocuted with enough power to kill a herd of elephants, the beast wasn't hurt at all. In fact, all this did was trap and anger the chubby demon. You won't be able to leave. Peter says as he sees the beast eyeing the enchanted walls. This spell was crafted by someone far stronger than me. Although Peter was fairly confident after trapping this demon, he has never fought something like this before, so this was fairly nerve-wracking for him. Especially since he would have to fight this demon with the mystic arts. His other powers would come in handy, but when fighting dimensional beings, the mystic arts will always have an advantage. This would be his first real fight while using the mystic arts, not counting the portals that he uses for convenience. Hmm, I've never personally dealt with a sorcerer before, but I bet that this will disappear once you're dead. The beast says as it turns its giant form toward Peter, who was psyching himself up mentally. You got this. It's just a low-level demon. The ancient one eats guys like this for breakfast. Peter thought as he heard what the beast said. Maybe, maybe not. As he says this, Peter throws his hands up and summons the Tau Mandalas, which appear on his fists with a burst of golden light. I guess you'll have to find out? Peter says as he waits for the demon to make the first move. Without a word, the demon morphs into a shadowy figure, which launches toward Peter at lightning speed. Peter blocked with the Tau Mandalas, wanting to test their defensive power early on. As the beast's shadowy form struck the Eldritch Shields, a grunt of surprise emanated from the shadow, not expecting to be stopped as its shadow form can usually move through anything. When the beast struck the shields with enough force to send Peter sliding backward into the wall, Peter's body touched the golden force field, which sent an electric current into his body. Tzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzz
The demon dashes forward, hoping to rip Peter's throat out before the birds can get to him. As his hand wrapped around Peter's throat, the flock of birds smashed into the beast's chest, each one exploding upon contact. Boom boom boom, explosions echo in the underground chamber as the towering demon is sent flying backward. His hand nearly wrapped fully around Peter's neck, but the birds intervened and don't let up. As the demon gets launched back, the birds continue forward, following the beast's every movement. The explosions continue as the beast is blown up and around the room over and over. The only reason the underground throne room hasn't collapsed yet is thanks to Peter's trap spell taking all of the damage in its place. As the beast is flying around the room, propelled by the constant exploding birds, the hand and other servants in the room took cover behind the large stone throne and towering pillars. None of them have ever seen such a crazy fight in their entire lives. Even in Kuanluan, where each founder of the hand originated, they only practice qi manipulation, which is nothing compared to the magic they're seeing today. Although the servants were scared, with every added explosion, they started becoming hopeful. Each of them was taken from their homes and families to serve that grotesque monster, like nothing but slaves, so they were wholeheartedly routing for Spider-Man. Soon enough, the birds ended up pinning the beast to a corner of the room, where another 30-ish explosions rang out before there wasn't a single bird left and the spell circles faded. Left in the corner of the room was nothing but a puddle of blood along with some chunks of meat. This was all that was left of the great beast that used the hand as entertainment and servants for thousands of years. Hmm, that spell was stronger than I thought. Peter mutters as the smoke cleared and he sees his handiwork. I'll have to thank Master Hammer for showing it to me. As Peter says this, the blood and chunks of the demon begin to ripple and writhe around. Nobody notices this but Peter though. The servants begin to cry and cheer for their freedom, while the hands stare in shock and awe. They were frightened as to what Spider-Man had in store for them. Thinking and acting quickly, Alexandra Reed moves forward and bows before Peter. Black Sky. She mutters, causing the ninja in the room to move forward and bow as well. We, the hand, submit ourselves to you fully. She planned to survive by simply switching one master for another. At least this new master was most likely human, stronger than the last, and wouldn't eat or torture them as the beast did. Black Sky? Peter muttered in confusion as the other three founders of the hand moved forward and bowed as well. They didn't feel like dying today, either. Peter didn't watch a lot of the Daredevil show or know a lot about the comics, so he had no clue what Black Sky meant. Though he knew what this old, sly woman was doing. You traitorous scum. A deep demonic voice fills the throne room as the meat and blood combined and began to grow into a resident evil monster that only slightly resembled the beast from moments earlier. You would bend the knee to another so easily? As the even more monstrous version of the beast appeared, Peter looked toward the kneeling ninja and frightened servants, who have frozen in shock mid-celebration. You may want to get in cover once again. Peter says, as the ninja instantly rush away, back to hide behind the throne. The servants acted a bit slower but still made it behind the pillars, peeking out every now and then to see the monster's new form. You got a lot uglier? Peter commented as he looked at the deformed beast in the corner of the room. The demon grew to twice the size and transformed from the fat, glutinous-looking beast to a giant, veiny bodybuilder that could give the Hulk a run for his money. Not only did he become muscular, but the proportions were completely off as well. One arm was big, but the other was huge. The rest of its body was all out of whack as well, with some muscles being bigger than others, and the beastly facial features that were once symmetrical are now lopsided. He truly resembled a person that was infected by the T-Virus or some other mutant monster from films. The beast growler as it breathed, looking over its new arms and legs. Hmm, I like the new look. Well, at least you're healthy now, maybe? Peter says skeptically as he ponders which body type was worse. Ha ha ha. The beast completely ignores Peter as it admired its new body with a gleeful laugh. This body is amazing. The beast could feel the power coursing through its veins, far exceeding anything the demon has ever felt before. Thank you so much, spider. It says happily as its new muscles flex every so often as if this was some sort of bodybuilding show. Eh, I didn't really do anything but you're welcome, I guess? Peter says as his golden war hammer appears once again. Why don't I help you test it out as well? As Peter says this, he dashed forward and leaped into the air, slamming the hammer down onto the beast's open chest. The beast was so preoccupied with admiring its new physique that there was no time for any sort of defense. When the eldritch hammer impacted the demon's chest, the muscles indented slightly and absorbed the blow with ease. Huh? The beast grunted in surprise as the attack, which would have sent him flying earlier, did absolutely nothing this time around. I love this new body. As the beast says this, a wicked grin forms on its face as a large arm juts forward and grasps Peter by the torso. 
As thanks for this new body, I'll make your death a quick one. The beast says as it tosses Peter across the room and into the wall, where he was electrocuted for the second time today. Tzzzzzzzz knowing this would happen, Peter spun midair and kicked off the wall immediately upon impact, only getting electrocuted for a brief moment. This is more like it. Peter says excitedly as his war hammer disappears and two golden brass knuckles form on each of his hands. Without thinking, Peter rushes forward and starts to brawl with the giant beast. Peter would land hit after hit while dancing around the demon, using his agility to duck and dive past every oncoming attack. As the brawl continued, Peter was starting to get a bit hot-headed but he didn't know why. He felt as though this was the time to finally go all out against an opponent, as he has never done so before. The problem was that Peter wasn't usually like this. Something was stimulating his adrenaline, testosterone, or something because Peter started feeling like a berserker out of nowhere. Taking some deep breaths, Peter tried calming himself, but it was a hard task to achieve for some reason. Is he doing this to me? Peter thought as he danced around the beast, landing hit after hit, all of them doing nothing to the demon. In fact, with every added hit Peter felt more and more pumped up and angry. Using his enhanced senses, Peter could smell an odd fragrance in the air. It didn't smell good or bad, but it wasn't noticeable unless you had super senses like him. Is it coming from him? Peter guesses as he ducks behind the beast and sees something odd on its back. At the back of the demon were a bunch of little volcano-shaped holes. Nothing was coming out of them, but the smell was a lot stronger there. Testing a hypothesis, Peter sent a quick punch to the beast's body and sees the volcano-shaped holes contract and spew out some air before going still once again. You! I've been breathing that in. Peter thought in revulsion as he dashed away from the beast. Disgusting? It seemed to be a new power that the beast got from its transformation. Every time he takes damage, whatever it is gets pumped out, enraging the beast's opponent slowly. An enraged enemy is careless and foolhardy, after all. Thankfully, Peter was enhanced, so the fumes weren't as effective on him. Though if he breathes in much more then it will be hard to calm down. I need to find a counter to the smell or end this fight before my mind goes crazy. Peter thought as he started keeping his distance from his opponent, not letting the beast get close to him. As Peter was thinking of ways to counter the rage-inducing fumes, the servants and ninja hiding on the sidelines began to feel the effects themselves. The servants were the first to go berserk, as they had less discipline than the heavily trained ninja. Instantly, the once scared men and women started fighting each other out of nowhere. Fear turned to rage as they turned on one another like rabid animals. The ninja noticed this and kept their distance. <laughs> Madame Gao was the first to notice the odd effect on herself and others. As she was putting the pieces together in her head, the ninja stationed around them began to get enraged and lashed out at the four founders of the hand. As thousands of years old masters, they weren't easily influenced and kept their sanity. Each finger of the hand wasn't looking at their soldiers, yet dodged the attacks to their back with ease. What is this? One of them asks in confusion as they all started becoming aware of the raging feeling boiling inside them. Madame Gao finally puts it together and rips a piece of her clothing, turning it into a makeshift mask for her mouth and nose. Seeing their fellow finger do such a thing, the others figured it out as well, making some makeshift masks for themselves too. As the servants were killing one another, the founders of the hand began slaughtering their own compromised men and women. Peter could sense this happening, but was busy with an angry beast chasing him down. Stay still you bug. The demon exclaims in annoyance as Peter has been keeping his distance. Spiders are, you know what. Forget it. Peter says in exasperation, tired of everyone calling him a bug or insect. After some time of thought, Peter knew that he didn't have any spells to counter the fumes, so he would try a spell that he hasn't tested before to end this quickly. I need a. Peter mutters as he looks around the room for some sort of container, finding an expensive looking vase on the steps leading to the throne. Okay, I'm going to need you to stand still for a bit. Leaving the vase where it was, for now, Peter lures the beast to the center of the room. Once it was there, Peter started dancing around its huge form, attaching webs all over its body. As the webs took hold, Peter would loop them around the nearby pillars in the room, restricting the beast's movements. Some webs would be ripped apart, but by the time that happens, three more would take their place, as Peter worked in overdrive. After minutes of doing this, the beast was trapped in the center of the room with its arms and legs spread wide open, completely tied down to the pillars in the room. Gerrrrrr? Ack! The beast tugged at the webs, causing them to stretch as cracks began to form on the pillars. Acting quickly before the pillars get destroyed, Peter grabs the vase with a web shot and places it in front of the beast. Let's hope this works. Peter mutters as he recalls a spell that he read about from his time in the library of Kamar Taj. Nox SND Opicatissimum Apello Hemum Coldusser. 
Offerin Sangue, Nim Unisai May ET Corporus in Imisai May, Pasco Pro or Sinar Hank Best I Am in Vaskvis. As Peter begins to speak, a single yet complicated spell circle forms on the ground under the vase. When the circle was fully formed, Peter took off a single glove and summoned a golden knife, cutting his palm and smearing and dripping it onto the circle. As the blood touches the spell, the room turns a pitch darker and gets many degrees colder than before. Peter could even see his breath in the air. Ah ash! The beast yelled as its muscles flexed and pulled the many pillars apart, freeing itself. I changed my mind. Your death will be long and painful. As the beast was about to lash out at Peter, the spell circle levitated off the floor and stuck itself to the vase. Instantly, dark tendrils shoot out of the vase and wrap around the beast's large form. As the tendrils circle around the beast, an icy chill fills the room as the demon's restricted body begins to freeze over. Arg! The beast exclaimed in pain as the ice covers its entire body. Soon, the tendrils completely engulf the demon and begin to slowly shrink, retreating back into the vase with ease. As the beast disappears into the pot, a pitch black lid appears on top, sealing it away completely. Taking a calming breath, Peter turned around, expecting to see the dead bodies of the innocent servants. What he didn't expect to see were the servants sleeping peacefully without any injury and a familiar bald woman standing nearby. Good work, Peter. Good work, Peter. The Ancient One commands her student's work. I give you a passing grade. You could have simply sealed the demon sooner, which wouldn't have risked these people's lives, but this is your first encounter with a dimensional being so I won't hold that against you. The Ancient One jumps right into teacher mode and begins listing all of the mistakes Peter made in this encounter. From getting electrocuted by his own spell twice, to not noticing the fumes in the room earlier on. Speaking of that nasty gas, the Ancient One mutters in disgust as she waves her hand. Instantly, the spell trapping everyone in the room shatters and a powerful gust of wind blows into the throne room, clearing out the rage-inducing fumes. That should do. She says as Peter turns to the group of ninjas on the side, who are asleep as well. You should calm down soon enough. The Ancient One didn't bother saving the Hand Ninja as she had no sympathy for them, so a good few of them are either bleeding out or already dead. The servants were innocent, but the Hand certainly was not. Of course, the four fingers of the Hand are alive and untouched, as none of their subordinates were able to land a single hit on them. How long have you been here? Peter asks as he conjures a spell circle, which heals the wounded ninja. He didn't watch much of the Daredevil show, but he watched enough to know about the ninja that the Hand recruits from dojos all around the world. Indoctrination and brainwashing was the name of the game. Pretty much whatever the Hand could do to build their army. Peter felt bad for them after seeing their situation in his past life, so he couldn't just leave them there to die. Since you sent the text. The Ancient One replies, not commenting on her students' actions. I must say that I'm impressed. Obviously, there were some failures, but for someone so new to the mystic arts, your performance was far better than anyone I've seen in a long time. Thanks. Peter says as he scratches the back of his head abashedly. Peter doesn't know what to do when he gets complimented like this. He always feels odd and out of place, but he enjoys it nonetheless. Where have you been? Peter asks as she hasn't answered any of his texts or calls. Let's talk about that later. I heard that you were looking for me. Something about mind arts? The Ancient One asks. Yes, I ran into a telepath. He's friendly, but I'd like to build up some defenses. I've already placed an enchantment. Peter explains about the enchantment on the back of his head and the metahumans he met. Turn around. She instructs and Peter turns as she touches the back of his head, causing the enchantment to glow. You did well with this. It should be more than enough to keep that telepath out. Though a master of the mystic arts could get through with a moderate amount of effort. Can you teach me how to block them? Peter asks as he turns back around. I'll add it to the list. The Ancient One nods. Thanks. Peter says gratefully as an idea appears in his mind. Hey, do you want to join the Avengers? After asking that question, the Ancient One didn't give Peter a concrete answer, most likely unsure of whether she should involve herself, as she probably has the short rest of her life planned out to the last second. Peter didn't want her to die as she did in the movies, so he would do his best to get her to change her fate. Starting with having her taking a more active role than she did in the movies. He's here to change things, so hopefully, he can save those that shouldn't have died. Before leaving the underground chamber, the Ancient One took the sealed demon and the sleeping servants away with her. She would stash the demon pot somewhere safe and return the civilians to their homes. As for the ninja, Peter didn't know what to do with them, so he sent the fingers of the hand to join Murakami and Nobu in the mirror dimension. The other surviving ninjas were a whole other story. Peter was confused as to what he should do with them. Not just these few ninjas either, as the whole of the hand was still a thing. 
Peter didn't want to just allow a new person or persons to take control of such a powerful organization, as they could be worse than the founders. The image of them kneeling towards him and calling him that odd name appeared in his mind at that moment. Black Sky? Peter pondered as he woke one of the ninjas with a spell that dumped water on their head. Ha! Huh? The ninja shoots up and looks around in confusion, unwrapping his head covering, revealing a man of Japanese descent. Insert picture of MCU scythe here, stand up! Peter orders bossily. They bowed to him before, so Peter thought the best way to get answers was to act like he was in control. It worked. The second this man turned to see who was talking, he jumped to his feet and straightened his back, waiting for Peter's orders. What's your name? Peter asks. Scythe, Black Sky. Scythe answers respectfully. What is Black Sky? Peter asks. The Black Sky is said to be the one to lead the hand. He or she will be the one to accomplish our ultimate goal, immortality. You're the Black Sky as the founder said. Scythe answers once again, looking around for the four fingers. Sir, where are? They angered me so they're currently being punished. Peter interrupts, knowing what he was asking. Who are the highest ranking members of the hand, we need to call a meeting. Um, a lot of them are currently in Japan. The founders brought many of their subordinates to deal with. Scythe stops himself before he could anger Peter. To deal with me. Okay, wake up everyone that's still alive. We're leaving. Peter says as his suit turns black and he walks out of the underground chamber. Don't keep me waiting long. I'll be at the helicopter. Peter didn't know what he was doing and was truly winging it right now. He knew that he didn't want to leave the hand to itself as that would be irresponsible, but he also didn't want to run an ancient ninja organization. He's already busy with the Avengers and everything else. Maybe? Peter thought as an idea began forming. While waiting for the ninja to come out, Peter pulled out his ghost phone and called Magneto. He planned to call him after the UN meeting, before all of this craziness started. Ring ring ring, hello? Eric answers with annoyance clear in his voice. Yo, it's your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man, Peter says over the phone. Who are you talking to? Hang up, we're not done here. A gruff and angry voice is heard on the other side of the call. Suddenly, the call becomes muffled, but Peter could still slightly hear what was said. Victor, if you don't leave right now, I'm going to impale you on the side of a cliff and leave you there for weeks. Magneto threatens, as some yelling and banging can be heard before he returns to the call. I apologize for that. What can I do for you? We need to schedule a meeting. Once the ninjas were woken up, they rushed out of the building to find an all-black Spider-Man waiting by the helicopter that they lured him to the temple with. Let's go, take me to the hand headquarters, main base, or whatever. Peter says as he gets into the back seat. Without a second thought, the ninjas jump to Peter's words, following his ever whim without a second thought. The moment four fingers of the hand bowed to him and pretty much named him the Messiah, whatever brainwashing or indoctrination kicked in, making Peter their de facto leader. As the helicopter flew back to the city, the hand ninja in the helicopter didn't know what to say or do. Most of them removed their face coverings and were nervously peeking at Peter, who was on his phone texting Tony. Peter, tell Fury we have a meeting with Magneto tomorrow at 5 p.m. I'll bring him to your house in LA, Tony, why do we have to invite the superpowered maniac to my house? Let's bring him to yours instead. Peter, he isn't a maniac and my house has my family in it. You live alone and you're moving anyway. Stop being a baby. Tony, fine, just keep him away from my suit. Peter, I see, you're scared since he can beat you easily, huh? Tony. Peter, maybe make a suit that isn't metal? Tony, good idea. Want to swing by and assist? Peter, nope, I'm busy. See you tomorrow. As Peter finishes the conversation, he puts his phone away and sees that the helicopter was landing at the top of a tall skyscraper. Lead the way. Peter says as a ninja opens the doors for him and he steps out onto the rooftop. We need to call a meeting. As the helicopter that was supposed to return with the four fingers of the hand landed, many ninjas ascended the roof to welcome them back. Though they were surprised to find their comrades holding the helicopter doors open as a man in an all-black combat suit stepped out. They didn't know what to do so they drew their weapons, readying them with confused looks underneath their masks. Weapons down. Scythe commanded with his face showing. Seeing who was speaking, the low-level hand ninja instantly sheathed their weapons. Scythe, what's this all about? A beautiful Korean woman steps out of the crowd of ninja. Where's Bakudo and the rest? Insert picture of Alessa Giomi, also known as Bride of Nine Spiders, Dr. Alessa Giomi is an entomologist, who studies spiders in New York City. She's a very high-ranking member of the Hand and works under Bakudo, which is why she asked about him by name. The founders angered the Black Sky, so they're currently being punished. Scythe says as he glances over at Peter. Be Black Sky? 
She mutters in shock as the rest of the ninja freeze in surprise. Yes, now out of the way. Peter orders as he waves his hand to the side. I have a busy schedule and little time to spend here today. Peter didn't have anything else to do tonight. He just wanted to get this over with so he can sleep. It has been a long day after all. This bossy persona is hard to keep up. Peter thought, as the ninja parted like the Red Sea, making room for him to pass. Only one stood in his way, and that was Alessa. She didn't believe it and wasn't sure how to handle the situation. Alessa, move. Scythe tries to reason with her. You don't want to anger the black sky. Trust me. Peter watched with interest as Alessa stepped aside with great reluctantly. Her hands were gripped tightly as she watched the black sky enter the building with a herd of ninjas following behind. Thanks. Peter says to a ninja that respectfully opened the door for him. Scythe, take me to a meeting room and go collect the highest level members here. After escorting Peter to a meeting room with a giant table and many chairs, Scythe ran off to complete the Black Sky's orders. The herd of ninja that was following made themselves useful, guarding the entire floor and waiting on Peter's every whim. Though he didn't ask for anything, that didn't stop them from asking and making sure he was comfortable. The building he's currently in is the top of a huge skyscraper, though the place seems to have been turned into a hand compound. On his way to the meeting room, Peter saw dorms, training areas, and a large cafeteria. This seemed to be the place in Tokyo where they housed the majority of hand members. This isn't so bad. Peter thought as he saw the loyal ninja patrolling the halls. There's only one obstacle to overcome. Peter wasn't so dumb as to not notice the few that have questioned whether he was truly the black sky or not. Either not believing in the black sky or unwilling to believe without some sort of proof. He knew that this whole black sky thing was a plan formulated by Alexandra Reed. She only called him that and submit to him to save her own skin. Whether the whole black sky prophecy was real or not, Peter doubted it but that didn't mean he can't take advantage of it. His saving grace is the fact that the ninja he arrived with witnessed his fight with the beast and the fingers announcing him as the black sky while kneeling. Hopefully, they were spreading the word. After waiting for a short few minutes, four people arrived at the meeting room led by Scythe. An angry-looking dark-skinned African man with scars all over his body. A white woman that looked more like a secretary than a killer ninja. A handsome Chinese man that was completely wasted with a gourd of liquor in hand, and finally the same woman that stood in his way on the rooftop. Where is my lord? The scarred African man rushes across the room, ready to torture the man in black that was waiting for their arrival. Do you mean Sowand? That's his name, yes? Peter asks toward Scythe. Yes, Black Sky. He answers with the utmost respect, not worried at all. After all, he just witnessed Peter fight and beat a demon. He's currently being punished for angering me. Peter says as he looks up at the towering figure standing before him. Do you have a problem with that? A staring contest ensued before the man juts his palm outward toward Peter's windpipe. Sigh? Peter casually catches his hand and snaps it backward, breaking his wrist and eliciting a painful grunt from the man, who fell to one knee, clutching his hand in agony. Now, that wasn't very nice. As the man tries to stand, Peter places his hand on his shoulder, holding him to the ground with ease. You know, I have a very sensitive sense of smell. Peter remarks as everyone else watches their comrade struggle. Every person in this room smells of blood, but it's the thickest on you. Why is that? Arg. He answers with a loud yell, still trying to stand but failing spectacularly. Seeing as he wasn't going to answer, Scythe stepped forward for him. He was just interrogating a member of the chase downstairs, sir. Lord Sowen and his men have always been the ones to deal with them. Hearing this, Peter remembered that the chaste was the hand's enemy and that Stick was a member. Stick, being the man that trained Daredevil. Other than that, Peter didn't know much about them. Bring them here. Peter orders. Scythe acts quickly and leaves the room, as Peter looks back down toward his still struggling attacker. If I let you go, are you going to calm down and act respectfully? Peter asks as puts more pressure on the kneeling man. Ah. He yells in pain and crumpled to the floor, unable to handle the weight of Peter's hand any longer. Igrigadis, Sir. Good, everyone take a seat. Peter says as he gestured to the many chairs around the table. After seeing that show, none of them dared talk back and sat down as ordered. Even so Andy's subordinate picked himself up quickly and sat down. Introduce yourselves. Peter orders. Swiftly, they all went around the table and respectfully said their names and greeted Peter as the Black Sky. Though they were very reluctant about it. The drunk Chinese man is Zhou Chang a direct subordinate of Madame Gao and defender of the hand. He isn't just some random alcoholic either. Zhou Cheng is a powerful martial artist that somehow fights better when he's intoxicated. Something about taming his inner dragon. 
Insert picture of MCU Zhou Cheng here, the Caucasian secretary-looking woman is Tessa Robbins. She is Alexandra Reed's direct subordinate and seems to be a quiet and reserved person. I made her up but if you want to you can add a picture, the African man with a broken wrist is obviously so Andy's subordinate. His name is Malik and he is a soldier that follows the great warlord Sawand. Though after their encounter, he made glances at Peter with respect and fear showing on his face. Same with this guy, and last we have the bride of nine spiders, Alessa Giomi, who Peter met on the roof already. She was watching Peter's every move, hiding her skepticism well. We have subordinates of four of the five fingers of the hand here. Where is Murakami's? Peter asks. That would be Nobu, sir. Tessa answers swiftly. I see. Peter muttered. Before they could continue, Scythe returned with two ninja that were dragging a limp body of an old Japanese woman into the room. Peter could see the trail of blood leading to this room through the glass windows. Sir, this is the member of the chaste you asked for. Scythe says as the ninja drops the body at Peter's feet. Since the woman was barely alive, Peter waved his hand, healing her with a quick spell circle as he did for the ninja earlier. As the spell circle appeared, those in the room that haven't seen Peter's fight with the beast were shocked, watching in awe as the broken elderly woman healed at a rapid pace. Even her clothes mended as every drop of blood on her body vanished. Once the spell circle finished its job and disappeared, the elderly woman leaped to her feet and started engaging the ninja that dragged her here. She didn't know how she was healed but this was the time to escape that she has been waiting for. Sadly, Scythe was there to stop her with ease, as she was still weak from the torture and captivity. Peter may have healed her injuries, but that doesn't mean she isn't still exhausted. Scythe grabbed her by the shoulder before kicking her legs, flipping the woman to land at Peter's feet once again. Please calm down. Peter says before she can try to attack once again. I healed you. At least give me some time to speak in return. I healed you. At least give me some time to speak in return. As the woman hears this she looks around the room, seeing for the first time in days. Her eyes were one of the first things to be destroyed in the torture. As her gaze swept across the room, she saw the man that spent days bringing nothing but suffering to her every waking moment. Though she noticed something odd. The man that made her feel fear and agony was looking behind her with a cautious and almost frightful gaze, cradling what seemed to be a broken wrist. Turning around, she saw a man in all black from head to toe, sitting at the head of the table with his legs crossed. Hello, please have a seat. Peter says as he motions toward the open seats. W what? She mutters in confusion, her hazy mind unsure of what to do. If you'd rather leave now, we can schedule a meeting at another time? Peter asks, shocking her even more. Aye aye. The elderly woman stutters, but before she could finish speaking, Malik and the rest interrupted. Sir, I wouldn't advise that. Tessa was the first to speak. Yes, the chaste is our enemy. Malik says, glaring at the woman dangerously. They should be purged from the earth, not shown mercy like this. The others voiced their disagreement as well, but Peter didn't allow their words to influence his decision. The chaste is no longer an enemy of the hand. Peter says with a shake of his head, shocking everyone in the room. The elderly woman began to wonder if this was some type of trap that she is being manipulated into. The hand is under new management, you could say. Peter says as he takes a piece of paper and writes down the number to his ghost phone. Here take this. Handing over the paper to the woman, Peter waits patiently as she stares at him with a puzzled look. Sigh? Leaning forward, Peter grasped her hand, placing the paper inside. Have whoever is in charge of the chaste call me. You're free to leave. The elderly woman had no words as she grasped the paper tightly. Scythe, escort her out of the building please. Peter orders. Yes, Black Sky. Scythe bows and opens the door, motioning for the woman to follow along. Black Sky? She thought as she leaves the room, robotically following behind Scythe, trying to figure out what the hand was planning. Are we holding any other chaste members in the building? Peter asks, not getting a response from anyone. Well? No, sir. Tessa answers like a dutiful secretary. Only one was captured. The rest were killed. All right? Peter mutters as he thought about how to handle all of this. As you can see, things are going to change with me in charge, but let me get our last member before we get into this. Wait here. As Peter says this, he opens a portal to the mirror dimension, which shows the five fingers of the hand and Nobu, who was passed out on the ground, on the other side. Peter allowed those in the room to look inside for only a brief moment as he gets up and walks inside. Before they could move or say anything, the portal closed behind him and disappeared. Is he really the black sky? Tessa mutters what everyone was thinking. After seeing Peter's power and supernatural abilities, the skeptics in the room couldn't help but start to believe. 
after all, they had no idea what the mystic arts were. Only someone like the Black Sky could have such magical powers after all. As the portal closed behind him, Peter strolled into the mirror dimension, his footsteps drawing attention from the five fingers of the hand and Nobu, who was flickering in and out of consciousness. As soon as they saw him, the fingers of the hand didn't recognize who it was, as Peter had his suit blacked out, and jumped into action, rushing forward to attack the intruder. Nobu, who was barely alive by his point, laid out behind as he was barely able to stay conscious. He didn't know how long it's been since he and Murakami were imprisoned, but he knew that he desperately needed water. Murakami, on the other hand, was enhanced and has lived for thousands of years. A few days without food and water was nothing to him. He only moved slightly slower than the other fingers as they dashed toward Peter, ready to capture him and hopefully use him to gain freedom, not knowing this was Spider-Man they were dealing with. As the founders of the hand circled him and began attacking, Peter put his hands behind his back as his body swerved, dodging every attack with ease. After a few moments of showing off, Peter switched his suit back to the iconic blue and red, which causes the fingers of the hand to freeze in place. Instantly, four of them dropped to their knees in fear, leaving only Murakami who was standing out of place. After a moment of awkward delay, Murakami remembered what his fellow founders explained to him only moments earlier and dropped to his knee as well. Nobu wasn't conscious for anything that was said before Peter's arrival, so he was confused as to why they would all kneel towards their enemy like this. Black Sky, I presume this world is your doing? Alexandra takes the lead as she's used to, shocking Nobu with the name she called Spider-Man. Yes, this is your punishment until I figured out what to do with you. Peter says as he steps around them and towards Nobu, tossing the man over his shoulder. I'll be taking him. See you next time. While waving goodbye over his other shoulder, Peter opens a portal back to the conference room and steps through. Only a couple of minutes after the portal closed, an identical one opened in the same exact spot. As Peter stepped through in his red and blue suit with a weak Nobu over his shoulder, everyone in the room could see the founders of the hand in the background, kneeling in Peter's direction. Peter quickly switches his suit back to all black, not wanting others to see Spider-Man in a room with a bunch of killers. The hand already knows he's Spider-Man, as the ninja that returned with him would spread the word amongst their ranks. What Peter worried about was someone else seeing him with members of the hand. Peter needs to finish fixing the hand up into something to be proud of before he would be willing to be seen with them. As the portal closes behind them, Peter drops Nobu onto the floor and looks toward Scythe, who must have returned while he was gone. Get Nobu some water, please. He hasn't had any since my first encounter with the hand. Peter says and Scythe orders some ninja that was outside to get it done. T thank you. Nobu stutters sincerely as a ninja brings him a tall glass of water. Take small sips. Peter advised before Nobu could down the whole glass. Your stomach isn't used to having anything inside. If you drink too much, you'll throw up. Listening to Peter's words, Nobu takes small sip after small sip, quenching his unending thirst little by little. Once he had a moment to drink, Nobu sat in a chair and was brought some food from the cafeteria, which he had to eat slowly as well. Now that you're all here, let's get right into business. Peter says, drawing the attention back to himself. I'm in charge from now on, obviously. As he said this, none of them could find a reason to deny it. They were skeptical at first but after seeing his powers and then the kneeling figures of their leaders, it was hard to find a reason not to comply. Especially since doing so could mean their swift and imminent death. Let's start with recruitment, Peter says, causing everyone to look at Alessa. Ahem, Bakudo is, was in charge of recruitment. What would you like to know? Alessa asks. Nothing for now. I want a report written up on every recruitment center we have and how that recruitment happens. All recruitment will be halted until further notice as well. Can you do that? Peter replies. Peter knew that the hand's recruitment wasn't how he wanted it to be, and once he has a full overview of everything, Peter could change it to how he sees fit. If it's as bad as he thinks it is, Peter may close down recruitment for good and implement something else to bolster the ranks when needed. Yes, sir. She answers instantly, not wanting to anger him. This goes without saying, but all offensives on the chaste and any other group are to stop immediately. Peter moves on to the next subject. I'll be meeting with the chaste and propose a ceasefire soon enough. If they attack us, you may defend yourselves but that's it. Everyone in the room was unhappy with this, especially Merrick. Though, none of them would voice their opinions on the matter. Lastly, all illegal activity is to stop as well. Peter says, remembering that the hand ran heroin in the Daredevil show. Though, there has to be other illegal forms of income other than that. Asterisk kick asterisk how will I afford my booze? Zhou Cheng says in a drunken slur. The money will run out sooner or later. Hick we have a lot of expenses. I'll figure something out. Peter says thoughtfully. 
Until then, the hand is as old as dirt, we should have some money laying around. Figure it out. They couldn't help but agree. The hand had a good amount of money and valuable items stored away, so they could last at least a couple of years on just that. The hand of old is dead. Remember that and spread the word. You're all in charge now and you answer to Scythe. Peter motions toward the shocked man, who straightened his back proudly. Thank you, sir. Scythe says respectfully. Peter trusted Scythe more than the rest in the room. The man knew how strong he was from his fight against the beast, so he would think way more than twice before crossing Peter. You're welcome. Follow Scythe's orders, but most of all, follow my orders and you'll keep your new positions. If you run into any problems, call Scythe and he'll contact me. Peter says as he writes down his ghost phone number and hands it to Scythe. Standing from his seat, Peter opens a portal to a random rooftop in New York City and steps through. Don't disappoint me. Peter says as the portal closes behind him. As the portal closed behind Peter, he headed home while thinking of his new plans for the hand. The hand was too troublesome to leave to their own devices, so Peter would take control and find a way to integrate them into the Avengers at some point down the line. They would become the hand of the Avengers, and could probably handle the more low-level crimes all around the world. The future Avengers teams would handle the more superpowered situations, while the hand could stop normal crimes like robberies, muggings, murders, etc. Peter could also recruit the weaker heroes out there, who have little to no superpowers, and place them in the hand. Daredevil, Elektra, Danny Rand, Punisher, Black Widow, and Hawkeye would make good members of the new hand. Though Peter would have to finish the reforms in the hand before any of that could happen. That's easier said than done. Peter thought. He knew that it wouldn't be easy to reform the hand. They've been allowed to slaughter an uncountable amount of people for thousands of years, so stopping that kind of mentality that's been ingrained for so long will take some time. In fact, Peter expected at least one of the five people that he put in charge to betray him in some way. Either by planning his death or not following the new rules that Peter planned to set in place. His money is on Malik, as he seemed to be the most bloodthirsty of the bunch. Nobu is a secondary possibility, as revenge is a good motivator, but he'll have to see what happens. Until then, Peter trusts Scythe to inform him of whatever happens. At least for now. When Peter returned home, he got onto his computer and started structuring how he wants the hand to work from now on. Ranks, rules, guidelines, and the plans Peter has for the future. He couldn't finish everything that night, as he didn't know enough about how the hand was currently structured or their assets. I need to speak with Scythe soon about this. Peter thought as he planned to throw all of his ideas at Scythe and have him deal with everything. Scythe can delegate everything to his new subordinates, so he shouldn't have that hard of a time. Though Peter would have to look in on them often enough to make sure they are actually doing as he says. Since Peter has a meeting tomorrow with Magneto, he needed to get some sleep before the sun came up. Before bed, Peter sent a text to the president, calling out for tomorrow's UN meeting. He didn't need to be there anymore, thankfully. He only had to wait until the end of the week and the Avengers would be approved. Peter's life has been nothing but meetings lately, but he had a bad feeling that this would continue. Especially since the Avengers would become a real thing soon enough. I'm definitely offloading some of this work onto Tony. He doesn't even run his own company, so he has all the time in the world to help out with Avengers business. As Peter thought this, Tony Stark felt a chill down his spine from all the way across the country. Fury has his hands filled with S.H.I.E.L.D. and the cancer that is Hydra, so Peter wouldn't give the man many responsibilities. As for Magneto and Professor X, they aren't exactly trusted just yet, so they wouldn't have many responsibilities in the beginning. Curling up in bed, Peter fell asleep swiftly, tired from the long and action-packed day that he had just gone through. The next morning, Peter slept in until noon. After going through his normal morning rituals, Peter wrapped up the many presents he bought for his loved ones and stashed them away so May wouldn't find them. She's the type of person to unwrap them and peek inside just to rewrap them again so he wouldn't find out. After finishing that up, Peter took the subway to Midtown High and met with MJ and Ned just as the school day came to an end. He planned to start attending school again after the winter break, as everything was finished in Japan already. Peter was actually starting to miss school, which was an odd feeling. Though what he was really missing was the time in school spent with MJ and Ned. Peter explained everything that happened yesterday to them, and Ned was practically bouncing off the walls when he learned about the hand. Dude, you're the leader of an ancient ninja clan. Ned was beyond excited. Can they teach me ninjutsu? Don't even get started on his reaction to Peter fighting and sealing away a demon. MJ, on the other hand, was curious about everything. She always had questions and wanted to know more about Peter's life as a superhero. Peter could only answer a few questions about the hand, as he didn't know that much about them yet. She looked worried when Peter mentioned that he fought a demon, 
but that soon disappeared when she found out that he won and was unharmed. Peter spent an hour and a half hanging out with MJ and Ned, but sadly, he had a meeting with Magneto to get to. As a golden portal opens outside a waterfront warehouse, Peter steps out, disguised in his spider suit. As the portal closes, Peter enters the warehouse and finds it to be filled with household objects. Couches, TV, rugs, a full kitchen, and much more. Before Peter could say or do anything, a bearded and animalistic man dressed in all black come running from the kitchen. He bared his fangs as claws appeared at the tips of each finger. Insert picture of Victor Creed here, GRRRRR. Victor growled as he dashed forward, swinging a clawed hand at Peter's throat. You look familiar. Peter comments as he sidesteps, tilting his body out of the way, and sends a Spartan kick to Victor's chest. Arg! Victor grunts in pain as he's sent flying across the warehouse and smashed into the refrigerator. Are you related to another angry guy with claws? His are longer, though. Peter says as he watches Victor getting angrier and angrier. You must be the little brother. Am I right? Peter knew exactly what he was doing. Victor and Logan were easily angered, and he started enjoying pulling their strings. Victor Creed, also known as Sabretooth, is an animalistic mutant who possesses superhuman strength, mobility, and cat-like claws and teeth. He is Wolverine's older half-brother. Though, Peter was unsure if Logan knew he had a brother. If this world is going by the X-Men movies, which Peter only saw a few of, he remembered that Logan had some sort of memory problem. Gerrrrrr? Ah! Victor was pissed off as he dislodged himself from the fridge and torpedoed towards Peter once again. Before Victor could get anywhere near Peter, some metal dumbbells lifted off the ground and soared toward the animalistic man. Each weight wrapped around Victor's wrists and ankles before slamming him onto the concrete floor, pinning the raging animal to the ground. That's enough, Victor. Magneto makes himself known as he floats down and steps into the warehouse. I apologize for him, he's very animalistic and territorial. It's fine, sorry about the fridge. Peter says as he motions toward the leaking and destroyed kitchen appliance. No problem, it will be replaced by the end of the day. Eric says as he lifts the fridge with his powers, crumples it into a ball, and tosses it out of the warehouse. I had stakes in there, you fucker. Victor thrashed against the metal weights, failing to make them budge even a single centimeter. We should probably get going. Peter says as they were running late, ignoring Victor who was still struggling on the floor. All right, lead the way. Eric says, ignoring Victor as well. Wait, don't you dare leave me here. Victor yells in fury as Peter opens a portal to Tony's house and steps in. Huh, are you sure that you aren't a mutant? Eric asks as he observes the portal with a surprised and impressed look. Metahuman, and I don't know. Peter corrects with a shrug and motions for Eric to follow him through. After Magneto stepped through the portal cautiously, Peter closed it while listening to Victor growl and scream at them in anger. What's all this yelling? Tony comes walking into his empty living room just in time to see the portal close. Don't worry about it. Peter says as he motions between Tony and Magneto. Tony, this is Eric Lencher. Eric, this is Tony Stark. After an awkward handshake, as Tony didn't trust Magneto yet, Tony brought them outside, where Fury was waiting at a table by the infinity pool. You're late. Fury shouted in annoyance. Yeah, but we're here now so relax. Peter says jokingly as he takes a seat across from the angry pirate. I'm a busy man, unlike you and Stark. Rearranging my schedule for these meetings is a headache. The least you can do is arrive on time. Fury starts to rant. Okay, you're right about Tony Dash, Peter says as Tony turns to him with a betrayed look on his face. Hey! He shouts. But I've been busy in Japan, setting up everything for the Avengers, performing my heroic duties, and a bunch of other nonsense that I can't disclose just yet. Trust me, I've been busy too, but you don't hear me whining about it. Peter says as Eric steps forward. I apologize, my subordinate was causing trouble which slowed us down. Eric says as he extends his hand toward Fury, but the angry man doesn't accept his handshake. Take a seat. Fury practically orders as he leaves Magneto hanging. Don't mind him. Peter says as he pulls out a chair for Eric. He's always grumpy. Fury simply glared at Peter in return as Tony and Magneto took a seat. Where's Professor Xavier? Eric looked at Peter questioningly upon heading this, as he was never informed that Charles would be here. Eric and Charles have a rocky past. I thought it would be best to have their meeting separately. At least for now. Peter answers. That's smart of you. Eric comments from the side. Charles doesn't trust me anymore, so it would be best to recruit us individually. Exactly, and we can enjoy the drama that unfolds on the first Avengers Council meeting when he finds out that Eric is with us as well. Peter says, causing Magneto to smirk in anticipation. 
I like the way you think, Spider-Man. Eric remarks happily. Although Eric gets a kick out of messing with Charles and the X-Men, deep down he does find it appealing to work side by side with them again. Eric finally felt that they were moving in the right direction. For far too long, he and his subordinates have raided countless laboratories or detention centers, just for two other similar facility to take their place. Instead of constantly chasing the next bad guy, Eric felt that he was finally getting somewhere with his cause. Even if it was still early. Alright, let's get down to business. Fury cuts in before they could go off topic. I don't have time to be here all night. Sure, I fully agree with Eric joining the Avengers Council, so it's up to you two to ask the questions you need. Peter says, getting an appreciative nod from Eric, as he sits back, planning to mainly listen through this meeting. Fine, tell me about S.H.I.E.L.D. and your attacks on their facilities. Fury gets straight into what he wanted to know. They held metahumans captive and were experimenting on them, so I did what I always do. Eric says with an uncaring shrug. Eric didn't know that he was talking to the director of S.H.I.E.L.D., so he answered without a care in the world. What would that be? Tony asks. I killed those that deserved it and took the metahumans to safety. Eric answers simply. Fury took a folder from his jacket and slapped it down in front of Magneto. Is this a correct depiction of what happened? Fury asks as Eric opens the file and begins reading. After a moment of silence, Magneto tosses the file back to Fury with an annoyed look on his face. No, that's a complete fabrication. Eric denies it vehemently. Do you remember this incident? Fury asks while holding up the folder. Yes, I have feelers out everywhere, looking for any signs of missing children or other suspicious activity. In this case, a contact of mine was in Austin, Texas and witnessed some government types abducting a child from his own home. The parents were killed and the boy was taken to that facility. Eric explains in distaste as he points to the folder in Fury's hand. We raided the compound and found a few other metahuman children as well. They were being held captive and experimented on as usual. I see. Fury mutters as he places the file back inside his jacket. Is this how all of your encounters with S.H.I.E.L.D. have gone? Yes. Eric answers simply once again. Fury became quiet as he thought about all of this. He found it hard to swallow that some high-level member or members of S.H.I.E.L.D. were acting without his knowledge or authorization, but he can only ignore the evidence for so long. Is there a reason or purpose behind these questions? Magneto asks. Let me introduce you. Peter says and gestures toward Fury. Eric, this is Nick Fury, the director of S.H.I.E.L.D. When these words left Peter's mouth, Fury's metal chair morphs, locking him into place as a large kitchen knife comes flying over from inside and rests on his neck. While this was happening, Tony stood from his seat as rocket-like objects came flying out of his workshop, destroying any obstacles along the way. The projectiles shoot towards Tony, which surprises Eric, who thought he was being attacked. These objects morph and slow midair as they attach to Tony's body. Within seconds, the Iron Man suit forms around him, but instead of the usual red and gold, this suit was black and gray. As Tony raises his hand and charges his palm thruster, which glows in a bright blue light, he aims straight at Magneto's chest. Release him and remove the knife or I'll blow a hole in your chest, old man. Tony threatens dangerously. Acting quickly, Eric tries to use Stark's suit against him, as he knew it was made out of metal, but nothing happens. Seeing Magneto furrow his brow in frustration, Tony smirked as his palm thruster pulses threateningly. You won't find a single speck of metal in or around my body. Tony gloats as his helmet snaps closed and his voice becomes more metallic. I even had the shrapnel near my heart removed in preparation for you. My suit is made completely of polyimidiumide as well. In normal people language. He's saying that his suit is made of plastic. Peter says as he sees the confused looks on both Fury and Eric's faces. How do you get it so the thrusters don't melt? Now isn't the time for this. Fury interrupts angrily as he still feels the blade of a sharp kitchen knife on his neck. Right, why don't we all just calm down? Peter relents and tries to mitigate the situation. This is a bit of a misunderstanding. Fury here may be the director of S.H.I.E.L.D., but he isn't the one behind the facilities you raided. Someone in S.H.I.E.L.D. is doing things behind his back, which is why he was asking you about that situation. A stressful moment of silence ensued as the air became heavy before Eric let out a sigh. Soon after, the knife fell from Fury's neck and landed on the table. I apologize for my outburst. Eric says as he looks toward Tony expectantly. Fine. Tony mutters reluctantly as his palm dims and his arm lowers. An awkward silence fills the air as Tony's helmet opens and he takes a seat with his suit still on. As Eric takes a seat as well, Peter could see a vein begin to throb in Fury's forehead. Release me. Fury commands with a dangerous amount of calm in his voice. Oh, my apologies again. 
Magneto releases Fury from his metal restraints, pretending to have forgotten. Fury rubs his chaffed wrists after he's released and sends one last single-eyed glare in Eric's direction. Now that we all got that out of our systems, let's get back on track. Fury is a busy man after all. Peter says jokingly. Shut up, you idiot. You caused all of that. Fury snaps in annoyance. True, but it's best to rip the band-aid off quickly. Now, do we have any more questions? Peter says with a shrug. Yeah, do you know who is running these experiments on metahumans? Fury gets back on track in S.H.I.E.L.D.? No, if I knew who it was they would be dead by now. The one name comes up here and there. Baroness. She seems to be the one to oversee these operations, but it's just a nickname. Eric gives all the information he knows. Baroness. Fury mutters as he thought of possible individuals that fit this name. I'll look into it. If you find another facility like this, contact me and I can do some investigating before you turn the place upside down. As he says this, Fury takes a card with a phone number on it from his pocket and hands it over. I'll see what I can do. Eric says as he takes the card and pockets it. Peter knew that the card had to have some sort of tracker in it, but he decided to throw Fury a bone and not say anything. If Eric is smart he'll figure it out. Tony, any questions from you? Peter asks. No, just a warning. Tony says as he looks toward Magneto. We're serious about this. I have a lot to make up for so if you compromise that, you won't like the consequences. When Tony throws down these threatening words, the thrusters on his palms pulse dangerously once again as his helmet slams shut. Are we clear? Crystal. The meeting was fairly simple after Tony's threat. Fury got what he wanted and Peter was already on board so everyone agreed with Magneto joining the Avengers Council. Peter knew that Charles wouldn't have nearly as hard of a time as someone like Magneto, so if Professor Xavier is still interested, the next meeting would be far easier and less dramatic and violent. After their talks came to an end, everyone exchanged contact information and went their separate ways. Of course, Peter portaled Eric back to the warehouse, where Victor was nowhere to be found. Peter didn't stick around for longer than necessary, knowing that Victor, like Logan, would probably start another fight when he returns. See ya. Peter says over his shoulder as the portal closes. When Peter was gone and it was only Eric left alone in the warehouse, he walked outside and looked out over the water with a small smile on his face. Things were looking bright lately. He didn't know it, but Magneto's future changed drastically with Peter's interference. When once he was on track to become someone that would slaughter thousands, now the future was unclear, but he was certainly on a better path than before. That's for sure. Eric? A beautiful blue-skinned woman calls from behind the aged metahuman. Yes? Eric turns around and smiles warmly upon seeing who it was. We have a tip about some missing children. A couple of days passed since the meeting with Eric and everyone else. Peter was currently in a taxi alongside his Aunt May. They were on the way to MJ's house for Christmas dinner. That's right, it's Christmas Day. They couldn't take the subway like usual as they were traveling with a bunch of wrapped presents. Peter couldn't use a portal either as MJ's mother doesn't know about his powers. Everyone agreed to open presents together, so May and Peter haven't opened anything whatsoever. As they drive through the streets of New York, a light snowfall began and coated everything in a this white blanket. By the time they arrived at MJ's house, the snowfall gradually ramped up, becoming heavier and heavier. Do you want help with the presents? May asks as Peter paid the driver and started grabbing the packages from the trunk. No, just head inside. I'll be there soon. Peter waves her off as he somehow stacks every gift on himself and carries them inside in only a single trip. The second Peter makes it to the door, he's greeted by a very energetic MJ, who held the door for him. Seeing his girlfriend so happy and excited was a bit odd for Peter. Not that she isn't normally energetic every now and then, but this MJ was smiling brightly and practically had a spring in her step. Someone's excited. Peter comments with a smile as he sets the presents down by the Christmas tree, careful not to drop anything. The second Peter's arms are free, MJ does a quick scan of the area, making sure the coast is clear, before wrapping Peter in a hug and taking the lead to pull him into a short kiss. I love Christmas and I especially love that you're here. She says and kisses him once again. Well, I love Christmas too. Peter mutters with a stupid grin on his face. I'm sure. Grace comments as she and May entered the room only moments earlier. Instantly, MJ separates from Peter out of embarrassment, practically pushing him away. Don't mind us. May says with a smile, as she's used to MJ's shy behavior. MJ becomes quiet and looks at Peter, pleading with him to save her with her eyes. So, are we opening presents first or waiting until after dinner? Peter asks and gets a thankful look from MJ. Let's do it now. Grace says as she motions back toward the kitchen. 
I still need some time for the chicken to finish cooking. All right, who's first? Peter asks. You. MJ says excitedly as she walks up to the tree and grabs two boxes, handing over the bigger of the two first. Here, start with this one. Taking his coat off with a smile, Peter grabs the present and starts tearing it open. Inside was a kid's toy Spider-Man mask and web shooters, which shot out silly string with the push of a button. Wow, thanks. Peter says a bit awkwardly while giving MJ a look. MJ said you were a Spider-Man fan and that you'd love them. Grace says with a giggle, oblivious to the underlying joke. MJ and May were on the verge of laughter, but Grace just thought that they found the children's toy funny or something. Thank you. Peter rolls his eyes at them and sets the gift aside. Which shameless company is selling stuff with my name on it? Handing over the smaller box, MJ watched Peter open it up with a nervous look. She didn't care for his reaction to the first one, as that was just a gag gift. This one was a serious gift that she spent days contemplating on. Holy shit. Peter muttered as he sees a green box with a golden crown emblem on it. Did you get me a Rolex? Open it and find out? Grace says, unwilling to give anything away. Doing as he's told, Peter opens the green box and sees a black Rolex watch inside. He could hear the tiny gears inside moving expertly as the hands of the watch moved with perfect precision. Is this real? Peter asks as he admires the gift. He had to ask as anyone could find well-made fakes like this in New York. Purses, shoes, clothing, jewelry. This city had fakes of it all. Of course. MJ says proudly. How did you afford this? Peter asks. Well, money hasn't been a problem for a while now, thanks to a certain someone. Grace says, referring to Peter. Ever since Peter put them on his company's payroll, they've been saving most of the money as they didn't know what to do with it. Neither MJ nor her mother are big spenders, so they put a big chunk of the money they saved into Peter's Christmas present. Look at the back of it. MJ instructs. Okay. Peter pulls the watch from its padding and turns it around. Engraved on the back of the watch are two simple words. Legally mine, am I now? Peter smiles as he looks over at MJ, who was looking away from him in embarrassment. I told you he would like it. Grace says from behind as she laughs at her daughter's reaction. Do you really like it? MJ asked, trying her best to ignore her mother and May in the background. I love it. Peter pulls her into his lap and smiles teasingly. Maybe next time you can get me a collar with the same engraving. That way everyone knows as well. Almost instantaneous, MJ tries to leap out of his lap like a cat that had its tail stepped on. Sadly for her, Peter grasped her waist and kept her securely on top of him. Wait, you have to put it on for me for the engraving to be official. Peter says with a smirk as he hands her the watch and holds out his left hand. May and Grace were standing behind them like voyeurs with heavy blushes on their faces. How come Nick was never like this? Grace mutters, referring to Fury. It's just like the Korean dramas. May was off in her own world as usual. Fine. MJ practically whispers as she grabs the watch and carefully placed it on Peter's wrist and clasped it tightly. The second the watch was on, Peter let her go to admire his present, and she practically flew away like a bat out of hell. After that, everyone exchanged gifts with one another. They all seemed to go all out and get some expensive gifts due to their extra revenue from Parker Games. When it came time for MJ to open her presents, Peter waited for her to open everyone else's before finally handing over what he brought for her. Open these first. He says as he hands over a stack of boxes. Ah? Uh, MJ was shocked by how many presents he got for her. Yeah, I may have gone a bit overboard. Peter admits as he scratches the back of his head. Don't just stare. Open them up. Grace calls out as May nods along beside her. No longer holding back, MJ grabs the nearest gift and tears it open. She got everything from clothes, shoes, chocolates, and games. Peter went all out as he was fairly poor in his past life and never had the chance to buy presents like this for someone else. Grace and May were watching with jealous looks as they never got this sort of treatment in any of their relationships. Okay, I saved the best for last. Peter takes out a small carefully wrapped box and handed it over. Knock knock as she took the present and was about to unwrap it, a knock was heard at the door. Knock knock as the noise came from the front door, everyone wondered who it could be. After all, the snow was starting to come down fairly heavy, so it would be almost impossible to drive by this point. Is it a neighbor? May thought out loud as Grace walked over and opened the door. Standing outside was none other than the man himself, director Nick Fury. He is dressed in all black as usual but it's far more casual than his usual tactical gear. Hey? Fury says awkwardly. Since the day he got that soul-crushing reaction from his daughter a couple of months ago, Nick has been keeping a good distance from his family. Though that became hard when he listened in on the surveillance tape of MJ and her boyfriend, God he hated that word, 
and heard what his daughter said while crying. I just wish he would have showed up tomorrow or something. He didn't even say goodbye. I just want to know why. Listening to these portions of the recording was hard and punishing for him every time. Especially when he heard that his daughter thought it was her fault that he left, which is just nonsense. In fact, it was the opposite. Fury found it very hard to separate from his family because of MJ and Grace. Just the thought of them makes Fury want to return home, but he knew it wouldn't be a good idea. Especially with all of the warnings that Spider-Man has been dropping recently. Sadly, humans are emotional creatures. Even the great Nick Fury feels lonely without his family on Christmas. So, against the man's better judgment, Fury picked up and left last minute, ditching anyone that could have been following him with countless experienced maneuvers. He had to be careful when it came to his family after all. The snow was a killer but he managed to show up around dinner time with a present for MJ that he picked up at a 24-hour drugstore. Sadly, it was the only place that was open. As he knocked and the door flew open, Fury saw his wife standing there with a puzzled look on her face. However, that puzzled look didn't last long, as a shocked and angry look appeared soon after. As Fury was preparing himself to once again face his wife's anger, suddenly, a resigned look appeared on Grace's face as she turned to look over at MJ for a brief moment. Fury wasn't the only one to hear the conversation between Peter and MJ. Her daughter seemed eager for her father's return. Even if she didn't want to admit it. Kumi sighed. Grace steps aside with a resigned sigh. Nick didn't know what got into his wife, but he knew it had something to do with MJ. Walking inside, Fury got a good look at the holiday decorations, including the tree, and smiled lightly. If anyone from S.H.I.E.L.D. saw such a look on their leader's face, they would instantly believe this man to be an imposter. That smile soon morphed into a frown when Nick saw Peter sitting very close to his daughter on the floor by the tree. Peter found all of this interesting and knew that MJ wanted to see her father again, so he didn't mind Fury's bad timing. MJ was silent as she watched her father be invited in by her mother. The last present Peter gave her was tightly grasped in her right hand. Thankfully, the present wasn't fragile, or else she would have crushed whatever was inside by now. Hello again, Mr. Watson. Peter greets the man with an awkward smile, which seemed to increase the glare he was receiving. May, this is Nick Watson. MJ's father. After flashing a knowing look toward her nephew, May introduced herself to Fury. She knew everything about Nick Fury, as Peter told her. Looking over at MJ, Peter could tell that she was torn between yelling at her father, hugging him, storming out of the room, or flat out ignoring the man. He gave her a comforting side hug, which only made Fury's frown deepen. After a moment of silence, MJ decided on the latter and ignored her father's presence completely. Choosing to focus her attention back on Peter. What were we doing? MJ asks and Peter taps the present in her hand. Oh, yeah. MJ turns her back to Fury and starts opening the present, causing her mother to sigh in relief. She would feel bad if MJ reacted badly and this ruined her first Christmas with Peter. Take a seat. Grace orders Nick as she gestures toward the couch. Not willing to ruin his chance, Fury follows orders, sitting there with a gift bag on his lap, forgetting to take off his coat. Sad divorced dad vibes. Peter thought as he turned to watch MJ open his gift. Unwrapping it fully, MJ found a jewelry box underneath and flipped that open as well. Inside the box was a heart-shaped locket with PNM engraved on it. Thank you. MJ mutters as she takes it from the box, revealing the golden necklace attached to it. Open it up. Peter instructs. Listening to him, MJ presses a tiny button on the side and the locket pops open. Inside is a picture of them together from the time they had a picnic at the top of a skyscraper. Without a word, MJ bounced off the ground and wrapped her arms around Peter's neck, throwing him to the ground and landing on top of him in the process, the necklace still clasped tightly in her hand. I'm guessing you like it? Peter comments with a laugh as he wraps his arms around her waist. I love it. MJ answers enthusiastically. MJ isn't the type to like expensive or flashy jewelry, and Peter knew that. This is why he made sure to make this gift as sentimental as possible. Because otherwise, MJ would never wear such expensive jewelry. After all, the locket and necklace are high-quality gold and cost around $30,000. Though, Peter would never tell her that. Ahem. Fury cleared his throat in the background. Instantly, MJ remembered that others were in the room and leaped off of him, glancing at her father in embarrassment before swiftly ignoring him once again. Well, put it on. Grace encourages from the background. Want some help? Peter asks as MJ tries to clasp the necklace but has a hard time getting it on. Please. MJ nods and hands over the necklace. While he was clasping the necklace around her neck, Peter could feel the glare from Fury the whole time. There you go. Peter says as he backs up and takes a look. 
After getting ambushed by Grace and May, who wanted a closer look at the locket, MJ ran off to the bathroom to look at the necklace in the mirror. While she was gone, Grace and May ran off to the kitchen, leaving Peter and Nick behind in the living room. So, how have you been? Peter tried to make some small talk but Fury just looked at him in annoyance without answering. Okay. Silence filled the room once again as they waited for the girls to return. Peter was actually enjoying this, as he knew Fury well enough as Spider-Man to find this whole situation fairly amusing. You should take off your jacket. Peter tries to help the guy out a little. You're giving off sad divorce dad vibes. Looking down at himself, Fury sighed in annoyance, reluctantly agreeing with Peter's words. Once he took the jacket off, he looked a bit better but the cheap gift bag still made him look like a divorced dad. Though it wasn't as bad as before. When MJ returned from the bathroom with a smile on her face, Fury stood up and handed over the gift bag. I wasn't planning on coming, so I picked this up on the way here. If you don't like it, that's okay. You can re-gift or return it. Fury says, knowing that his gift wouldn't measure up to the necklace or anything else that's sitting by the tree. Fighting her own instincts, which wanted to continue ignoring her father, MJ reluctantly took the present and sat beside Peter once again. Go ahead. Open it up. Peter encourages her as he sees her hesitate to look inside. Peeking inside the bag, MJ's eyes widen as she pulls out a white bunny plushie. MJ has a worn white bunny plush that she sleeps with. Peter has seen it countless times. The first time he saw it was when he snuck in to place the protection enchantments on MJ and Grace. What he didn't know is that old bunny was a gift from her father. It was the last gift he gave her before disappearing. Don't you already have one of those in your room? Peter voices his thought, causing Fury's eyes to widen. What were you doing in my daughter's bedroom? He asks with a dangerous look. Before Peter could answer, a savior arrived from the kitchen. Dinner's ready. Everyone to the kitchen. The entire dinner with Fury was awkward. He never got his answer as to what Peter was doing in his daughter's bedroom, and Peter wasn't going to volunteer an answer. While they were eating, MJ continued to ignore her father, but that got harder and harder as she thought of the gift she received from him. Fury didn't think his gift could compete with Peter's, yet it's the one that occupied her mind the most. Though Peter didn't mind. He hoped MJ and Fury could repair their relationship after all. When the night came to an end, Peter and May took a cab home, leaving Fury alone with his family. Thankfully, the snow stopped and the streets were being cleared. MJ and Grace wanted them to stay longer, but it was getting late and they wanted to give the family of three some alone time together. It was Christmas and that's how it should be. Fury seemed to pick up on this and gave Peter and May a thankful look before returning to his usual scowl. He would never admit it, but he was grateful to his daughter's boyfriend. Maybe I should have him killed painlessly? Fury thought jokingly as he hated the word boyfriend. When their taxi arrived, MJ walked out with Peter and May, taking any moment to stay away from her father that she could get. As they finished loading up the car with their gifts, May hopped in first to give Peter and MJ some privacy for their goodbyes. You should stay. MJ says for the fifth time now. I don't know what to do with him. You mean your dad? Peter asks with a smile. Yeah. She answers reluctantly. You should go in there and yell at him. Isn't that what you wanted? To go right up to him and say how you feel? Make him understand what you and your mother felt when he left? Peter says some words of encouragement. MJ goes silent as she turns to see Fury watching them from the window. You'll never be able to have a relationship with your father again if you don't let all of your grievances out. You need to sit him down and open the floodgates. Your mother should probably do the same. Just don't let him run off until you've both finished. Peter continues as he looks over her shoulder at Fury in pity. You're right. MJ says as she goes from sad and quiet to angry and determined. Good. Peter says as he grabs MJ by the waist and pecks her on the lips. Now get in there and give him hell. Turning around, MJ walks inside like a lion stalking her prey. She was ready to tear into her father and Peter was all for it. As she walked inside, Fury was still glaring at Peter. He didn't like seeing his daughter kiss someone, so if glares could kill, Peter would be dead over a thousand times already. Good luck. Shrugging off the look he's getting, Peter says some quick words to Fury before hopping in the car and driving off. Good luck? Fury was confused as to what that meant, as he can easily read lips. That confusion didn't last long as MJ stormed into the house and slammed the door closed, locking it behind her. Screams filled the house as Fury was enlightened as to what Peter meant by good luck. As the car was pulling away from MJ's house, Peter smirked as he could hear the yelling from down the block with his enhanced senses. When he and May returned home, Peter relaxed with his aunt and watched some old Christmas movies. While they were watching Home Alone in the living room, Peter's ghost phone started ringing. 
At first, Peter thought that it was MJ calling him, as he expected her to give him the details about what happened with her father, but when he checked the caller ID it was just a random number. Pinky's porno palace, what's your pleasure? Peter answers the phone, shocking May with his stupid joke. Is this the man that released Tsubaki? A gruff voice speaks over the phone, ignoring Peter's dumb line. I don't know any Tsubaki. Peter replies and thinks for a moment. Do you mean that woman from the chaste? Peter only gave his phone number to a select few people, so it was easy to figure out who was calling. Yes, now what do you want? The man on the other end asks gruffly. Well, the hand is currently under new leadership. So, I thought it would be best to call a meeting between two age-old enemies and come to a ceasefire, so to speak. Peter says as May pauses the movie to listen in. Peter didn't have anything to hide so he just smirked at her and put the phone on speaker, so she could hear better. What do you mean when you say under new leadership? The man on the phone asks. What about Alexandra and the other scum? Well, I'm currently at the top of the top when it comes to the hand. They tried to attack me so I took over. The five founders are currently imprisoned. I'm not sure what to do with them yet. Peter says causing the man on the other end to go quiet for a moment. You should kill them and incinerate the bodies. He says after a moment of silence. Maybe? Peter answered thoughtfully. So, is the chaste interested in making peace with the new hand? I'd like to have a meeting with you and whoever else is in charge. Prove it. The man states simply. Hmm, how would you like me to do that? Peter asks back. Hand over the five fingers and I'll believe you. The man answers. If this was a trap, then he would never hand over the supposedly imprisoned founders, but if it's not, that's where they're willing to roll the dice and hope for the best. Let me call you back. Peter didn't know how to answer just yet. I need to think. I'll call this number again with an answer. Without giving the man any time to answer, Peter hung up the phone and looked out the window in thought. Should he just hand them over? What are you going to do? May asks, breaking Peter from his inner thoughts. I'm not sure. In order to clear his mind and think about what to do, Peter went out to patrol as Spider-Man once May went off to bed. While swinging through the city, Peter was lost in thought. On one hand, he could just hand over the founders of the hand and be done with them. On the other hand, he could try to turn them to his side and have some fairly strong subordinates. Though, is it really worth having people who have probably murdered thousands of people as his subordinates? Peter has nothing against killing when it's deserved, especially after his experience in Afghanistan with Tony but he knew that they didn't follow the same thought pattern as him. The five fingers of the hand were cold-blooded murderers who would slaughter children if it would get them one step closer to completing their goal. Can people like that change for the better? Peter thought questioningly. The answer was that it's not likely. It's hard to teach an old dog new tricks, and these dogs might as well be ancient by this point. Peter could work with people like Charles and Eric, as they aren't nearly as old and were once the best of friends, but these people may just be a lost cause. Not to mention the many enemies that would become his should they work under him. The Chaste and Kunluan are the two major problems here, but there have to be others that Peter doesn't know of yet. They just aren't worth it. Peter came to this conclusion fairly quickly. The problem now is the fact that they know Spider-Man is in charge of the Hand. Though everyone in the Hand knows that. Of course, Peter ordered Scythe to make sure that knowledge stays in-house. Though he knew that it may leak at some point, the Hand is a very secretive organization so the chances are incredibly slim. If he were to hand them over to the chaste, they would most likely be interrogated about the new hand leader's identity and powers. It wouldn't be the end of the world but Peter would rather keep his involvement with the hand under wraps. At least for the time being. I can't hand them over alive. Peter thought as he returned home. There wasn't any crime that night, which he should have known since it was Christmas. Even criminals spend the holidays with their families, so Peter just ended up swinging around the city. As Peter was hopping into bed after changing his clothes, his phone chimed and a text from MJ popped up. After texting MJ for a couple of hours, Peter went off to sleep. He had to deal with the former leaders of the hand and the chase tomorrow so he needed his sleep. MJ gave him every last detail as to what happened with her father. Apparently, he tried to leave after MJ started yelling at him, but she blocked the door and just kept letting the words fly. By the time MJ ran out of words to speak, Fury was holding her and apologizing, yet he still refused to say why he left. That didn't matter to MJ though. She knew all about Nick Fury thanks to Peter. Sadly for Fury, the second he thought that the storm was over, another brood on the horizon. Once MJ was finished yelling, his wife opened up the floodgates as well thanks to some encouragement from her daughter. Fury's emotional damage was at nuclear levels by this point. During all of this, MJ guarded the door so her father couldn't run off. When even her mother got it all out, the whole house was silent. In the end, 
Fury wound up shedding a few tears, which surprised Peter as he never thought a character like Nick Fury even had the ability to cry in the first place. Maybe I should have stayed. Peter thought as he would pay big money to see Nick Fury cry. Fury had apologized to each of them a hundred times and was speechless by this point as well. The family of three didn't know what to do after this, so they just sat on the couch in the living room and watched whatever was on the TV, which was Frosty the Snowman. MJ and Grace didn't want Fury to leave and the man himself didn't have the heart to walk out the door after hearing all of that, so they just sat there quietly. When it got late and everyone was tired, Fury ended up sleeping on the couch. MJ was happily surprised that he would be spending the night, but she knew that he would be gone by the morning. He may not want to leave but his job would sadly require it, which ruined her mood as she lay in bed that night texting Peter. Peter did his best to cheer her up though, reminding her that her father would have to come back after tonight's festivities. He may not stay to live there but there's no way he has the heart to ditch them for a long period of time again. Peter guessed that Fury would visit them at least once a month from now on, which is good for someone as busy and cautious as he is. Though they would have to wait and see. The next day, Peter woke up to a text from MJ, saying that her father left. What was surprising is the fact that he stayed for breakfast but left soon after. Peter didn't expect that, as Fury seemed more like the kind of guy to slip out before anyone woke up. I guess they really got through to him. Peter was happy for MJ as she seemed to be in a good mood. After texting MJ for a few minutes, Peter got ready for what will probably be a very long day. Once he was clean and dressed, Peter called back the same number that called him last night. Ring ring, what? The man on the other end answered in an annoyed tone. I'll hand them over. Peter gets straight to the point. What part of the world are you in right now? Hmm, I'm in Japan still. The man answered easily. Tokyo. All right, hold on. Peter says as he looks up an address in Tokyo. I just texted you an address, I'll meet you there at midnight. Don't keep me waiting. Before he could get an answer, Peter hung up the phone. Switching to his spider suit and turning it black, he opens a portal and walks through to find the five fingers of the hand sitting around with contemplative and defeated looks on their faces. As soon as they heard some foreign footsteps, each of the five founders launched to their feet and turned to see Peter and the portal behind him closing. Hello, how have you all been? Peter greets them as he notices Murakami's condition. Murakami has been here the longest and hasn't drank or eaten anything for far longer than what's healthy. His clothes were disheveled and he looked noticeably weaker compared to the other four around him. This place is, interesting. Alexandra was the first to speak. We hope to be released soon, my lord. I know this is a punishment but we've sworn ourselves to you. Please allow us to serve. Alexandra uses her silky words to persuade Peter and kneeled on the ground. The others followed her lead, hoping to get the hell out of this desolate dimension. Okay, I'll take you all out. Peter says as he waves his hand. Instantly, a spell circle is drawn in the air and splits off into five smaller symbols. These symbols split off toward the five kneeling fingers and smack them on the forehead. As the symbols appeared on their foreheads, each of them fell to the floor like puppets with their strings cut. Sigh? Peter sighs as he checks the time on his phone. 9.57 AM of one hour until midnight in Tokyo. Peter thought as he opened a portal. As every working clock in Tokyo struck 12, an aged blind man with white hair walks down a dark and empty street with his walking stick tapping along the ground the entire way. Insert picture of MCU stick here, I told you to leave, Tsubaki. Stick stops in the middle of the road and yells out. Suddenly, the same woman that Peter freed from the hand walks out from behind a building. This could be a trap and I refuse to leave you to die alone. Tsubaki says as she walks over. It's my fault if you die, so I might as well be there alongside you. Stick took this mission upon himself alone for a reason. If it is a trap, then he would be the only casualty, as the chaste can't afford to lose anyone. At one point, the chaste was an equal enemy to the hand, but these days that's all changed. The hand recruits with any means necessary and use those recruits to hunt any chaste member and location with no mercy, so they have been on the losing end of this war for about 10 years now. This is why Stick is so willing to walk into a trap. If the five fingers can be eliminated, then a ceasefire with the new hand would do wonders for their organization. The chaste could use that time of peace to bolster their ranks in case the new hand takes after the old. After all, the hand, no matter who was in charge, will always be an enemy of the chaste. Whether this new leader would turn the hand into something good was impossible in their minds. Fine. Stick grumbles and starts walking down the street once again, tapping his walking cane along the road. Following behind him, Tsubaki and Stick arrive at the front of a closed morgue. The building was locked up and all workers were gone for the night as working hours ended five hours ago. How foreboding. Tsubaki mutters as Stick ignores her and walks inside after somehow picking the lock while blind. 
Walking the halls of the empty morgue, Stick uses his enhanced hearing to navigate straight toward Peter, who is waiting in the incinerator room, where the dead bodies are cremated. Hello. Peter greets as the two elderly chaste members enter the room to see him in his blacked out suit. Oh, it's Stick. Peter was a fan of Stick and just realized that's who he was talking to over the phone. He liked the man's grumpy personality and always thought he was one of the cooler characters in Daredevil. On the floor beside Peter are the unconscious former leaders of the Hand. Each of them has a small mark on their foreheads from the spell that's keeping them from waking up. As soon as Tsubaki saw the bodies in the room, she froze in shock. This sudden action caused Stick to freeze as well. It would be impossible for him to identify the bodies, as he's blind, which was a big reason why Tsubaki was so adamant about joining him. You weren't lying, huh? Stick reads the room with his advanced senses and speaks. Of course, I have no reason to lie. Peter answers as Tsubaki walks forward to inspect the bodies more closely. It's really them. She says excitedly. Yup, it's good to see you again by the way. Peter nods as she looks up at him in shock. Wait, what's this mark on their foreheads? Tsubaki asks in confusion. I don't know. Peter says with a shrug. They had it when I met them. We'll take them and be on our way. Stick says, ready to get out of here and interrogate his enemies. I'm afraid not. Peter interrupts before they could move the bodies. We'll be incinerating them here. After all, isn't that what you told me to do on the phone yesterday? We'll be incinerating them here. After all, isn't that what you told me to do on the phone yesterday? Peter says, surprising the two chaste members. That wasn't what you told me over the phone. Stick says, sounding more grumpy than usual. Well, plans change. Peter says with an uncaring shrug. Let's be honest here. You're going to interrogate them and I'd rather that not happen. They know a bit about me and a lot about the hand. I'd rather that information stay hidden. At least for now. A staring contest somehow began between Stick and Peter even though one of them couldn't see. Stick couldn't sense a single person in or around the building besides Peter and Tsubaki, so he wondered where this man's confidence came from. He would be lying if he said the idea of simply killing Peter and taking the five fingers alive didn't cross his mind. Though a bad feeling tingled down his spine after thinking that. Stick has enhanced senses thanks to his blindness and training, so he tended to trust those senses instinctively. Something told him that he and Tsubaki would die if they tried anything against this man, which caused him to look in Peter's direction with a bit more caution than he originally had. Fine, as long as they're dead, I'm happy. Stick was the first to break the silence. Thank you for understanding. Peter says gratefully. Loading the bodies up one by one, Peter allowed the chaste members to do the honors and press the ignition button for each finger's death, burning their unconscious bodies one at a time. Peter didn't feel bad as he watched them burn. If they were innocent, things would be different and Peter would have never handed them over like this. Sadly for them, this wasn't the case. When the last founder of the hand burned into nothing but ashes, Stick turned to Peter and motioned to the piles of ash that they collected from each body. Can we at least take the ashes with us? He asks. No, I'll be spreading those ashes in some undisclosed locations. After all, the world is more mystical than many would believe. When I choose to kill someone, I'd like them to stay that way. Peter says, not trusting them with the ashes. The chaste follows Kuenluan and he doesn't know what either of them is willing or capable of doing. For all Peter's knows, resurrecting someone from just their ashes is something that Kuenluan has the power to do. Peter didn't even know if the dragon bone elixir could be used to resurrect someone from ashes, so it was best to stay safe and carefully dispose of his enemy's ashes. Especially since he now lives in a comic book world. Comic book villains and heroes tend to come back from the dead, as writers can't just leave the good characters dead forever. Sometimes they even get a nice power-up after their death as well. Yeah, no thanks. Peter thought as he planned to dispose of all enemies carefully. Especially the more powerful ones like Thanos. Stick and Tsubaki looked displeased but didn't voice any complaints. I guess that will take our leave then. Stick says as he starts walking toward the door. Wait, we aren't finished yet. Peter says, stopping Stick in his tracks. What? He asks in annoyance. We need to talk about our ceasefire. We don't want more deaths on either side, do we? Peter asks. What's there to talk about? Stick asks back grumpily. We won't attack you. You won't attack us. There, it's done. No, it's not that easy and you know it. We have to talk if we want to keep this peace for a long period of time. Communication is key. Peter says, causing Stick to sigh in annoyance. He knew that Peter was right, but he wasn't sure the peace would last long either way. Once the chaste has its numbers replenished, the leaders may decide to attack the hand once again. After all, it's all they know. For thousands of years, they've fought the hand. 
Making peace with their enemy isn't something anyone in the chaste is remotely interested in. Well, I'll start then. Peter says, seeing as neither of them had anything to say. The hand will be going through some major changes in the years to come. One of the most important is that we will be acting as a sort of vigilante group across the world. Sort of like Spider-Man minus the superpowers, of course. Both Stick and Tsubaki were shocked and beyond surprised by Peter's words. The hand is going to fight crime and save people? Tsubaki mutters in surprise. Yes, like I said. This is a new hand. Peter says with a shrug. I don't care for Kunluan or immortality. The hand made a grave mistake when they attacked me, which most definitely ruined all of their plans. Hearing Peter's words, Stick refused to believe that this man wasn't at least interested in immortality. Why take over an organization such as the Hand if you didn't want their Dragon Bone Elixir? He would be correct too. Peter was interested in studying the Dragon Bone Elixir, but that doesn't mean he's interested in taking it. At least not until he studies it enough to learn the consequences or the possible alterations he can make to it. I should really speak to Scythe soon. Peter thought. That's hard to believe. Stick voices his inner thoughts. Truthfully, it sounds like bullshit. Well, I guess the new hand will just have to prove it to you over time. There wasn't much more to talk about after that, as neither Stick nor Tsubaki could believe the words that Peter was saying. A good hand is something that nobody could comprehend. When they left the morgue empty-handed, Peter bagged up the ashes of each founder and opened a portal to the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Using some wind magic, Peter spread each person's ashes in a different direction. After floating for a while, the ashes descended into the salty water below and dissolved into nothing within seconds. Marking the end of the ancient founders of the hand. Time skip, sophomore year. Many months passed since the deaths of the five fingers. Peter's freshman year came to a close and the summer flew by quickly. Since then, a lot has happened. The Avengers were approved by the United Nations on the day after Peter met with the chaste, which was a happy day as Peter and Fury put a lot of work into the Avengers initiative. Tony didn't do much to help, but he was excited as well. Speaking of Tony, he moved to New York a couple of weeks after and hasn't regretted it ever since. The top of Avengers Tower became his home. That's right, the Stark Industries Tower was renamed earlier than in the movies as Tony became excited about their new organization. Pepper had some complaints as the building was used for Stark Industries, but sadly for her, she lost in the end and the sign was changed to the iconic Avengers logo. In the past months, the Avengers has completed its council as well. The meeting with Charles was far easier than the one with Eric just as Peter thought it would be. The more interesting meeting was the one between Charles and Eric during the first official council gathering of the Avengers. Flashback. For the first Avengers council assembly, they used the new Avengers Tower in New York City. Tony especially had a meeting room made for their gathering, which Peter was ecstatic about. It felt like everything was coming together. Seated at the head of the table, Peter, who was dressed in his spider suit, waited for the arrival of everyone but Tony, who was drinking a glass of liquor in the chair next to him. Do you think they'll fight? Tony asks as he takes a swig of his dark-aged liquor. No, I think they're old enough to hold themselves back. Peter says thoughtfully. Dash ten minutes later, yelling filled the room as Charles and Eric were in a heated argument. The second Charles rolled into the room and saw Eric sitting beside Tony, Peter, and Fury, a look of realization filled his face. Please tell me this is a joke. Charles said as his first words. It didn't take long for Charles and Eric to begin arguing and throwing barbed words at one another, but soon enough Fury stepped in. Shut the hell up. Fury yelled in frustration and the room goes silent. We're here to talk about official business, not squabble like temperamental children. Get over yourselves and get your heads in the game. We have work to do. Fury was already annoyed before the meeting started, as the World Security Council has been on his but ever since they found out about the Avengers initiative being separated from S.H.I.E.L.D. He has had to deal with enough lately, and this just threw him over the edge. That's right, we have much to speak about, so table your childish behavior and act like the elderly men you are. Peter nods, agreeing with Fury's words. Without another word, Charles reverses his chair from the table and rolls out of the room. He didn't sign up for this, after all. Nobody said that Magneto would be on the council as well. Flashback end. After the first meeting of the Avengers Council, Professor Xavier didn't speak to Peter for a week. Peter tried to contact him, but later decided to give the man some space to think for a while. That didn't last long, as Peter noticed that this plan was going nowhere and decided to be persistent. He bothered the hell out of Charles, who cracked after a couple of weeks and returned to the Avengers Tower for a much more calm and orderly meeting than the last. During the time that he was annoying Professor X into coming back to the council, Peter had about ten more encounters with Logan, who attacked him instantly for the first five of them. 
After beating Logan into unconsciousness five more times, Peter decided to deploy a new strategy for dealing with him. Flashback. After beating Logan for the sixth time that week, instead of knocking him out, as usual, Peter tied him up in web and forced Wolverine to hang out with him. Once Wolverine was tied up, Peter dragged him to the living room and dropped Logan on the couch. What do you want to watch? Peter asks as sits next to him and kicks his feet up, grabbing the remote to flip through the channels. Let me go. Logan shouts as he shakes side to side, trying to break free. I'll just pick? Peter mutters as he ignores the angry man beside him and puts on Jerry Springer, which seemed to only anger the man further. I knew he was the father. Half an hour in, Peter started making small talk with Logan. They watched TV for almost two hours before Peter had to get home, leaving an angry Wolverine tied down on the couch with Wheel of Fortune on the flat screen. Peter repeated this treatment for his next few visits to Professor Xavier's mansion. It got to a point where Logan started avoiding him because watching TV with Peter was worse than losing a fight. At least he enjoyed fighting, losing or not. Of course, Peter wouldn't allow him to get away. After he was done bothering Charles about rejoining the council, Peter would hunt down Logan and force him to hang out and watch TV. This got to a point where a sort of friendship formed between the two. He has to be the father. Logan says as he and Peter watch another episode of Jerry Springer. No, look at the baby's eyes. Neither of the parents has blue eyes. It's not his. Peter points out with a shake of his head. Look at the nose, you idiot. They're exactly the same. Logan yells and gestures to the TV with his free hand. By this point, Peter didn't need to tie Wolverine up in order to watch TV anymore. He would still have to find him, but after that, Logan would reluctantly come to hang out. In the case of baby Stacy. Nick, you are. Not the father. The host of the show announced, causing Peter to smirk victoriously in Logan's direction. Told you, flashback end. Peter didn't expect to become friends with Wolverine, as their past meetings have been filled with nothing but fights. At some point, Peter thought that this world's Logan was a lot more animalistic than his movie counterpart, but that wasn't the case. They just seemed to have a bad first encounter, which devolved into a grudge that Logan formed against him. Peter didn't help either, as he goaded Wolverine on during almost every encounter. Back to the Avengers, Peter delayed their first meeting until Charles returned. When he finally did return, they mainly talked about future plans and recruits. Those future plans unfolded in the many months that passed since then. The Avengers Tower was renovated, and the bottom half was allocated towards Stark Industries, while the top half became the official headquarters of the Avengers. Since they were a fairly small organization, they didn't bother expanding further than the Avengers Tower. At least for now. The Avengers Headquarters has a bunch of sections that were perfectly planned out by Peter and Tony. First, there are the apartments that take up multiple floors. These apartments are about normal size, but they come with the latest in home tech, design, and a view that anyone would pay millions for in this city. The apartments are for those that join the Avengers and are either visiting from out of town or simply have no home of their own. Though, after the first month as paycheck, any Avenger could easily afford to rent a high-end apartment. They're also for the future Avengers that come to America for training. They would be given an apartment for the duration of that training before heading back to their home country upon completion. Every council member currently has their own penthouse apartment as well, so they could come live in the tower whenever they wanted to. However, the only one to move in beside Tony was Magneto. Fury was all over the place with his shield duties. Peter has Aunt May to live with and a secret identity to keep, and Charles had a school to run. Other than the apartments, the tower has a giant cafeteria with some very well-trained and accomplished chefs running the show. Only the best for Tony Stark, after all. Then we have some meeting rooms, followed by the council room, where the Avengers Council has their important assemblies. Followed by that is the training floors. Since Peter emphasizes how important it would be to properly train their members before allowing them into the field, Tony took that seriously and went all out when purchasing training equipment and allocating space. Tony made sure to add some fun and leisure areas as well. The Avengers have their own bowling alley, basketball quarter, Olympic swimming pool, game rooms, and more. Since all of this would have to be maintained, Tony and Peter spent some spare time creating specific robots to clean and fix things should they be needed. An army of Roomba-like machines to vacuum, mop, and polish the floors. Self-cleaning windows, sort of like how windshield wipers on cars work, but far more effective and complicated. If it needed cleaning, Peter and Tony found the perfect robot or machine to get the job done. They did this to avoid the need for a staff of employees to maintain everything, as at least 1% of that staff would most definitely be there to spy on them. As the tower was being renovated, Fury brought in the two S.H.I.E.L.D. agents that he talked about wanting in the Avengers. 
those being Natasha and Clint Barton, also known as Hawkeye. These were some of the few members of S.H.I.E.L.D. that Fury still trusted, and he wanted to keep them close by. During their first appearance together, Tony had a rude awakening. Flashback, you can't be serious. Tony mutters in dread. I'm afraid that training is mandatory for all Avengers that want to do field work. Peter says, getting a nod from every council member in the room. Don't worry. A handsome white man with brown hair and eyes says with a disarming smile. I'll go easy on you, at first. He stands next to Natasha with black combat clothes and a bow and arrow draped over his shoulder. Insert picture of MCU Hawkeye here, Clinton Barton is an extremely skilled marksman and a special agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. He's known for his use of the bow and arrow as his primary weapon and an extremely keen eyesight and accuracy that earned him the codename Hawkeye. Why am I the only one getting forced to do this? What about you guys? Tony points the finger at his fellow council members. Well, I'm already being trained by Natasha here. Peter says as he gestures toward his beautiful trainer. As for the rest, Fury has more training than he needs and the other two are a bit old for combat training. Charles can't even walk after all. Tony couldn't find a single word to argue against Peter's logic, so he just stood there brooding about his impending muscle ache. Don't bother using your Iron Man suit as an excuse either. Peter says, not giving Tony a single inch to form an argument. Without it, you're nothing but a smart walking meat bag. You need to know how to defend yourself without the suit just in case. Yeah, don't worry. It won't be that bad. Clint says with an excited look on his face. He gets to train the famous Tony Stark personally so Clint was looking forward to seeing the spoiled billionaire go through his hellish boot camp. Webhead, I don't like the look on his face. Tony says as a frightening shiver runs down his spine. Eh, you'll be fine. Flashback and Tony hated every minute of his training in the beginning, as he never worked out to this degree before, so the soreness and combat injuries were truly excruciating. After a couple of weeks, Tony started getting used to the new addition to his schedule and the soreness wasn't as bad as it was at the start. He didn't love the training and he probably never would, but Tony could get through it without constantly whining about everything now. Luckily for him, Tony has no superpower that needs training, so he only had to learn martial arts and a few other skills before his time with Hawkeye came to an end. Although the other council members were excused from the physical training, they were not excused from the learning portion of that training. Each member of the Avengers, new or old, is given a sort of rule book, outlining how they should handle most situations. They don't have to follow every rule perfectly, as each situation would branch off into infinite possibilities. The book mainly mentions the need for preservation of life, protection of innocent civilians, teamwork, public image, and much more. Peter wanted to be sure that everyone understood as some people needed these obvious things outlined for them. Once the Avengers Tower was fully renovated, the Council started its first round of recruitment. Sadly, the only person on Fury's list of people to recruit that they didn't already know about is Bruce Banner, also known as the Hulk. Thor hasn't been banished to Earth yet. Captain Marvel is off-planet most likely fighting the Kree. Captain America hasn't been found in the ice yet. Though that should be happening soon. Scarlet Witch and her brother Quicksilver haven't unlocked their powers yet. Vision hasn't been built yet. Ant-Man, Falcon, and War Machine haven't received the tech that makes them into heroes either. Thankfully, the X-Men exist in this world as well, or the Avengers wouldn't have much to recruit from this early on. Saving Hulk for later, as Bruce Banner's alter ego would be hard to deal with, they all decide to start with metahumans instead. They first started with the teachers at Xavier's school, as they were the easiest to deal with. Wolverine, Nightcrawler, and Storm were all brought in and put on the payroll. Though that wasn't all. Peter met someone that he didn't encounter during his many trips to Xavier School. Flashback. As the members of the X-Men were arriving at a meeting room in Avengers Tower for the first time, Peter noticed another blue animalistic man besides Nightcrawler. The new metahuman looked like a big blue, hairy gorilla. Of course, he was clothed in a normal human outfit and even had glasses, which made him look like a gorilla that someone stole from the zoo, painted blue, and dressed up in nice clothes. Insert picture of Dr. Henry McCoy or Beast here, who this? I thought that I met everyone from your school. Peter asks Charles, who sat with all the other council members around Peter. This is Dr. Henry McCoy, but we like to call him Beast. He's in my humble opinion, one of the smartest people in the world and has six PhDs, including one in biophysics, and happens to be a world-renowned biochemist. Making him a leading expert in the X gene, far superior to even me. Charles introduces the man, who became a bit self-conscious due to the attention suddenly being shifted to himself. 
As a founding member of the X-Men, the intelligently gifted Dr. Henry Hank McCoy has been fighting for the peaceful coexistence between mutants and humans for most of his life. Born with a physique, strength, and muscular structure greatly resembling an ape, giving him the nickname Beast. The reason you haven't seen him until now is that Hank here practically lives in his lab. If we didn't deliver him food every day, he'd probably starve to death before coming out. Charles explains with a laugh. Hey, I'm not that bad. Henry says with a deep British accent. Every member of the X-Men looked toward Beast with a look that said, yeah, right, causing Henry to scratch his hairy neck embarrassed. Flashback end. Beast wasn't the only new face that Peter met during the recruitment process for the Avengers. After taking in the X-Men, who were pleasantly surprised by the new paycheck they would be receiving every month from now on, and scheduling their training, the next group of metahumans was a bit more unruly than the last. Flashback. On the day after the X-Men signed their contracts and were accepted into the Avengers, the Council welcomed the members of the former Brotherhood of Mutants as well. Magneto threw away that name after Peter introduced the metahuman name into the world. At first, he didn't know what to rename themselves, but that problem disappeared with his appointment to the Avengers Council. Now he can just say that they're Avengers. As every subordinate of Magneto strolled into the meeting room, they all looked like the typical villains they were once meant to be. They're gonna need a higher level of training than the rest will get. I have a feeling that the rule book won't be enough for this group. Peter thought as he watched what appeared to be a group of delinquents enter the room. The other members of the council had these thoughts as well. Charles was especially doubtful about having them join the Avengers. Though he did smile warmly upon seeing a certain blue woman with orange hair. Six people walked into the room and Peter only recognized two of them. Those being Mystique and Sabretooth. The other four happened to be a group of young teenagers that were probably around the age of Cyclops. One was a green and slimy looking kid, who saw a fly in the room and caught it with his extremely long tongue, eating it in front of everyone without an ounce of shame. Insert picture of Toad here, as his name implies, Toad possesses almost all the traits and abilities of a common Toad, most notably his superhuman jumping and leaping abilities. Next was a big, obese looking boy that seemed to have been overfed for every waking moment of his life. Insert picture of Blob here, Blob's mutant physiology grants him several abilities, such as incredible superhuman strength, endurance, and invulnerability. After that was a dark-haired kid dressed in all black with a scowl on his face. He certainly gives off a very edgy vibe. Insert picture of Avalanche here, Avalanche has the power to generate powerful seismic waves from his hands, which he can use to highly destructive effects. These seismic waves can cause any form of inorganic matter to shatter or crumble to dust. Lastly, is a blonde kid with a cocky smile plastered on his smug little face. He eyed all the flammable items in the room with an almost manic look on his face. Insert picture of Pyro here, Pyro is a mutant with the psionic ability to manipulate fire to increase or decrease its size, intensity, and heat. He can then control and mold that fire to take on any form he can imagine, even living creatures. What are we doing here? The edgy teenager amongst the group speaks up first. Yeah, I have games to play. The fatty spoke next. Can I burn this place, boss? Lastly, the pyromaniac of the group speaks and takes out a lighter from his pocket. The green boy just stood behind them and continued eyeing every inch of the room for any more flies or other bugs to eat. As I've explained multiple times already, you're here to join the Avengers. The new group I've taken a leadership role in. If you listen to the last five times I've told you this, then you'd know. Eric was already fed up with these unruly kids. Sigh, this is worse than I thought. Peter mutters and gets nods of agreement from everyone in the room beside the kids, Magneto, and Sabretooth, who just didn't care. Shooting a web at the fire happy kid, Peter snatches the lighter before the tower was set on fire. Hey! That's mine! The angry blonde kid yells. Well, it's mine now. You're far too young to be allowed something like this. Peter says as he puts the lighter aside. Now, please be quiet while the adults are speaking. None of the teenagers liked hearing this and sent dagger-like glares in Spider-Man's direction, as if Peter isn't only a few years older than them. Though no one in the room knows that. Eric, we can't have children joining the Avengers, Peter says, what everyone else was thinking. Yeah, they can join when they're older, but maybe a psyche evaluation will be needed as well. Tony whispered the last part, so the kids couldn't hear what he said. I agree, these children need to be in school, not whatever you've had them doing, Eric. Charles sends a disapproving look toward his former rival. Eric was speechless as he didn't think of this. He treated every member of the former Brotherhood of Mutants as subordinates, no matter what the age, but now that he saw Charles's reaction, maybe he was going about things a bit mistakenly. 
I agree, which is why they will be enrolled in Xavier's school. Peter says, and gets a nod of agreement from the man himself. I'll gladly take them. Charles says. You want us to go to school? The pyromaniac of the bunch yells questioningly. Damn that. He was already pissed off about his lighter getting taken away, so this just launched him over the edge. After all, he can't start a fire with his ability and needs his lighter for that very reason. The other children were going to join in, but they all noticed a very threatening glare coming from the man that they fear more than anyone else, Magneto. Each of them was rescued from different facilities that exploited them for their mutations, but they all had something in common. The last day in those facilities was accompanied by agonizing screams and the blood and guts of every person that held them captive. All of this was done with ease by the man himself, Magneto. Even the loudmouth Pyro shut his mouth and hid behind Blob's huge form upon seeing Eric's displeased face. Ah? Uh? We'll go to school, sir. Avalanche spoke for the group that was cowering from their leader's pointed glare. Good, then that's settled. After that day, it was decided that all metahuman children that didn't already have loving and supportive families would be relocated to Xavier's school. Those that did have families who cared for and wanted them needed more finesse. Charles would have to visit the parents or guardians and try to enroll them, just as any other boarding school. Speaking of Xavier's school, the United Nations agreed to fund them, but sadly, didn't agree to allow children from their countries to attend said school. Why would they? After all, each metahuman child will be a goose that lays golden eggs for their respective country. They would be idiots to send them all to America without at least instilling some national pride in them first. Charles was definitely bummed out about this, but as the Avengers gain more notoriety and power, maybe something can be done to guarantee these children's safety. Who knows what the future holds? Although Charles wasn't allowed to recruit for his school in foreign countries, the American government happily encouraged him to do so within their borders. When both groups of metahumans were getting settled into their Avengers training, Peter and the rest of the council started the second half of recruitment, if you could even call it that. That being the enrollment campaign for Xavier's school. Ever since the UN meetings in Japan came to an end, the contents of those meetings became public knowledge, so everyone now knew about metahumans and the start of the Avengers. Peter's video with the interview showcasing Charles, Kurt, and Scott's stories and powers certainly helped spread the word as well. They could have gone a more shield-like route when it came to forming the Avengers, hiding it away from the world, and acting in the shadows, but that just sounded like a lot of work for no good reason. The Avengers would be found out anyways, so why hide it? All the fans of Spider-Man were abuzz with excitement after finding out that he would be starting a superhero organization. Every news channels had the best month of their lives. When they run stories about Spider-Man or Iron Man, ratings would go through the roof. Big Spider-Man news and information about new super-powered people entering the world brought them hundreds of millions of views in only days. While the news was at its peak at this time, Peter released a YouTube video alongside Professor Xavier regarding his school. Flashback, hello, everyone, Peter says to the camera with a casual wave. He and Charles were in the backyard of the school. In the background of the two, the camera recorded happy metahuman children playing on jungle gyms, slides, swings, etc. This is Professor Charles Xavier. Peter motions toward Charles and continues speaking. You all know him from the last video I put out. What you don't know, however, is that Charles here is a high-level member of the Avengers. An organization built by me and few others to protect the world in times of need. Hello, Charles says, not knowing what else to say. I've brought him in again because this school is open for enrollment to all metahuman children. I'll let him talk about that. Peter shuts his mouth and lets Charles do the rest of the talking. Charles went through all of the normal talking points as to why these children need to attend his school, but the main focus was safety. Safety for the child and those around them. Any child that unlocks their X-gene doesn't know how to control that power yet. They could easily hurt themselves, their parents, friends, pets, teachers, and the list goes on and on. The fact that it was completely free enroll was probably fairly tempting as well. Though his main selling point was that he and the teachers of the school know from experience what it's like to wake up one day with crazy powers. They've been through it all before and can guide the students through the transition process. We're not trying to take your children from you. This is just like a normal boarding school. They would return on holidays and summer breaks and can contact you at any time. We just want to help. Charles says with the utmost sincerity. Speaking of that. Peter finally speaks. Tony Stark happens to be another high-level member of the Avengers, so we're very well funded. I've spoken with him and we're currently planning to build an apartment complex close to the school for parents. Once your child has a good grasp of their powers, you can move into an apartment and your child can live with you instead of the school dorms. Charles nodded in agreement alongside Peter and they both closed out the video.
Peter would upload it the next day. After that video went out, the large majority of people supported the idea while some had other things to say. Spider-Man is stealing our children. J. E. Jonah Jameson was certainly the leader of every anti-Spider-Man campaign that has ever existed, so why not jump on this too? What's sad, is the fact that he has even been saying some anti-metahuman speech lately as well. How do we know that these mutants, because that's what they were called before Spider-Man came along, aren't some alien race sent here to take over our planet? Peter got a pretty good laugh out of that one, but it doesn't help that he and all of his followers now exclusively refer to metahumans as mutants. Moving on from the crazy cloud chaser, Charles was invited on multiple news broadcasts after the video went out. He didn't want to attend all of them, but the publicity for his school was too tempting. In the months after these interviews, Xavier's school would welcome almost 50 new students ranging from ages 7 to 15. Many of these children's parents were waiting for the apartment building to be built, so they could be closer to their kids. Some of the more wealthy families simply bought a house in the area and moved in, waiting for their sons or daughters to control their powers so they can live together. Everyone, especially Charles, was more than happy with how this portion of the recruitment went. The majority of the public also seemed to favor metahumans, though that didn't mean they didn't have any opposition. Religious groups, racist groups, and other organizations such as the Friends of Humanity began to rear their ugly heads. Luckily, Peter's interference has caused these groups to not have as much influence as they would have had originally. Tony has these groups on a watch list that Jarvis overlooks, so the Avengers will step in if they try anything funny. While all of this was going on, Peter was dealing with his newly acquired ancient ninja clan, the Hand. Scythe, the person Peter put in charge, constantly supplied him with information through texts, calls, and face-to-face -face meetings when Peter had the time. Firstly, some people in the hand didn't like this new leadership coming out of nowhere and the rules that came with it. They didn't believe in the black sky or didn't believe that Peter was the black sky, so before these people could cause trouble or leave the hand, Peter had Scythe arrange a death match between himself and every person that wished to oust him. 1 versus 1000. Peter would fight however many showed up at the same time. They could use any weapons as well. Once it was set up, Peter arrived at a very large dojo and found around 600 ninjas, give or take, waiting with weapons ready. Surrounding these ninjas were those that wanted to watch the spectacle, either rooting for the black sky or the hundreds of deadly ninjas. Shocking everyone in attendance, Peter slaughtered all of them mercilessly. He knew that people like this would cause trouble later on if he kept them alive, and wanted to make a statement as well. That statement was extremely clear to those watching the blood, guts, and screams fill the air. The black sky doesn't like people questioning him. Once every ninja that Peter faced was dead on the ground, he turns to the crowd that's around him. This is a new hand. Peter shouts, without an ounce of blood on his blacked out suit. The sooner you understand that, the better. As Peter finished speaking, each ninja fell to a knee and bowed in his direction. Good, because things are going to change a lot from now on. That change happened fairly quickly, using Scythe as his conduit, Peter made many changes to the hand, remaking them into something almost unrecognizable to their former selves. First, the hand had a money problem. Without their illegal businesses keeping them afloat, the hand was too large to coast by on the money they had stashed away. Seeing this problem early on, Peter instructed Scythe to sell everything except land and priceless items, like dragon bones. Once the hand sold everything away, Peter instructed them to buy Stark Industries stock as well as a few others, but that wasn't all. Peter also had them short sell some stock from companies he knew would have a hard time in the future, like Hammer Industries. Short selling is pretty much betting against a stock, so the worse that company stock does, the more money the hand would make. It's complicated but even the hand has a few ninjas that handle stock market transactions so Peter and Scythe just left it to them. Seeing as it would take a while for these investments to bear fruit, Peter started another of his plans for the hand a bit earlier than he expected. In each major city around the world, Peter placed cells of hand ninja. These ninjas would gather information on every major criminal organization and launch an attack on them, stealing their money and leaving them for the police to find. Of course, Peter has already sent notices to all hand ninjas that killing was prohibited unless the person met certain criteria. He had Scythe place some trusted ninja in charge of every city that way he knows if they follow the new rules or not. Within months, the hand got a huge injection of funds from drug dealers, arms dealers, gang members, and all forms of criminals. A portion of this money was saved for expenses, but most of it was invested for future profit. Of course, these groups of ninjas in every major city didn't leave after completing this mission. No, they stayed behind to fight crime as vigilantes just as Peter explained to the chaste. 
With red-garbed ninjas appearing in every major city around the world, the news picked up on this fairly quickly and began broadcasting any information they could gather. That information being groups of ninjas that patrol the streets, stopping crime and saving those in need. The whole world was divided on their opinion of this new group of vigilantes. Some loved them and others hated them. A few cities mobilized their entire police force trying to catch them but the hand is just too skilled and slippery to be caught by some undertrained police officers. It certainly didn't help that the hand isn't afraid to kill the more hardcore and unredeemable criminals, and steal money from all of their victims, as well, which would only fuel the opinions of those that hated them. Though Peter didn't mind. He has the hand in these cities to stop crime, not win over public support or anything of the sort. As long as his subordinates stick to the rules and do their jobs, Peter is happy. Speaking of the rules, Peter knows that although he killed many who opposed him, there are still some in the hand that are unhappy with the new regime so to speak. Malik and those that follow the now deceased Sawan being one group of them. Peter has scythe keeping these people watched and listed down. They may not rebel as Peter thinks, but it's always best to keep a lookout. Who knows, maybe after some time passes they would come to like the new hand. He'll just have to wait and see. Other than the Avengers and hand business, nothing much has changed in Peter's personal life. He's still dating MJ, friends with Ned, and lives with his Aunt May. MJ has been seeing her dad a lot after that Christmas night. Fury comes to visit her and her mother Grace a couple of times a month now, which they were happy about. MJ knows that her father has a very busy and secretive job so she was just happy to see him. Their relationship improved enough in the past months to where she calls him dad and he gets a hug every time he shows up now. Peter sees him every now and then but he usually likes to give Fury some space when he's with his family. He has all the time in the world to spend with MJ but Fury doesn't. Not to mention the fact that Peter sees Fury a lot as Spider-Man already, so he didn't need to spend more time with the man. Especially since Fury doesn't exactly like Peter as he's dating the his daughter. When he finds out that it's actually Spider-Man that's dating his daughter, I wonder how he'll react? Peter thought. As for Ned, he's still working on that video game that he started making shortly after they released Candy Crush. Peter offered to help multiple times, but Ned refuses to allow anyone to even look at it, as he wants it to be a surprise. Peter didn't mind not being involved. He was busy with the Avengers and the Hand anyway. May was the same as always. She still worked part-time at the hospital, thanks to the millions Peter is now making from Parker Games. Something big that happened to May and Peter was moving out of their old apartment. Their landlord saw the news clips about Peter making Candy Crush and being the sleazy man that he and many landlords are, he raised the rent by almost double, which is illegal by the way. May was the first to find out and freaked out, cursing the man's name for hours. When Peter found out as well, he just shrugged and said, why don't we just move? And so they did. May found a nice house nearby for a bit less than a million dollars. They bought it after some inspections and moved in a month later. They had to wait about a month for a couple of repairs and redesigns to be completed. If they were going to have their own house it had to be perfect. Especially since they now had the money to make it that way. Their old landlord was swiftly reported to the police after the move. If he would do this now, he has likely done it before, so the police simply asked the residents of the building and found multiple cases of this happening. He landlord was arrested shortly after their move, which was good news for all of the other residents. Peter's spare time after the move was mainly spent on building his AI and studying the dragon bones and resurrection elixir that the hand had stashed away. He made sure to have Scythe gather all of the bones and elixir the hand had, not trusting it in the hands of others. The AI was something Peter started working on before the United Nations meeting started. Peter has high requirements for his artificial intelligence so it's going to take longer than a few months to finish making it. Peter wants his AI to not only help him with his company, heroic duties, and side projects but also watch over and assist the Avengers and the Hand. As a watchful eye, keeping Peter informed about any wrongdoings, as well as a way to assist both separate organizations during their duties as well. There are so many ideas and expectations in Peter's mind when it comes to this AI, like the ability to access millions of cameras around the world and use that to report crimes, but making something with that kind of power will take time. As for the dragon bones and elixir, Peter found that he was out of his depth when he received them. When studying the bones, all he saw was an old dinosaur-looking bone. He could feel some energy in them, which he thought was probably chi, but no technology that he had access to was useful when it came to mystical energies. Using modern science and technology, Peter found that these bones were old and fossilized. Other than that he couldn't study the energy inside them, so he went to Kamar Taj to find a solution. Peter had a similar problem when it came to the resurrection elixir as well. The black substance had large amounts of the same energy the bones had, but none of his equipment could get a red on it. 
All he found out was that it was a mixture of fossilized bone dust and human blood. Looking at the manufacturing process that Scythe gave him, Peter confirmed his findings. The hand would use both the bones of dragons as well as human blood to make the black liquid that would keep their former leaders alive. They would often force human subjects to provide most if not all of their blood reserves to create the substance, killing them in the process. The combination of the two elements was done so in almost a ritualistic manner, which Peter wasn't sure was necessary. Peter didn't plan on kidnapping and sacrificing people for more power, so he would need to figure out a way to alter the recipe so to speak. Yeah, he could get unlimited longevity, an upgrade in his powers, and the means to return from death, but at what cost? He wouldn't sacrifice his morals for something so little. Especially when Peter could use the mystic arts to alter and maybe even enhance the elixir. When he returned to Kamar Taj for help with his studies into the dragon bones and elixir, Peter was once again told that the Ancient One was busy. Ever since he brought up her possibly joining the Avengers, the Ancient One became distant all of a sudden. He knew that she was torn between the plan she formed for her future with the Time Stone's help, or saying, damn it, and joining Peter to change everything. Peter would give her some time to think before confronting her about it again. Seeing that she was hiding from him, Peter went to the library and started researching qi and mystical ways to study objects and substances. Qi is a mystical form of energy that is present in every life form. From insects and fish to brainless animals and humans. Anything that is alive has qi some ancient groups with mystical knowledge have learned how to channel qi, using it for both therapeutic and martial arts purposes. As a weapon, qi is capable of generating an internal force that removes the need for charging momentum into attacks. Although qi is mainly an internal energy, it can be used externally if you have enough reserves to wield outside of the body. A good example of this would be the Iron Fist, Danny Rand, and any other that came before him. With the qi boost from completing the trial of Sholao, the mythical dragon of Kuanluan, and the origin of the Iron Fist's power, Danny would have so much qi that he could use it externally for things such as healing others and the generic qi blasts. Sadly, the five founders of the hand are nothing but dust, so Peter would have to learn how to manipulate qi from the books in Kamar Taj. After looking for a while, Peter found a few practice techniques for using qi and a handful of spells that can be used to scan items. He even found one spell that breaks things down to their base ingredients. If he were to use this spell on the elixir, the bone dust and blood should separate from one another but he would have to test it to find out. Every spell he found in the library of Kamartage was helpful, but sadly, Peter hasn't had enough time to alter the resurrection elixir to his liking. Though that doesn't mean that Peter didn't figure some things out about the elixir. In fact, he knows everything about it now. With the help of the spells that could scan things magically, Peter could finally get a read on what the dragon bones supply to the blood that somehow gives the resurrection elixir all of its amazing properties. After using the spells on the dragon bones and resurrection elixir, he knew way more than what today's technology could tell him. First, the dragon bones not only have the overwhelming amount of chi left behind from the dragons they once belonged to, but also a small portion of their life force. Dragons could live for thousands and thousands of years, so it stands to reason that an elixir with their bones as the main ingredient would give effects such as resurrection and unlimited longevity, though that longevity would run out after a while if the elixir isn't taken every few hundred years or so. The physical enhancement that's seen in those that take the elixir can also be explained now. Dragons are naturally far stronger than humans, so a very minuscule amount of that power is being transferred from the bones as well. If I had some muscles or other parts of a dragon, then I could probably make the strength enhancement far stronger. Peter thought, but sadly all dragons are long dead beside Sholao in Kuanluan. Though Peter would never go and kill such a majestic creature, especially since he's that last of his kind. Maybe some bartering can be done later down the line? I could offer him something and get some blood in exchange? That should be enough to boost the elixir's properties by a lot. Peter thought hopefully. The fossilized bones of a dragon simply mixed with blood could already do so much. Peter was excited to see what the blood from a living dragon could do instead of human blood. His chances are slim but he could always try. Being the leader of Kuanluan's biggest enemy, the Hand, certainly won't help his chances, but he could always visit as Spider-Man instead. There should be no line connecting the Hand to Spider-Man after all. Unless someone from the Hand has loose lips, but he can always worry about that if and when it happens. Until then, Peter can only do his best to keep it quiet. After testing the bones, Peter moved on to the already created elixir. Once that was tested, Peter found something odd, to say the least. The elixir contained everything the bones and normal human blood would have, but it also contained human life force, which proved Peter wrong about the ritual. He thought that the ritual to create the elixir was just some old-fashioned tradition or something but it seems to have a purpose. 
That is to extract some of the life energy from those who give their blood for the ritual. Peter would have never found anything like this without his mystic arts powers. In order to figure this out, Peter went over the ritual that the hand used and found no runes, spell circles, or other markings that could explain this. They simply had their walking blood bags restrained and slowly bled them into something that held the ground up dragon bone dust. Other than mixing it every so often, Peter didn't see anything that explained the life force being present in the blood. Upon running some tests, Peter found what was happening. Using the other spell he found, Peter was able to separate the elixir into two parts. The blood and bone dust. Upon scanning each of them separately, Peter found that both ingredients contained exactly what they were supposed to, but that changed in a matter of minutes. Testing both ingredients again after 10 minutes time, Peter found none of the human life force left in the blood whatsoever. It was all gone. Finding this odd, Peter tested a small amount of his own freshly extracted blood. His fresh blood had a very high level of life force in it. Far more than the blood he tested earlier, but that's probably because of his enhancements compared to normal human. After waiting another 10 minutes, the amount of life force in his blood sample halved. Better than normal human blood but still a lot for only 10 minutes. Why was this? Well, Peter concluded that all living creatures have life force in their blood, bones, organs, etc. But that life force dissipates over time after these things disconnect from the body. This probably happens to dragons as well, but they have so much life force that it takes far longer for it to dissipate, or maybe the bones hold life energy better than blood. Peter wasn't taking out his bones to test that theory though. He could look into it in another way and at another time. This does make sense for the hand's ritual though. They needed the blood to be fresh when it was mixed with the dragon bone dust. The human life force in the blood seems to stick around after mixing with the dragon life force in the bone dust. Peter doesn't know why but the two seem to reinforce each other in a way. Maybe a mix of dragon blood and human blood with the bone dust would be better than using just dragon blood. Peter thought as he planned to enhance the elixir before taking it himself. My blood seems to have far more life force than a normal human so I should use mine somehow. Peter could also give this enhancement to his loved ones as well. They would be better equipped to protect themselves, which would lift a huge weight from Peter's shoulders. They may have the protections he gave them but it's better to be safe than sorry. He would just have to make sure the elixir is 100% safe before even bringing it up to anyone, especially MJ. She's would be impatient and want the elixir as soon as possible. Peter knew that she wants to help him, but he would only allow that if she was safe about it. As for Ned, he would be happy to get a power up for sure. May on the other hand wouldn't really care much. She hasn't shown any signs of wanting any power up, unlike Ned and MJ. Once Peter knew how the elixir worked, he ran a few more tests but didn't find a way to enhance the elixir without a new ingredient. With the power to separate the ingredients back to their base form, Peter could constantly test the dragon bones and blood without fear of running out, but soon enough the blood ran out of life energy. Though he didn't use all of the elixir for his tests, as he wanted to keep some for emergencies. It's not like he had to use any more anyway. Peter knew exactly how the elixir was made and worked by this point. He only needed to find a way to enhance it. Using his own blood was his best bet. Sadly, the ritual needs a lot of blood. When you take the elixir, it's not a drink, lotion, or whatever. No, you're unconscious and submerged in the black substance for a long period of time. Therefore a huge amount of blood is needed for every batch. Peter may be enhanced, but losing that amount of blood in one sitting would kill him long before the elixir was finished. Thinking that he could make it in small batches, Peter tried mixing a small amount of his freshly extracted blood with a small pinch of bone dust, but that didn't work as he hoped it would. Even to this very day, he didn't know why this was the case. It should have worked yet it didn't. Peter's only guess was that the mixture needs to be done in large batches for some reason. Possibly because only a portion of a dragon bone won't do the trick and the whole thing is needed? He has no idea, but that was the best answer. Maybe I can use the mystic arts to solve this? Peter thought as he saw the time. It was almost morning and he had his first day as a sophomore in high school tomorrow. Packing away everything safely, Peter hopped into bed and called it a night. Near the landing strip of a military airfield, two men can be seen discussing something. One of them is a blonde man with blue eyes dressed in military garb. He seemed to be in his fifties, and from the markings on his clothes, a very high-ranking man in the military. Insert picture of Lieutenant General Thaddeus E. Thunderbolt, Ross, the man standing across from General Ross was a dark-skinned bald man with even more markings on his military clothing. Insert picture of four-star General Joseph, Joe, Greller here, I got you who I could. Short notice, but they're all quality. I pulled you one ace though. Emil Blonsky. Born in Russia, raised in England, and on loan to Sockham from the Royal Marines. 
Greller says as he hands over a file. I know you cashed in some chips for this, Joe. Thank you. Ross says as he accepts the file. Glad I could help but this scientist better be as good as you say. Greller says as he walks off. Seeing the higher rank general off, Ross face squints in discomfort for just a moment. He lied to his superior about the purpose of this mission and felt bad about it. Pushing those feelings away and stealing his resolve, Ross walks over to a waiting military plane, which soon takes off with him aboard. Hours later, this is the target and the location. Snatch and grab, live capture. You'll have your dart clips and suppression ordnance, but live fire is for backup only. We got locals out there, but we want it tight and quiet. A soldier on board the plane says as he hands out photos of a man in a white lab coat. Insert picture of Bruce Banner here, is he a fighter? An experienced soldier with brown slicked back hair asks as he accepts the photo. Insert picture of Emil Blonsky here, your target is a fugitive from the US government who stole military secrets. He is also implicated in the deaths of two scientists, a military officer, an Idaho state trooper, and possibly two Canadian hunters. So don't wait to see if he's a fighter. Trank him and bring him back. General Ross says as the plane begins to land. Dressing nicely for his first day of school, Peter ate breakfast with May in the kitchen of their new house before heading off to school. Although he's a fairly wealthy person now, Peter still takes the subway to school every day. He's used to it and enjoys the walk by this point. Though that doesn't mean he won't get a car sooner or later. In fact, he has his learner's permit, meaning Peter could drive a car with the supervision of someone with a license. He has been practicing for his driver's test with May every so often. May still has her car from before they were rich and refuses to get an upgrade, so Peter has been practicing in her old Toyota Corolla. He'll convince her to buy a new car someday. On the subway, Peter scrolled through his phone, looking at cars that he would possibly buy upon getting his license. The more Peter looked at cars on his phone, the more he wanted to buy an old car and completely upgrade it into something almost futuristic. He had the capabilities and the money to do so, after all. That would be more fun than buying some random sedan or SUV, and Peter would have something fun to work on in his spare time. After looking through all the possible cars, Peter was torn between either the 1965 Ford Mustang or the 1963 Chevrolet Corvette. Insert car pictures if you want both cars are aesthetically pleasing in Peter's opinion. The engine, brakes, handling, and other specs didn't really matter to him. Whichever car he gets would be gutted and turned into a futuristic Tesla powered by magic anyway. His choice was solely on which looked better. While contemplating this, Peter arrived at school and strolled in with all eyes glued to his figure. Ever since Candy Crush became one of the missed popular mobile games all around the world, Peter's status in school has risen dramatically. Before, Peter was a sort of loner that would be bullied, but now he's considered one of the popular kids. Though that doesn't mean he hangs around anyone other than MJ and Ned, so he's still a bit of a loner. A popular loner. The fact that Peter would give out free in-game currency to the people in his school probably helped his rise. Even the teachers and staff of the school looked at him differently now. After all, he gets perfect grades and makes enough money for his schooling to be pointless at this point. Though, Peter enjoys school as it gives him time to spend with MJ and Ned, so he wouldn't drop out or skip grades. As for being popular now, he doesn't care one bit. Nothing has changed besides the way his peers treat him, which didn't bother Peter at this point in his life. After happily spending the school day with Ned and MJ, Peter was going to invite them over to shop for cars online with him, but suddenly his phone buzzed. Bald pirate, code green as Peter checks his phone, the expression on his face morphs into that of surprise, excitement, and worry. Sorry, I gotta go. Peter says as he pecks MJ on the cheek and waves to Ned. I'll explain later. Let's look at cars tomorrow. Before either of them could reply, Peter ran off to a secluded location and portaled to the council room in Avengers Tower. After landing the plane in Brazil, General Ross and his small army of soldiers geared up and entered a small town. Camera. Ross orders over the radio as a soldier pushes a wire with a camera on its tip underneath the house's front door. Here we go. Being the high-ranking general he is, Ross is currently outside the town in a safe location, excitedly watching this all plays out through body cameras. Sadly for him, the general's excitement was ruined by a dog that noticed the camera and bites it. Get rid of the damn dog. Ross orders an annoyance. The soldiers retrieve the now broken camera and begin putting explosive charges around the door. Take him. Ross orders, and the charges blow. Boom, the soldiers, who are being led by Blonsky, enter the house. They shoot tranquilizer darts at a small bed, only to find that it was empty, with just a pillow and another blanket underneath. Targets on the move. Blonsky calls out over the radio as he shoots a dart at the poor dog that wouldn't stop barking at them. Where is he? 
The general asks over the radio. He's on the ground. Blonsky replies as he catches sight of Bruce Banner ducking into a nearby alley from the window. Let's go. Go. Move, move. As the soldiers give chase, searching the entire town for their target, said target was racing through the street in a sweatshirt with the hood up, trying his best to blend into the surrounding crowd. Sadly, Bruce is a scientist and not a spy. His movements are easily readable to a trained soldier like Blonsky, who instantly notices him. There he is. Go, 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 he says, and the chase begins once again. Do not lose him. General Ross eagerly says over the radio. A messy chase ensues, where Bruce has the upper hand as he has lived in this small town for a while now. He knows all the side alleys and back doors to slip through. Every time Banner would lose one group of soldiers, another group would catch sight of him, starting the whole chase over again and again. It certainly didn't help that his watch was beeping, signaling that his blood pressure was rising to dangerous levels. Taking a chance, as he doesn't want to change and hurt anyone, Banner hides quickly to lower his heart rate, catching his breath before he continues running again. After running for a while, Banner manages to lose the soldiers hunting him, but sadly that luck doesn't last long. While running, Bruce bumped into a few local gang members and didn't have the time to apologize for such disrespect. Not that they would have let him go with a simple, I'm sorry, anyway. While he may have lost the soldiers, for now, Banner was currently being followed by a whole separate unsavory group. Where is he? Ross calls out over the radio. Target acquired. Blonsky answers after seeing Banner run into an abandoned building with at least six men on his tail. Bruce intended to hide here for a moment and calm down, as his watch was beeping rapidly by this point, but that was soon interrupted. Gringo. The lead gangster yells as he and his men enter the building. Cornered by the tough guys that came out of nowhere, Banner was confused as they snatched his laptop from him like the criminals they are. Please. No. Not the computer. I need that for my research. Bruce calls out pitifully as he's pinned up against the wall. Not so tough now, huh? The leader calls out as they all start wailing on Banner. It started with punches, but soon devolved to stomping as Bruce fell to the floor, taking each hit with gritted teeth as an angry expression slowly morphed onto his face. Stop. Please. Me, angry, very bad. Banner tries to reason with them, but they didn't understand, nor did they care to. Yeah? Well, I very bad angry too. One of them jokes as they all laugh and continue beating him. Oh, no. You don't understand. Bruce says as his skin begins to turn green, shocking the gang members around him. What the? Is he sick? What's wrong with him? You. This shock didn't last long, as silent darts are shot from the windows of the building and hit each of the gang members. They all fall to the floor and pass out at the same time, but sadly, it was too late. Banner's watch was beeping crazily by this point. As he lay on the floor covered in bruises, his BPM hits 200, causing a loud, angry roar to escape his lips. Arg! After the earth-shaking roar is heard, Bruce's body expands and grows into a giant muscle-bound green monster, destroying every bit of clothes he was wearing besides the pants, which turned into tight underwear that barely covered his privates. Insert a picture of the Hulk here, anyone else seeing this? One soldier asks in fear. Not even bothering with the soldiers yet, the Hulk picks up the unconscious gang members one by one and throws them across the room, killing them as they impact the hard wall. We've got a bogey of some kind. Please advise. A soldier asks fearfully over the radio, unsure of what to call the monster before him. That is the target. Use every trank you've got. Do it now. Ross orders without a care for his men's safety. Following orders, as they've been trained to do, the commandos open fire on the Hulk, only for their darts to bounce off of his skin. Feeling his skin itch, Hulk turns to see the soldiers with weapons drawn and charges at them in anger. Go live. Go live. Go live. Get out of the way. Move. The commandos begin to panic as the giant green monster closes in on them. Grabbing a soldier in his giant hand, Hulk squeezes him like a tube of toothpaste, killing him instantly and tossing him aside like a used toy. After seeing this, the frightened commandos open fire with actual rounds, causing him to only grow angrier and stronger with every bullet that impacts his skin. It's behind us. Move. Move. Get him. Shoot. Shoot. The soldiers spread out in and around the building and try their best, but nothing seems to break through the Hulk's skin. Seeing that bullets were of no use, Blonsky throws a grenade at the Hulk, temporarily stopping him for only a moment. Leave me alone. Hulk yells like an oversized and angry child. That grenade was the last straw. With an angry grunt, Hulk rushed around the building slaughtering the many soldiers with the ease of a child playing with their dolls. Wherever the Hulk would appear, blood and screams would soon follow close behind. No. No. 
General Ross yelled over the radio as his men were dropping like flies. Blonsky, being the smart and experienced soldier he is, instantly saw that this was a losing battle and scurried away, which saved his life. The rest weren't so lucky. Walking through a portal into the council room at the top of the Avengers Tower, Peter and Professor Xavier were met by Fury, Tony, and Magneto, who were sitting around waiting for their arrival. Peter always has to pick up Charles for meetings like this. He is the only one that doesn't live in the city and the X-Men don't have their cool jet just yet. Jo. Peter calls out as the portal closes behind him and the professor. Good, you're both here. Fury says as he plugs a flash drive into the table and taps a few buttons. Instantly, a hologram appeared in the center of the table. Videos begin to play, showing body cam footage of a battle between heavily armed soldiers and a giant green monster. The massive muscle-bound green giant was decimating the soldiers with ease. It was more of a massacre than anything else. The soldiers were either torn apart, clobbered to death, or thrown away at speeds that would surely kill them upon impact. Suddenly, the video froze on a close-up picture of the green monster and a window popped up next to it. This window showed a picture of Bruce Banner with a lot of text below. For those that don't know, this is Dr. Robert Bruce Banner. He's a renowned scientist who is highly respected for his work in biochemistry, nuclear physics, and gamma radiation. Fury starts but Peter picks up where he left off after taking a seat. Banner was commissioned by the United States General Thaddeus Ross to recreate the super soldier serum that created Captain America. However, Ross elected not to inform Banner about what he was creating. During the experiment, Banner was exposed to dangerous levels of gamma radiation. As a result, the mild-mannered scientist found that when angered, provoked, or excited, his body and brain would transform into a huge, rage-fueled, primitive-minded creature known as Hulk. For five years, Banner remained on the run from the United States Army with the Hulk under control. Though it seems that they clashed recently, based on this video. Peter says shocking Charles and Eric who knew nothing of this. You would be correct. Ross lied to his superior and went down to Brazil to capture Banner. As you can see that operation failed horribly, like many that involve Thaddeus. Fury throws a small dig at the general's history. It sounds like you knew about this for a while. Why haven't we dealt with this yet? Charles asks and gets a nod of agreement from Eric. The Hulk is a strong opponent to face and the Avengers was still new. Peter says with a shrug. He seemed to have the Hulk under control as well. It wasn't like he was in Brazil rampaging or something. This incident only occurred because Ross and his men tried to capture Banner. Fury clarifies. Should we mobilize some Avengers to take care of it? Eric asks, thinking this was a strategy meeting to kill Banner. No, Banner is a future member of the Avengers. Peter puts a stop to this line of conversation. Why? Charles asks confusedly. You said it yourself. When in this state, he's a rage-fueled and primitive-minded creature. Just looked at the footage. I'm not saying we have to kill the man, but recruiting someone like this seems like a liability to me. No one could argue with Professor Xavier's words. Especially after watching the slaughter from the body cams of the soldiers so easily defeated. So, how should we handle this? Tony asks with a glass of dark liquor in his hand. Maybe sedate the guy before he can turn and bring him back for testing? With enough time I could probably come up with some type of cure. I say we just kill the thing, but I know none of you would agree. Well, Fury might but he's surprisingly sentimental at times. Eric says defeatedly. Huh? Fury grunts in confusion. How about this? Peter says with a sigh, as he knows that none of them see things his way. I admit that Banner's power is unpredictable and possibly uncontrollable, but I believe that Hulk can be reasoned with. Eric rolled his eyes at this, while everyone else in the room looked at Peter doubtfully. Even Fury was doubtful and it was his idea for the Hulk to be an Avenger in the first place. Ignoring the looks from his colleagues, Peter continues speaking. We'll approach Banner and try our best to speak to him without the Hulk appearing. Though, if the Hulk comes out, give me time to talk to him too before we start fighting. That's all I ask. Peter says and no one had it in them to turn him down. Do we even know where he is now? There's no way he's still in Brazil after this. Tony asks as he gestures to the hologram. His current location is unknown, but we know that his last heading was north. Fury says as he presses a button and a video of the Hulk leaping off the ground and launching over a jungle place. I have a lot of resources looking for Banner as we speak. Do we know where General Ross's daughter lives? Peter asks, confusing everyone but Fury. <laughs> Tony taps the table and a holographic keyboard appears for him to use. Betty Ross currently lives in Virginia, why? Then that's where we'll find Banner. Peter says with a nod. Fury, send Natasha and Clint to watch her. Banner will show up soon enough. 
Without asking any questions, Fury took out his phone and sent out two separate text messages. Done. He says, and stashed his phone away once again. Why do we believe he'll show up for this girl? Revenge against the general, perhaps. Eric asks curiously. No, Banner isn't the type. Fury says with a shake of the head. They were dating before the accident that made the Hulk, so it stands to reason that there's still somewhat of an emotional attachment. Not only that. Peter says as he sees the doubtful looks on everyone's faces. She also worked with him on the super soldier serum, so Betty could help him find a cure for the green guy. As a scientist, I'm positive that Banner has tirelessly spent these five years trying everything to fix himself. Her input on that would be invaluable to him. Okay, I'm convinced. Charles says, as he and everyone else see their reasoning now. Who should we send when he's found? That's right. Tony exclaims as he jumps to his feet excitedly. This will be the Avengers' first real mission. Did you just figure that out? Fury mutters with a roll of his singular eye. Oh, shut up. This is exciting. Tony responds with a grin. Even Fury's snide comments couldn't bring his mood down right now. This seems like something that Charles would excel at. Eric says as he looks toward his old rival. How so? Charles asks back. Can't you simply put this Hulk to sleep with your telepathy? If it truly has a primitive mind, then putting the thing to bed should be child's play for you. Magneto says as if it would be the easiest thing in the world. That could work, but we shouldn't count on it. Peter says, knowing it won't be that easy. Let's call that plan B, plan A is me speaking to Banner or Hulk. Plan C will be fighting. I don't think that many of the Avengers will be able to handle something like this. Tony says after a moment of thought. Storm is the only one that comes to mind. Kurt can act as support, but that's about it. We may have to handle this ourselves. Eric says with a thoughtful look. Chiapas, Mexico, a tired, dirty, and disheveled Bruce Banner could be seen walking the dirty streets without any clothes whatsoever, not even shoes. Thankfully, he still had what remained of his pants, which were mangled and didn't fit anymore, holding them over his private parts. Tired from his journey from Brazil, Banner took a seat in a crowded market with arms outstretched and his hands palmed together. After resting for a while, most people would see him and grimace in disgust before turning their heads away, thinking that he was just a beggar. Out of nowhere, a little boy runs over and drops a handful of pesos onto the ground in front of him. Before Banner could thank him, as everything he owned was either destroyed or left back in Brazil, the kid ran off and disappeared into the market's crowd. With his new funds acquired, Bruce first bought himself some clothes before filling his stomach and continuing the trek toward America with a tired but determined look on his face. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.